XXXV. Notes of Lieutenant Dixon to the Lord Justice Clerk forwarded to Walter Grosset. Having received His Royal Highness the Duke's orders to apply to Lord Justice Clerk for his assistance in providing carriages or other conveyances for the clothing of Major General Wolfe's regime from Leith to Perth. I have complied with the above order this July 13, 1746. William Dixon. Lieutenant in GNL Wolfe's regime. Would you have the clothing carried by sea or land? A. F. If the conveyance by water all the way to Perth is not uncertain in point of time, it is the most easy and less expensive method. But if the time of making the passage is uncertain, I must of necessity take the means of carriages by land from Kinghorn. W. D. Ed. July 13, 1746. 12 at noon. Mr. Grosset. Sir, pray go to Leith with the above Mr. Dixon and settle the carriage of the above clothing in the best manner. I herewith deliver you a letter to Bailey Hamilton in Kinghorn to Puaid carriages. After viewing the parcels you'll be able to judge what carriages will be wanting which you'll add to my letter WTE time when required and the carriages may proceed night and day till they arrive at Perth. Y.S. from Senior Your Humble Cert. N. Fletcher. To Walter Grosset Esker. Extract of the report of Sir Everard Falconer, Secretary to H.R.H. the Duke, and of John Sharp, Esquire, Solicitor to the Treasury, to the Right Honble. The Lord's Commissioners thereof relating to Mr. Grosset's services to the government in the late rebellion. May it please your lordships. In obedience to your lordship's commands we have examined. The two accounts of Walter Grosset Esquire and from the certificate of the Lord Justice Clerk and all the generals who commanded in Scotland, relating to these accounts, it appears to us, that Mr. Grosset was employed in the following service of the government, from the first breaking out of the rebellion to the suppression thereof, viz. That upon the rebels at Perth having formed a design to surprise Edinburgh by getting across the river forth in boats and visibly as they had done in the year 1715, Mr. Grosset with the assistance of the king's sloops and boats stationed at Dunbar, Leith, and several other places on the coast, and which were put under his directions as a justice of the peace, removed all the ships. Boats and vessels from the north to the south side of the fourth, notwithstanding of the rebels being at that time in possession of the north side of that river, and thereby prevented their putting in execution what they had projected as aforesaid. That he was almost constantly employed in disappointing the designs of the rebels, getting intelligence of their motions, and giving intelligence thereof to the general's officers both before and after the Battle of Prestonpans. That he conducted an attempt for releasing several officers who were in the custody of the rebels, and had been made prisoners at the Battle of Prestonpans, in which he succeeded. That upon the rebels' sudden retreat from England, Mr. Grosset was employed by Lord Justice Clerk and GNL. Guest, to get the troops transported in the most expeditious manner from Stirling, and the cannon from on board the ships at Borostonis to Edinburgh, for the defence thereof. The rebels being at this time within a day's march of that town and by which means they were prevented from getting again possession of that important place. That he on several occasions provided vessels, riced the well-affected country people, embarked soldiers, and conducted several expeditions upon the fourth to surprise the rebels and retard their intended siege of Stirling Castle. In which he succeeded. As also in destroying by the Duke's command, the magazines belonging to the rebels on the north side of the fourth and who on that occasion took several of the rebels prisoners and sent them to his RH then at Stirling. That he procured several boats and vessels to attend ye army with provisions and other necessaries as it marched along the coast. To attack the rebels at Culloden where his younger brother Captain Grosset was barbarously murdered, he also procured pilots to go with Commodore Smith to the Orkneys to prevent the rebels their joining these at Culloden. And assisted Lord Justice Clerk in procuring whatever was found necessary for the army, and for the service of the governed. At the critical juncture. That Mr. Grosset was appointed by His Grace the Duke of Newcastle to transact the affairs of the government in Scotland relating to the rebellion, and to find out and collect the evidence against the rebels. And to keep a constant correspondence with his grace and Mr. Sharp in all such matters as might require it, with assurance that the expense thereof, and of the witnesses sent up to town should be defrayed, and that care would be taken of his having a suitable satisfaction for his trouble. 
that it appears to us from the certificate of the Lord Justice Clerk, that Mr. Grosset being employed on behalf of the governed. From the first breaking out of the rebelling, and his acting in so open and remarkable a manner in the service of the government, created against him the particular ill will of the Jacobites and their adherents, who on that ACCT took every opportunity of shewing their resentment against him, they plundered his house in town and in the country, and carried of effects to a very great value, they drove all the cattle from of his estate, forced the payment of the rents thereof to them, stripped his wife and children of the very clothes they had on, and used them otherwise in a most inhuman manner. That as to the several sums charged for expenses in those services, Mr. Grosset has not in any of his accounts charged anything for the extraordinary trouble and fatigue he underwent, but only for the sums he actually expended, and though, he has advanced above five thousand pounds in these services he has not charged the governed. Anything on the head of interest. Upon the whole it appears to us, that during the late unfortunate rebellion, Mr. Grosset was employed in several services of the greatest trust and confidence, and which required great prudence, resolution and activity in the execution of them, and that he executed the same, with great care, exactness and ability and that he continued his services to the government after the suppression of the rebellion with equal ardor, zeal, activity and diligence, and in the whole of his behavior. He appeared to us to be actuated as much by his affection to the government as the duties of his office and with regard to the articles of his accounts which remain unpaid and which amount to the sum of £3,709.11s. We apprehend them reasonable, and therefore certify your lordships that the said sum of £3,709.11s appears to us to be justified, due to him for the sums expended by him in the services aforesaid. Signed, Everard Falconer. John Sharp. February 6, 1749. A short account of the battles of Preston, Falkirk, and Culloden, by Andrew Lumiston, then private secretary to Prince Charles. By a gentleman who was in these actions. Of the Battle of Preston, or Gladesmere. Fought September 21, 1745. Intelligence having been brought to the Prince, that Lieutenant General Cope, Commander-in-Chief of the Government Forces in Scotland, was landed at Dunbar, with the troops he embarked at Aberdeen and was joined by Hamilton and Gardiner's dragoons, he resolved to march directly and attack him. Accordingly on the September 20th, in the morning, the prince put himself at the head of the army at Diddingston, and presenting his sword said, My friends I have flung away the scabbard. This was answered by a cheerful huzzah. The army marched till they gained the top of Carberry Hill, from whence we observed the enemy drawn up on the plain below, in order of battle. We continued the march along the brow of the hill, till we were opposite to the front of, and at half a mile's distance from the enemy. Here the Highlanders gave a shout, by way of defiance, and nothing less than authority could restrain them from coming immediately to action. Several officers were sent, particularly Colonel Kerr of Gradane, to reconnoitre the enemy's camp. They reported that General Cope had got into a fastness, where it was impossible to attack him, without risking the loss of the whole army, that his right was drawn up to the high walls of the gardens of Preston where he had made several breaches to retire into, if needful, the house of Seton and a small morass on the left, an enclosure not half a gun shot over, surrounded with a ditch three or four feet deep, and five or six broad, covered his front, which made two ditches of that breadth and depth to pass, and the sea was in his rear, at no great distance from him, his cannons and cohorns were planted on a highway that led to Tranent, between the above enclosure and morass. Thus his front was to the south, his rear to the north, his right to the west, and his left to the east. In this situation what was to be done? It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. The prince made several movements to amuse the enemy, and placed guards on the several roads that led to their camp. In the meantime General Cope discharged several cannon at us, but without effect. At twilight the prince drew off his men, and marched to Tranent. From hence he detached Lord Nairn with five hundred men, to guard the road that led from Preston to Edinburgh, to prevent Cope from marching thither. On the other hand General Cope, afraid that the prince should have directed his march eastwards, altered his disposition, and faced east, having now the morass in front, and his troops were thus disposed. General Hamilton's dragoons were on his right, and Colonel Gardiner's on his left. The regiment of Lascelles and Murray, 
with five companies of Lees and four of Guises formed the center. And his second line consisted of three companies of the Earl of Ludunt's regiment, two of Lord John Murray's, a body of Monroe's, and a great number of recruits for regiments abroad. Amounting in all to about 2,000 foot, and 700 dragoons. As it was now dark, the prince ordered the army to march and to take possession of the ground on the southeast of the morass which they did, at about half cannon shot of the enemy. We continued under arms in the order of march, observing the greatest silence, so that Cope did not perceive where we were. About three o'clock of the morning of the 21st, orders were sent to Lord Nairn to draw off his guards and join the prince, which he immediately did. The disposition of the attack being made, the prince addressed his army in these words, Follow me, gentlemen, by the assistance of God, I will this day make you a free and happy people. The right wing was commanded by the Duke of Perth, Lieutenant General, and consisted of the Macdonalds of Clan Renald, Glengarry, Keppoch and Glencoe, and Grants of Glenmuriston. The left wing was commanded by Lord George Murray, Lieutenant General, and consisted of the Camerons of Lochiel, Stuarts of Appen, and two companies of MacGregors. The second line was commanded by Lord Nairn, Major General, and consisted of Athole men, Robertsons of Strowan, MacLouchlands, and the Duke of Perth's men. About twenty-five gentlemen, and their servants, a horseback, formed a sort of corps de reserve. The whole army consisted of about two thousand two hundred men. We marched cheerfully on. The Duke of Perth was conducted by a gentleman, of the name of Anderson, by a ford through the above morass. Where one hundred men could have prevented our passage, it was so difficult that every step the men made they sunk to the knee in mud. This made them pass in some disorder, but not being observed, by means of the darkness, they formed again as they passed the morass. But the Duke of Perth, in place of inclining to the enemy's left, to avoid being seen by them before all our men were passed, marched towards the sea, so when our left gained the plain. Lord George Murray found that he was nearer the enemy than the Duke of Perth was. However, day beginning to break the attack was ordered. The Highlanders, pulling off their bonnets and looking up to heaven, made a short prayer, and ran forward. In advancing Lord George Murray observed, that by the turn of the morass, there was a great interval between his left and the ditch of the before-mentioned enclosure, he therefore ordered the Camerons to incline that way, in order to take it up to prevent being flanked by the enemy's dragoons. By this movement there became a considerable interval in the center, which the 2D line was ordered to fill up. We were now discovered by the enemy, who played their artillery furiously upon our left. Yet only one private man was killed, and one officer wounded. The Highlanders ran on with such eagerness that they immediately seized the cannon. The dragoons on right and left made a very regular fire, which was followed by close platoons of all their infantry, which our men received with great intrepidity. But what by the huzzas of the Highlanders, and their fire which was very brisk, the dragoons were immediately thrown into disorder, which occasioned some confusion among their foot. The Highlanders threw down their muskets, drew their swords, and carried all before them like a torrent, so that in seven or eight minutes both horse and foot were totally routed, and drove from the field of battle. The prince during the action was on foot in the 2D line. He was with great difficulty prevailed on not to attack with the first line in so much that the officers refused to march if he insisted on it. As soon as the victory declared for him, he mounted his horse and put a stop to the slaughter, calling out, Make prisoners, spare them, spare them, they are my father's subjects. When General Cope saw how things were going, and that he could not rally his forces, he, with about 350 dragoons, and some volunteer officers, gained Carberry Hill, by a road that led to it from Preston, and, as we had not time, nor horse to pursue, got away undisturbed to Lauder, and from thence to Berwick. As our 2D line had no occasion to engage, it may with justice be said, that 1,400 Highlanders, unsupported by horse or cannon, routed a regular army of 2,000 foot and 700 dragoons, defended by a fine train of artillery, and obtained a most complete victory. Such is the impetuosity of a highland attack. We took all the enemy's cannon, cohorns, small arms, colors, standards, drums, tents, baggage and military chest, in which was about 3,000 l. 11s. Of the enemy were killed about 500, wounded 400, and taken prisoners 1,400. 
Among the prisoners were about 80 officers. Our loss was very inconsiderable, viz. Killed two captains, one lieutenant, one ensign, and about 30 private men. And wounded six officers, and 70 private men. All care imaginable was taken of the wounded, plenty of able surgeons having been provided for that purpose. The prince lay this night at Pinky, and next day the 22d returned to the palace of Holyrood House, and the army encamped again at Duddingston. Of the Battle of Falkirk. Fought January 17, 1746. Lieutenant General Hawley, having been declared commander-in-chief in place of Sir John Cope, marched from Edinburgh to raise the siege of Stirling Castle. With about 10,000 foot and three regiments of dragoons, and encamped a little to the westward of Falkirk. On the 16th the prince drew up his army in line of battle, on a muir or plain, a mile southeast of the house of Bannockburn, then his headquarters, and made all the necessary dispositions, in case the enemy should have advanced to attack him. But Hawley continued all day in his camp, and in the evening the prince ordered his men to their quarters. Early next morning, the 17th, the prince ordered his men to draw up on the same plain. The right wing, commanded by Lord George Murray, consisted of the MacGregors, MacDonalds of Keppoch, Clan Ronald, Glengarry, and Glencoe, Mackintoshes and Farquharsons. The left, commanded by Lord John Drummond, consisted of the Camerons of Lochiel, Stuarts of Appen, Macphersons of Cluny, Frasers of Lovat, and Macleods of Raza and Bernera. The 2D line, commanded by Brigadier General Stapleton, consisted of the regiments of the Duke of Athole, Earl of Cromarty, Lord Lewis Gordon, and Lord Ogilvy. Lords Elcho and Balmerino with the Prince's horse guards, consisting of about eighty gentlemen and their servants, were placed on the right wing, between the first and second lines. Lords Pitsligo and Strathallan with the Aberdeen and Perthshire squadrons of horse, and a few hussars, making about the same number, were placed in like manner on the left. The Irish pickets were placed immediately behind the 2D line as a corps de reserve. The whole making about seven thousand foot, and one hundred and sixty horse. The regiments of the Duke of Perth, Lord John Drummond, Gordon of Glenbucket, and John Roy Stewart were left at Stirling to guard the trenches and push on the siege, being about 1,000 men. The Duke of Perth, who commanded the siege, and John Roy Stewart were allowed to join the army to assist in the action, and the care of the siege was left to Major General Gordon of Glenbucket. About midday the prince, finding that Hawley did not advance, resolved in a council of war to march and attack him. The army therefore marched in order of battle, in two columns, keeping always an equal distance of about two hundred yards. This saved a great deal of time, and prevented confusion, when we came within sight of the enemy. Lord George Murray took the road to the south of the Torwood, as the highway leading from Stirling to Falkirk was too narrow. At the same time Lord John Drummond went with most of the horse to reconnoitre the enemy, and made a movement as intending to march the highway through the Torwood. The army crossed the water of Karen at Dunapasi. By this time the enemy were perceived to be in motion. We therefore quickened our march to gain the top of the hill, about a mile south of the town of Falkirk, and a little more from Hawley's camp. General Hawley's disposition seems to have been thus. On his right were the Argyllshire militia, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Campbell, the regiments of foot of Ligonier, Price and Sinclair, on his left Ligonier, Cobham and Hamilton's dragoons. The regiments of foot of Wolfe, Calmondley and Pulteney. The 2D line was made up of the regiments of foot of Blackney, Monroe, Fleming, Barrett and Battero. The Glasgow and some other militia, and Howard's regiment of foot formed a corps de reserve. Mr. Hawley, afraid lest the prince intended to march south, and not come to an action, ordered the dragoons to advance with all expedition, to take possession of the hill and to keep us in play till the infantry should come up. When they came within cannon shot, they made a motion to attack our right in flank, which Lord George Murray perceiving he, with the assistance of Colonel John Roy Stewart, made a very quick motion till he gained a morass. By which he saved being flanked. So our right was to the east, our left west, and front north. The dragoons seeing their scheme thus disappointed, advanced on a full trot, in order to break us. But the MacGregors and MacDonalds, keeping up their fire till they were within pistol shot, received them so briskly, that they were immediately broken, and thrown into the utmost confusion. 
As the enemy's foot were now very near, the dragoons could not easily retreat back, without breaking their own line, they therefore galloped along our line, whereby a vast number of them were killed. This beginning greatly inspirited our men, as it had a contrary effect on the enemy. Scarcely had the dragoons got off when their infantry advanced to make the attack. They greatly outlined us on the left, as we outlined them on the right. Our left extended little farther than to their center. But from the inequality of the ground, being interspersed with risings and hollows, whereby there was no seeing from right to left what was doing, neither of the parties reaped advantage from that circumstance. The enemy's right therefore attacked our left with a very close fire, which the Camerons and Stuarts received with great fortitude, drew their swords, broke and pursued them out of the field. Then our left made a halt in order to be joined by the right, but were again attacked by other two regiments in flank, whom they also immediately broke. Our right, marching down the hill, fell in with the Glasgow militia, whom they severely chastised. The prince, who was mostly in the center, and whose attention was turned to all parts, observing some regiments of the enemy's foot, and the remainder of the dragoons, marching up the hill, put himself at the head of the Irish pickets. And such of the scattered highlanders as were nearest to him, with a few gentlemen a horseback, and advanced to attack them. But seeing the order of the pickets, and having a great storm of wind and rain in their faces, they fled precipitately to their camp, as did all the rest of their troops. As the action began late in the afternoon, it was now dark, the storm still continuing. However, the prince made all the dispatch imaginable to put his troops in order, as he intended to beat the enemy from their camp. But hardly were the half of our men drawn together, when we observed many fires in Hawley's camp, and his men at the same time marching, with great hurry, between the camp and town of Falkirk. We immediately conjectured that they were burning their camp, which they indeed endeavored, but were prevented by the rain, and were to take possession of the town of Falkirk. Had they taken this course, a few men properly posted could have hindered the Highlanders from entering that night, and obliged us either to have abandoned the field of battle, or to have stood all night under arms, wet and fatigued as we were. And exposed to the inclemency of the weather, a thing impossible. Mr. Drummond, now Lord Strathallan, and Mr. Oliphant Younger of Gask, disguised in peasant's dress, went into the town to reconnoitre, and to get intelligence of the enemy. They soon returned with information, that they were flying in confusion to Linlithgow. The prince immediately ordered his men to march, and attack them in the rear. As we marched we fell on the enemy's cannon, which they had left between the field of battle and the town, they could not draw them up the hill, on account of the badness of the roads, so they were of no use to them in the action. The enemy's rear were just got to the east end of the town, when Lord John Drummond entered it on that side, he was shot through the arm by a soldier, whom he was taking prisoner. Lord George Murray entered at the middle, and Lochiel at the west end of the town. Our men had no sooner entered the town than they disappeared on all sides, every one putting himself under cover to dry his clothes. And refresh himself after the fatigue of the day, and although a detachment of one thousand men were ordered to pursue the enemy, yet, such is the misfortune of an irregular army. Not fifty could be brought together, besides those absolutely necessary to mount the guards for the prince and their own safeties. So the enemy never stopped till they got to Linlithgow, and some of their volunteers and dragoons to Edinburgh. The prince's first care next morning was to send to reconnoitre the field of battle, and cause bury the dead, as well those of the enemy as his own men. Some of their officers that could be distinguished, of whom were Sir Robert Monroe and Colonel Whitney, were brought down to the town, and interred in the same manner as our own officers were. It now appeared that about six hundred of the enemy were killed on the field of battle, and that we had made about seven hundred prisoners. We got all their artillery consisting of seven large pieces of brass cannon, and three iron ones, several mortars and cohorns, with a great many shells, all their ammunition, wagons, tents, three standards, two stand of colors, a kettle drum, many small arms. Baggage, and generally everything that the rain prevented them from burning. On our side were killed three captains, for subaltern officers, and about forty private men, and we had wounded near double that number. Of the Battle of Culloden. Fought April 16, 1746. As soon as certain intelligence was brought that the Duke of Cumberland had begun his march from Aberdeen northwards, the prince sent orders to Ross, Sutherland, Lahaber, and Badenoch. 
that all the detachments of his army, in these places, should join him immediately at Inverness. The Duke of Cumberland passed the Spey on the 13th, and on the 14th encamped at Nairn, about ten miles from Culloden. On this the prince assembled his men in and about Inverness, and marched at their head to Culloden House, where he lay that night, and the troops encamped in the parks. Early next morning, the prince drew up his army in line of battle, upon Drumassy Muir, south of the house and parks of Culloden, as he expected that the Duke of Cumberland would have attacked him that day, being his birthday. About noon, when we were informed that he had not moved, it was proposed to the prince to make a night attack upon him, in his camp at Nairn. Various were the reasons for and against this proposal. And after considering them fully, the prince approved of the project, as the most probable chance he had of beating the enemy, provided they could be surprised by one o'clock of the morning. We must here observe, that the Duke of Cumberland's army was double the number of ours, plentifully provided with money and provisions of all kinds. Having a squadron of ships, loaded with stores, that coasted along, from Aberdeen to Inverness, in sight of his army, to supply him with whatever was necessary. Whereas our military chest was spent. The men had not received pay for some time, had got no provisions this day but a single biscuit each, and were much fatigued by severe duty. In this situation the prince could not propose to keep his army together. He was obliged either to fight or starve. And although above three thousand men, under the command of the Earl of Cromarty, MacDonald of Barrisdale, MacGregor of Glengyle, Cluny Macpherson, and others, who were expected every hour, had not yet joined, he resolved to risk the event of an engagement. The night attack being therefore agreed to, was to have been executed thus. One third of the army, commanded by Lord George Murray, were to have passed the water of Nairn, two miles below Colrake, and two from Nairn, to have attacked the enemy on the southeast near to the sea. Whilst the other two-thirds, under the command of the Duke of Perth and his brother Lord John Drummond, were to have attacked them on the plain, from the northeast and all the way to the sea. So as to have joined those who were to have attacked on the other side. That our design might not be discovered by the enemy, the march began about eight o'clock at night. Lord George Murray led the van. He had along with him, besides several gentlemen volunteers and officers, thirty men of the Mackintoshes, who lived in that very country, as guides. They conducted him the moor road, that he might not fall in with the enemy's patrols. And small parties were stationed at proper distances to prevent the enemy from receiving any intelligence. As the Highlanders had often marched more than two miles in an hour, it was hoped that they could have reached Nairn before two o'clock. But before Lord George had marched a mile, he received a message that the half of the line was at a considerable distance, and orders to halt, or march slower, till the line should join. He received many messages by aides de camps and other officers, sent for the same purpose, by the time he had reached six miles. Although he did not halt, he marched always slower, hoping that would do, for he knew that a halt in the van occasions a greater one in the rear, when the march begins again. Whereas by marching slow, the rear might have joined without that inconveniency. It was already near two o'clock in the morning, and the van near four miles from the enemy. Most of the officers of distinction were now come up to the front. Particularly the Duke of Perth, Lord John Drummond, Lochiel and his brother, and M. O'Sullivan. The Duke of Perth told Lord George Murray that unless he made a halt the centre and rear columns could not join. We halted. Here the officers began to examine their present situation. They were of opinion, that by the time the line had joined, and the army advanced two miles farther, it would be daylight, and consequently the enemy would have time to point their cannon, draw up their men, and place their horse so as to act in the most advantageous manner. Besides, a great number of our men had left their ranks and lain down in the wood of Culrake, which must have proceeded from faintness for want of food, and not from the fatigue of a six miles march. In these circumstances the attack was judged impracticable. To get back to Culloden, so as the men could have some hours refreshment, in case they should be obliged to fight that day, was what they agreed to. As the prince was about a mile behind in the rear, and the road through the wood very difficult to pass, they thought it would consume too much time to send back for orders, Lord George Murray therefore ordered the retreat. The Duke of Perth went back to acquaint the prince with this resolution. 
At first he seemed much surprised, on which the duke offered to march back the men, but after some reflection, he saw it was then too late. We marched back the shortest way, as we had not the same reason for shunning houses in returning as we had in advancing. The van had only got to the church of Cray, that is two miles from where the halt was made, when it was broad daylight. This showed that the enemy could not have been surprised as was intended. However, had the center and rear marched as quick as the van, it might certainly have been done. Between five and six o'clock, all the army reached Culloden, but many, as well officers as soldiers went to Inverness and places adjacent, in quest of provisions, which were difficult to find. The prince had scarcely reposed himself an hour, when accounts were brought, that the enemy was in full march to attack him. He immediately sent aide-de-camps to bring up the men, who were at Inverness. In the meantime he marched up the troops that were about Culloden to Drumacy Muir, but half a mile nearer than where they were formed the preceding day. This was our order of battle. The right wing, commanded by Lord George Murray, consisted of his own regiment of Athol, Camerons of Lochiel, Stuarts of Appen, one battalion of the Frasers of Lovat, and the Mackintoshes. The left wing, commanded by the Duke of Perth, consisted of the Macdonalds of Glengarry, Keppoch and Clanrenald, two companies of Maclean's, two companies of Macleods, and the Farquharsons. The 2D line, commanded by Lord John Drummond and Major General Stapleton, consisted of the Irish Piquets, the regiments of Lord Ogilvy, Lord Lewis Gordon, Duke of Perth, and Lord John Drummond. On the right wing, behind the 2D line, was a troop of Fitz James's horse, and on the left the horse guards, Perthshire Squadron and Hussards. The regiments of the Earl of Kilmarnock's foot guards, and Colonel John Roy Stewart, with such of our men as had no guns formed a sort of reserve. The whole did not exceed 6,000 foot and 150 horse. We had six pieces of cannon, two placed on the right, two on the left, and two in the center of the front line. Our front was to the east. The Duke of Cumberland drew up his army in three lines. The first, commanded by Lieutenant General the Earl of Albemarle, consisted of the regiments of Beryl, Monroe, Scots Fusiliers, Price, Calmondley and Sinclair. The 2D, commanded by Major General Husk, consisted of the regiments of Wolfe, Ligonier, Semple, Bly, and Fleming. The 3D line, commanded by Brigadier Mordant, consisted of the regiments of Blackeny, Battero, Pulteney and Howard. On the right wing were placed Cobham's dragoons, and the half of Kingston's horse, with the Campbells of Argyle. Had these regiments been all complete, they should have amounted to 15,000 men, but as they were they surely amounted to near 12,000 foot and 1,200 horse. Ten pieces of cannon were placed in the first line, two between each regiment, and six pieces in the 2D line. The enemy formed at a considerable distance, and marched in order of battle. About two o'clock afternoon the cannonading began. The prince, after riding along the lines to animate the men, placed himself about the center, that he might the more conveniently give his orders. The enemy's cannon galled us much. One of the prince's servants, who led a sumpter horse, was killed at his side. We were greatly outlined both on right and left. Some alterations were made in our disposition in order to remedy this. Our right was covered by some old park walls, that led towards the water of Nairn. The Campbells got behind these walls, pulled them down, and placed a battery of cannon, which did great execution on our right. The prince ordered to begin the attack. Our men attacked with all the fury imaginable, and made several impressions on the enemy's line. Particularly the Athol men broke entirely the regiments of Barrett and Monroe, and took possession of two pieces of cannon. But the enemy keeping a close hedge fire, overpowering us with numbers, and attacking us on both flanks, threw our lines into great confusion, and at last obliged us to quit the field. The Duke of Cumberland was likewise assisted by a great storm of hail and rain that blew in our faces. The prince did all he could to rally his men, but to no purpose. He was therefore obliged to retire. He crossed the water of Nairn at the ford on the highway between Inverness and Corryburg, and then went to Lord Lovatz. The greatest part of the army went to Ruthven in Badenoch. As we had not afterwards an opportunity of reviewing our men, we cannot exactly say what loss we sustained in the action. By the enemy's account we lost 2,000 men, and they 300. 
but there is reason to think that on the one side they magnify, and on the other diminish the numbers. Cum rect factorum sibi quis gratium trahat, unius invidia ab omnibus peccator. Tac. And, 1. 3c, 53. Appendix I. The Jacobite Lord Semple. Mr. Fitzroy Bell, in a note to Murray's Memorials, page 42, relates that he had been unable to discover who this Jacobite Lord Semple was. The researches of the Marquis de Ruvigny among the Stuart papers, published in the Jacobite peerage, make his identity quite clear. Francis Semple was the son and heir of Robert Semple, an officer in the French army. In 1712 this Robert Semple received from the court of Esti. Germain's a declaration of noblesse, which stated that he is grandson of the late Hugh, Lord Semple, peer of Scotland and sole heir male of the property and the ancient title of the said lord, whose fourth son, Archibald. Father of the said Robert, is the only one who left any living male child. On the 16th of July 1723 he appears as Mr. Robert Semple, captain of the regiment of Dillon. He died at Paris intestate. In the documents of probate he is termed Robert, Lord Semple, alias Robert Semple. On the strength of the title given to him in this reference, the Marquis de Ruvigny states that after 1723, when he was termed simply Mr. Robert Semple, he seems after that date to have been created by James III. N. 8. A Lord and Peer of Parliament. This assumption has also been made by Mr. Fitzroy Bell, Mr. Andrew Lang, and other recent writers, but there is no evidence of any new creation, nor indeed was there any necessity for it. Robert Semple the soldier had received in 1712 the declaration that he was entitled to the ancient title, but apparently had not used it. It seems natural to believe that his son Francis, who on the death of the father would prepare the probate papers, inserted in them the title of Lord, to which the declaration of 1712 said his father was entitled. And that on succeeding he assumed the title which his father had not used. The following table shows the relationship of the Jacobite Lord Semple with the nobleman who bore the same title in Scotland. He fought at Culloden and died the same year at Aberdeen, c. Appendix 2. Murray of Broughton and the Bishopric of Edinburgh. At the Revolution there were 807 parishes in Scotland filled by ministers of the Episcopal Church. On the accession of William and Mary and the abolition of episcopacy and the establishment of the Presbyterian Church, all the bishops refused the oath to the new sovereigns, and a large number of the clergy left their parishes for the same reason. At first there was much toleration, but as the bishops and the episcopal clergy were all non-jurors and maintained their allegiance to the exiled Stuart kings, they gradually became a Jacobite institution. Although very feeble, they were torn with internal dissension both doctrinal and ecclesiastical. As the pre-revolution bishops died out, it was thought necessary in order to keep up the succession to consecrate new bishops, but this had to be done with utmost secrecy. At first these bishops were appointed bishops at large without any diocese or territorial jurisdiction, and were known as the College of Bishops, but gradually the clergy demanded some sort of superintendence. Bishops were consecrated by one party and by others, but all on the understanding that they owed allegiance to the Stuart King. To avoid scandal the Jacobite managers and the Jacobite court insisted that when bishops were elected the king should be informed so as to give congé d'Alier before consecration. This power was afterwards compromised by the exiled king permitting the clergy to select all the bishops except the metropolitans of Esti. Andrews and Glasgow, and a bishop of Edinburgh who might have to act as metropolitan under the title of Vicar General of St. Andrews. In the year 1741 John Murray, as agent in Scotland for the Jacobite court, sent up the name of William Harper, who was incumbent of St. Paul's non-juring Episcopal Church in Caribers Close. He was well connected, being married to a daughter of Sir David Thrypland of Fingask, and he was also principal advisor to most of the prominent Jacobites of the time. Some of the bishops did not want him, and Bishop Keith represented to the Chevalier through Murray that Harper was an objectionable person, and implored the king to withdraw his congé d'Alier. Mr. Harper retired from the contest. After much negotiation John Murray, apparently with the concurrence of the majority of the bishops, fixed upon Bishop Rattray as a man likely from his age and rank to put an end to the dissensions. And James sent from Rome a congé de lire to elect him Bishop of Edinburgh, 
apparently with certain metropolitan powers. Rattray, however, died a few days after this permission was received, and the see was not filled until 1776. Bishop Rattray was a Perthshire laird, the head of the ancient family of Rattray of Craighall. His son John acted as surgeon to Prince Charles throughout the campaign of 1745-46. A volume recently published, A Jacobite Stronghold of the Church, by Mary E. Ingram, Edinburgh, 1907, gives much information about William Harper and the Episcopal Church in Jacobite times. Appendix 3. Sir James Stewart. Sir James Stewart, afterwards Stuart Denham, of Good Trees and Coltness, second baronet. His father had been Solicitor General, and his grandfather Lord Advocate, and both belonged to the party of the Covenanters. Sir James was born in 1712, and in 1743 he married Lady Frances, daughter of the fourth Earl of Weems, and sister of Lord Elcho, one of the Jacobite leaders of the 45. When Prince Charles came to Edinburgh, Sir James joined his court, and he is the reputed author of some of the prince's manifestos. In the autumn of 1745 he was sent to France as the prince's agent. In the Stuart papers there is a document headed, A Copy of Sir James Stuart's Powers, December 29, 1746. News Charles Prince de Gaulle's Regent de Royaumes d'Angleterre, d'Ecosse, etc. Jijin Chu Ils Notre Service Don la Conjuncture present de Charger de nos affaires opers de sa majestres Christiane en personne instruite de nos intentions nous savons choisi le chevalier baronet Stuart aquel nous savons don et donnons pouvoir. Commission, et mandament special de traitor et negatier avec les ministres de sa majeste, tres Christiane, arrestor, conclure et signer avec use two les articles ou conventions Chu Il avis era bon etre. Fate of Paris CE 29 December 1746. This seems to be a copy of the credential which he received in Edinburgh, and which, probably for precautionary reasons, he did not carry with him in case of being captured and searched. The whole commission is printed among the Stuart papers in Brown's History of the Highlands, Volume 3. Sir James was specially accepted from the Act of Indemnity of 1747. He wandered on the continent until 1763 when he was permitted to return to Scotland. He received a pardon in 1771, and died in 1780. He was author of Inquiry into the Principles of Political Economy, 1767, and other works. There is information about his Jacobite career in the narratives of his brother-in-law, Lord Elcho, recently published, also a long biography in the Coltness Collections, in which every effort is made to ignore or minimize his Jacobitism. There was something mysterious both about his joining the Jacobite court and about his departure from Scotland. Robert Chambers, in his History of the Rebellion, Chapter 24, relates, upon the authority of Sir Henry Stuart of Allenton, Sir James's near relative, the story of his joining the prince at Holyrood, which may be told in Chambers's own words. Descended of a Whig family, Sir James had, nevertheless, allowed himself, in the course of his travels, to form an intimacy with the Stuart princes and some of their principal adherents. He had more lately been piqued at the treatment he had received at an election from one of the officers of the government. He was disposed to join the enterprise of the prince, but wished that, in doing so, he should not appear quite a free agent. His sister's husband, the Earl of Buchan, a good man, of moderate understanding, was brought by him to the same views, and they agreed with Lady Stuart's brother, Lord Elcho, that they should be seized in a public place. And carried to Holyrood House, as if against their will. Walking next day at the Cross of Edinburgh, Sir James and the Earl were seized accordingly, and conducted to the palace. There a message was sent from an anteroom to the Chevalier, mentioning their presence. The Prince, who in the meanwhile had heard of the manner of their visit, returned for answer, that if the Earl of Buchan and Sir James Stuart came as willing partisans to befriend his cause, he should be proud and happy to see them. But not otherwise. This bluntness, though honorable to the prince's candor, displeased Buchan, whose resolution, perhaps, had already begun to give way. He therefore made a low bow to the officer, and said, Please inform His Royal Highness that I have the honor to be his most obedient humble servant, after which he instantly left the palace. Sir James, too much offended with the government to retrace his steps, remained to see the prince upon the terms prescribed. 
there was something still more mysterious about his departure. The following depositions were found in the records of the Sheriff Court of Concordanshire by Drive W. and McNaughton of Stonehaven, who kindly sent them to me. The depositions were taken from witnesses in a civil action of false imprisonment by James Grant against Alexander Geary of Mergy. Geary acted as deputy governor of Stonehaven for Prince Charles. Apparently the authorities took the opportunity of interrogating the Jacobite witnesses about Sir James. The portions of the depositions that refer to Sir James Stewart only are here given. 1. Peter Barclay of Johnstown. Being interrogate concerning Sir James Stewart depones that sometime about the middle of November or a little before it, the deponent had occasion to be at Stonhive in a tavern with Mr. Geary, that he saw a person who passed under the name of Brown, and who was called by Mergy to the deponent a prisoner. But that there was no guard set upon him and the deponent saw him at liberty to go out and in under no confinement that the deponent could observe. That the deponent had had occasion about sixteen years before to be in company with Sir James Stewart that when the deponent saw this person who was called Brown he thought he had seen him before. But could not then recollect who he was that the day after the deponent had seen this person he was conversing with one Menzies in the French service was inquiring who this person might be and was positive he had seen him before. That Menzies said he did not know who he was, but that some days before Lord Lewis Gordon had been dining with him. And he observed that Lord Lewis was drinking to this person his health that upon this the deponent recollected and said he imagined him to be Sir James Stewart. Depones that when that person was ordered to be taken on board of a French ship by Mergy's command he took a formal protest in waiting against Mergy for forcing him out of the kingdom against his will. Being interrogate if he thought it was a serious protest depones that he did not know what to think of it but was very much surprised at the whole proceeding and that when the deponent said to Mergy that he judged this person to be Sir James Stewart. Mergy absolutely refused that it was, that this person went down to the boat in order to embark aboard of the ship which lay at anchor without any guard attending him, Mergy and the deponent and several others went along with him to the boat. 4. John Maul depones that sometime in October 1745 a French ship arrived in the harbor of Stonhive with some chests of arms, six pieces of cannon, and other warlike stores, that Mergy received from the hands of one black, who called himself supercargo of the said ship all these warlike instruments, and called in the country to assist in carrying them southwards, depones that the above-mentioned black went south along with the cargo of arms etc., which were brought from on board the above-mentioned vessel and returned again in about two weeks after he arrived at the public house kept by John Falconer and that there was in his company as the deponent had occasion to see immediately after his arrival a gentleman unknown to the deponent. That when the deponent inquired at Black who this person was Black told him he had met with him at Montrose, and believed him to be one of the officers who had been taken prisoner at the Battle of Prestonpans and had made his escape that Black desired the deponent to go to Mergy and inform him that there was such a gentleman at Mr. Falconer's house whom he suspected to be an officer of General Cope's army who had made his escape, that the deponent delivered this message to Mergy. Upon which Mergy came directly up to the mill of Stonhive that the deponent accompanied Mergy with a guard, that Mergy and Black took the said person unknown to the deponent into an apartment by themselves. And after staying about an hour returned again and showed to the deponent a black cockade and about sixty or seventy pistol shot, which he said he had found upon searching about this unknown person and ordered him to be kept prisoner. And accordingly a guard was placed upon the house all that night that next day the deponent was sent for by Mergy and received orders from him to remove the guard which was upon the said unknown person, and to take the custody and care of him himself, and desired him to keep sight of him and not suffer him to make his escape. That for two or three days the deponent kept a pretty watchful eye over the said unknown gentleman during the daytime and at night there was always a guard of three or four men placed on the house but after that during his stay in Stonhive the deponent sometimes attended the said gentleman when he walked for his recreation any distance from the town but he was left for most part without any guard or attendance. That during the time of the said person's stay at Stonhive Mergy was frequently in. Company with him at dinner and supper and frequently they were alone together depones that one day when the deponent was in the leg room of the mill of Stonhive he heard this unknown gentleman and the first and second master of the above-mentioned French ship and company in the room immediately above. That the deponent heard them laughing and very merry together, that they were speaking French and so loud that if the deponent had understood it, he might have heard what they said very well. That after the above-mentioned company above stairs had parted, 
the deponent met with the second master of the French vessel and asked him how it came about that he was so very familiar and so free in the company of that gentleman who was a prisoner. Oh! said the master in English which he spoke very well, you are quite mistaken, this is one of our own friends, depones that to the best of the deponent's remembrance this person stayed in town about eight or ten days. That when the ship was ready to sail Mergy signed a formal warran for transporting him in the said ship to France and a guard was placed in order to convey him to the boat, that the said person took a formal protest agt. Mergy for sending him out of the kingdom against his will. And being interrogate if he understood the said protest to be serious depones that he did not know what to think of it and was very much surprised when he considered of all the proceedings in relation to this person from first to last. How he was upon his first arrival under a strict guard afterwards very much at liberty and last of all formally sent aboard of the ship to be transported seemingly against his will. That when this person was going into the boat and taking his leave of other people upon the shore he came up to the deponent and embracing him very kindly, told him that he was very sensible of his civilities. And would represent his good behavior to people that he did not then think of, depones that he remembers when this person was in Stonhive, there was an attempt made by the Ludlow Castle, a ship belonging to the king's navy, to force the harbor by her boat with about fifty men or thereby. That upon this occasion the unknown person above mentioned was very active in assisting and directing the French crew about the manner of planting their battery and defending the harbor in which he seemed to have skill. Depones that Mergy at first when this person was committed to the deponent's custody charged him to be very strict in his watch over him but shortly after desired him to be easy with him and let him go about his business as he pleased to pones that he would know this person if he saw him again but that he knew nothing who he was during the time of his stay at Stonhive. That shortly after he heard from people that came from the south that it was Sir James Stewart that a few days after the said person came to Stonhive Sir Alexander Bannerman came and waited upon him at the mill of Stonhive immediately after the deponent received orders from Mergy not to be strict in his guard over the said person depones that when he saw the said person so very active, in giving directions about planting the cannon against the king's boat which attempted the harbor he did then. And not till then suspect that his being a prisoner was a farce. Six. William Herdman. Being interrogate concerning Sir James Stewart depones that he had occasion to see and be in company sometimes with a gentleman who was said to be a prisoner, that for several days after his arrival he was strictly guarded. But after that was left at large to go where he pleased, that one black who came over as supercargo on board a French vessel and had gone to the south about three weeks before returned again in company with this unknown gentleman. That he said he had met with this gentleman upon the road but did not know who he was, that the deponent sincerely believed this gentleman by his behavior and conversation to be a person well affected to the government, till the Ludlow Castle. One of his majesty's ships, appeared and attempted to make the harbor with her long boat and some men on board. Upon which occasion the deponent observed that this gentleman seemed to be in some hurry and concern and as the deponent was passing near to the harbor he saw this gentleman and Mr. Black standing together and heard the said gentleman calling out with an appearance of solicitude and keenness to the people who were driving down dung to the shore for defense of the harbor, to go faster. Or saying something to that purpose which occasioned in the deponent a strong suspicion that he was in reality in the interest of the pretender's party but after that when he saw him carried down to the ship like a criminal with a guard about him. The deponent was confounded and did not know what to think of it, that some time thereafter the deponent heard a rumor in the country that it was Sir James Stewart. After that Mergy told him that it was Sir James Stewart and jocked at his ignorance in imagining that he was really a prisoner. 7. John Lawson, Doctor. Being interrogate concerning Sir James Stewart depones that sometime towards the end of 1745 there arrived a French ship in the harbor of Stonhive that one black who was said to be supercargo of the said ship came and lodged in the deponent's house that shortly after his arrival he went south. And about a fortnight or three weeks thereafter the said Mr. Black returned and arrived at the mill of Stonhive and in his company there was an unknown gentleman who was immediately taken as a prisoner by Mergy. That the deponent had occasion to see the said gentleman about an hour after his arrival and saw wild eyes? Valise, or a bag which the deponent was told Mergy had searched, and in which nothing was remarkable but a small duck bag with some pistol ball in it and a black cockade. That the deponent observed about three or four days after his arrival he was more at liberty only John Mall writer in Stonhive was said always to have him in custody, the deponent has seen him alone without anybody looking after him. 
that some days after his arrival Sir Alexer. Bannerman came to Stonhive de Pones that he had a strong impression from what he heard talked of frequently that this person's confinement was only a farce. That the deponent heard some time after the said gentleman was put on board the French ship that he was Sir James Stewart of Good Trees. 8. John Falconer. Being interrogate concerning Sir James Stewart depones that a person unknown to him, said to be a prisoner of Murgies and passed under the name of Brown lodged in his house. That after the first three or four days he was left at liberty to go where he pleased either upon foot or horseback upon parole as the deponent heard to Murgy. And the deponent thinks he could have easily made his escape if he had a mind the deponent has seen him frequently privately in company with Murgy. Appendix 4. The Guildhall Relief Fund. This fund, in the distribution of which Walter Grosset was concerned, and of which his brother's widow and children were the largest beneficiaries, was probably the earliest example of systematic organization for the supply of comforts to soldiers in the field, to the sick and wounded, and for provision for widows and orphans. The fund was instituted at the Guildhall, London, on November 27, 1745, by Sir Richard Hoare, then Lord Mayor. The minute of the first meeting aptly declares the intention of the founders. We whose names are underwritten, in consideration of the particular hardships and inconveniences which may be suffered by such soldiers as now are, or shall hereafter be employed in His Majesty's service during the winter season, towards the suppression of the present unnatural rebellion. Do hereby voluntarily subscribe and pay the several sums set by us against our respective names to be applied towards their relief, support, and encouragement, in such manner, and in such proportion, as shall be deemed to be most necessary and expedient by a committee which shall hereafter be appointed for that purpose by us, or the major part who shall be present at any general meeting, pursuant to an advertisement in the London Gazette. The result of the efforts of the Lord Mayor and his associates is recorded in an admirable report printed in 1747. The report gives a subscription list. There were exactly 500 subscriptions, and the total amount subscribed was £18,910, zeros. 9d, the largest subscription was that of the R.T. Hahn. Lord Chief Justice, Master of the Rolls, Lord Chief Justice Wiles, Lord Chief Baron Parker and the honourable judges, whose gift was £1,200, the smallest that of the parish of St. Thomas, Southwark, which gave tens. 9d. In the list are found subscriptions from the Prince of Wales, £500, the Mayor, Commonalty, and Citizens of the City of London, £1,000, Governor and Company of the Bank of England, £1,000, John Rich from the Theatre Royal in Covent Garden, £602, sevens. The Gentlemen Volunteers of the City of London, £523, 19th. The City Company subscribed sums varying from £100 to £300, and it is interesting to find in the list the name of Isaac Watts, D.D., for a subscription of £5, fives. The report, which is an excellent business document, finishes with the following paragraph. In this manner your committee proposed that the conclusion of this subscription should be agreeable to the design of its original institution. Since every calamity you can remove, or every comfort you can bestow on behalf of the private soldier, will be giving them so much new strength and vigor to act in defense of our liberties, and support of our constitution. Wherein both interest and duty, both public safety and public charity, may be jointly urged as motives to your benevolence. And as to what has already been expended, if relief under sickness, if support under fatigue, if encouragement under dangers, are to be esteemed acts of humanity or beneficence. By how much stronger ties were we called upon to return such assistance to those who under the greatest hazards and difficulties were protecting us in the enjoyment of everything that was dear and valuable, and your committee flatter themselves that the zeal which was exerted on this occasion. By the magistrates, merchants, and other inhabitants of this metropolis, contributed no less to dispirit the enemy, than it did to animate our own forces, until they obtained that complete victory over the rebels. Which so happily preserved the religion, laws and liberties of this kingdom, the inseparable blessings of His Majesty's government. Details of the disbursements of the fund are given in appendices which are printed below, and are interesting in the present time of war for the sake of comparison with similar modern activities. They are printed from an original copy of the report in the editor's possession. Appendix No. I, is the list of subscriptions. 
Appendix No. 2. An account of the necessaries contracted for, their patterns and price. Stockings. Long hose, furnished by Mr. Stiles, made in Westmoreland, and by him delivered at twelves. Per dozen pair. Ten thousand pair. Short hose. Collected by Mr. Samuel Handley, in and about London, and by him delivered at the rate of elevens. Ten d. Per dozen pair, he declining to make any profit thereby. Six thousand five hundred and four pair. Sixteen thousand five hundred and four pair. Breeches. Contracted for with Messrs. Fulagar and Allen, too. Be made of cursey of the value of forties. The piece, half. Of them to be red and half blue, of three sizes, viz. 2ds, 3ds, and 4ths, at the rate of threes. 3 one half d. Each. Pair, with as good lining, and of the same make as the patterns. Delivered and sealed, and all to be strongly and well sewed, the said pattern to be the largest of the three sizes. 2000. Pair, or upwards, to be delivered each week, till the whole was complete. 15,000 pair. Shirts. Contracted for with Messrs. John and Michael. Turner, and Mr. Chambers, at the price of threes. 60. Each, all to be made of scones garlic of the same sort and goodness, with a sealed shirt left as a pattern. And each shirt to contain two L's th of cloth, and to be made of the same size, and in as good and strong a manner as the pattern. Shirt, with the allowance of 2d. Per shirt for 600. To be made somewhat better, being intended for the sergeants. 1,500 to be delivered weekly until the whole was complete. 12,000. Woolen caps. Contracted with the above-named Messrs. Fulagar and Allen to be made of the same make and size with a sealed pattern delivered in of blue, red, and green, the same. To be of long L's, of 12d. The yard, at the price of 5d. Per cap, the whole number to be delivered at. Guildhall, on the 1st of January, the contract. Bearing date the 20th of December 1745. 10,000. Blankets. Contracted for with Messrs. Brooks, Senator and June. Of. Whitney in Oxfordshire, to be nine quarters wide. And not above thirteenths. 6d, per pair. 1,000. Woolen gloves. Furnished by Mr. Stiles, in Westmoreland, and delivered, being of. Different sizes, at the rate of fives. To success. And 2d. Per dozen pair. Being the prime cost, he declining to make any profit thereby. 12,000 pair. Woolen ankle spatterdashers. Contracted for with the above named Messrs. Fulagar and Allen too. Be made of three sizes agreeable to a sealed pattern, both as to the goodness of the cloth, and manner of sewing and making, with flat metal buttons, and the straps of ruffia drab. Of the price of 18 pence halfpenny a pair. 9,100 pair. Appendix No. 3. Containing an account of the distribution of the sum of 4,000 L. Amongst the regiments engaged at Culloden, the number on the spot, and the sums allowed to each, according to the apportionment transmitted by His Royal Highness the Duke. Regiments. Numbers on the spot. Sums allowed to each. Surgeds. Corps. Drum. Private. L. S. D. Royal, 1st. 30. 37. 26. 420. 265. 10. 11. Howard, 3rd. 24. 23. 16. 493. 281. 0. 6 and a quarter. Barrel, 
4, 20, 23, 10, 365, 213, 1, 8 and a half, Wolf, 8, 19, 22, 18, 387, 225, 17, 7 and a quarter. Pulteney, 13th, 23, 26, 18, 479, 276, 5, 0 one fourth. Price, 14th, 22, 22, 12, 339, 202, 19, 6 and a quarter. Sackville, 20th, 23, 25, 14, 464, 216, 10, 6 and a half. Campbell, 21st, 22, 22, 12, 336, 225, 18, 5 and a half. Semple, 25th, 20, 25, 19, 487, 277, 0, 11, Blakeney, 27th, 25, 22, 12, 336, 204, 8, 2 and a half. Chumley, 34th, 22, 24, 15, 433, 255, 8, 2 and a half. Fleming, 36th, 26, 22, 14, 376, 225, 8, 0 one half. Dijon, 37th, 23, 24, 19, 474, 273, 1, 2 and a quarter. Conway, 48th, 21, 22, 16, 342, 205, 6, 5. Battero, disbanded. 24, 33, 18, 384, 236, 3, 1. Argilshire men. 32, 30, 9, 430, 259, 13, 8 and a half. 402, 6602, 14, 0 3 fourth. Surgts. Bomber. Gunner. Matt Ross. Drum. Train. 9. 67. 8. 0. Pound. 2. 0 3 fourth. Overplus. 17. 11 and a quarter. 0. 0. NB, as the overplus 3L. 17, 11 1 fourth D. Could not be divided amongst the regiments, it was distributed to some few particular objects. The above sums divided in proportion to the pay of the several ranks, give to each man as follows, viz. Regiments. Train. Sergeant. Zero pounds. Nineteen. One and a half. Sergeant. One pound. Three. Corporal. Zero. Twelve. Nine and a half. Bombardier. One. Eleven. Drummer and private man. Zero. Nine. Six and three quarters. 
Gunner. 1. 5. 7. Matt Ross and Drummer. 0. 1 and a half. Appendix No. 4. Containing an account of the needy widows, and orphans of officers and soldiers killed at the battles of Falkirk and Culloden, who have been relieved by this subscription. Widows and Orphans of Officers. L. To Lieutenant Colonel Whitney's widow. Major Brown's widow. 50. Captain Grosset's widow and four children. Captain Edmondson's widow and one child. Captain. Launders' widow. Lieutenant Perry's widow and one child. Lieutenant McNair's widow. The widow of Mr. Borsia and four children. 580. Widows and orphans of sergeants and private soldiers. To Hester Mounts, sergeant's widow, and two daughters. 30. Esther Smith. Sergeant's widow. Ellen Edge, soldier's widow, and five children. Bridget Moore and two children. Jane Fishborn and one child. Widow Nickel and four children. Widow Cole and two children. Widow Perkins and one child. Widow Richards and two children. Widow Gale and two children. Widow Salisbury. Widow Newsham and three children. Widow Craig and one child. Widow Combs and one child. Widow Wright and four children. Widow Herbert and two children. Widow Bolton. Two orphans of John Johnson. Nineteen other widows of private men belonging to. The Glasgow Regiment. At 5 L. Each. 46 orphans at 3 L. Each. In all. 1,160 pounds. Appendix No. V. Containing an account of the particular disbursements. L. S. D. To Messrs. Styles for 10,000 pair of long stockings, and for wrappers, package, and c. 508. 10. To Mr. Handley for 6,500 pair of short ditto, with charges of delivery. 321. 5. 2. To Messrs. Fulagar and Allen for 15,000 pair of breeches. 15. To Messrs. John and Michael Turner for 6,000 shirts. 10. To Mr. Abraham Chambers for 6,000 ditto. 10. To Messrs. Fulagar and Allen for 10,000 caps. 6. To Messrs. Brooks, Senator, and June for 1,000 blankets. 10. To Messrs. Styles for 12,000 pair of woolen gloves, with the wrappers, and c. 289. 18. 8. To Messrs. Fulagar and Allen for 9,100 pair of spatterdashers. 5. To the Right Honorable Stephen Points, ESQ for the use of the Duke's Hospital. 300. 0. To the maimed and wounded soldiers from Preston Pans. 0. To Mr. Cuthbert Smith, Mayor of Newcastle, for the use of the sick soldiers in those parts. 300. 0. To Ditto, for his disbursements. 13. 10. To Mr. Alderman Winterbottom, for package of goods sent to Scotland. 87. 4. 6. To His Royal Highness the Duke. For the maimed and wounded at Falkirk. 300. 0. To His Royal Highness the Duke, to be paid for distinguished acts of service. 1,000 pounds. 0. To His Royal Highness the Duke, to be divided amongst the regiments engaged at Culloden. 4,000. To His Royal Highness the Duke, to be given to the subalterns. 1,000. To Mr. Luke Bell, the committee's agent, for his trouble and subsistence in Scotland. In looking after the goods sent thither. 124. 9. 2. To the widows and orphans of several officers and soldiers. 0. 
to several soldiers by particular recommendations. 1. To Mr. Ford, the committee's secretary, his bill of disbursements for insurance of goods to Scotland, printing advertisements, postage of letters, and other incident expenses. 209. 18. 3. To Ditto, as a gratuity. For himself and clerk. 0. To the Chamberlain's clerks, hall keepers, messengers and attendants. 15. 15,557. 13. Proposed by the committee to allow. L. S. D. To St. Bartholomew's Hospital. 0. 0. Being the balance. 7. To St. Thomas's. 0. 0. To the General Hospital at Bath. 0. 0. To the three infirmaries of London, Westminster, and Hyde Park Corner. 0. 0. To expenses attending the closing of accounts and printing the report. 7. 8. Total of the money subscribed. 18,910. 9. Appendix V. Cardinal York's Memorial to the Pope. This document, which belongs to the Earl of Galloway, is printed by his kind permission. The manuscript bears the following endorsement. Cardinal of York's memorial presented to Pope Clement XIII on the absurdity of the See of Rome in refusing to acknowledge the title of the Cardinal's brother, Charles Edward, to the crown of England on the death of their father in 1766. This paper was given me by my revered relative, Dr. John Cook, President of CCC, who was at Rome at this time, and well known to Cardinal York, though a firm Protestant, in early life he was a friend to the legitimate succession. It is not improbable that he copied this from the original manuscript. V. T. June 16, 1825. A letter from the Honorable Charles Stuart, Fellow of All Souls, afterwards the Bishop of Quebec, to his brother, the 8th Earl of Galloway, dated November. 26, 1825, explains that the initials on the endorsement are those of the Reverend Vaughan Thomas, at one time of Corpus Christi College, Oxford. Mr. Thomas desired that the manuscript should be given to Lord Galloway, whom he considered to be the proper person to possess so interesting a steward document. Memoria. Sopra la necessita indispensable, nella quale si trova la santa c d dover reconnoscere per unici, e legitimi successori del regno d'Inghilterra la real casa stuarda, e sopra la incoerenza ed asserti. Che in e segarebero dal fair il contrario con poco decoro della santa sedi medesima. Chi stend la memoria si dichiera di non voler prior un libro appagiando i suoi raziasing su i fatti publici e noterge. Ni uno nel mondo ignora qualmente il rejacamo secondo fucacciato dal suo regno unicament in odium religionis. Gialistis i fanton della di lui espulsion irano i primi a non metera in controversia du principgin filibili. Il primo, che il regno di Inghilterra era di sua natura successivo. Il secondo che la real persona di Giacomo secondo fos il legitimo successor, per ritrovera dunc un operanti pretesto di cacciarnello senza distrugger il derido della succession che secondo lo leggi a inalterable. Per servire a i loro disegni misero fuori lo stabilimento gia fatto per leg nel regno della religione anglicana. E p entando per massima, che elisir il recatolico fos un imminent e continuo pericolo della distruzione e subversion di tal leg. Fessero un decreto di parlamento in cui pretendendo di spiegare lo spirito della leg di succession di chiarono nel tempo stesso. Che non potes essere atto a succeder a chiunque fos della religione cattolica o recusis di conformasi alla religione dominante. In virtù dun che di questo atto fu ingiustament, ed iniquament cacciato Giacomo secondo e la sua prol cattolica dal suo regno e chiamato a succedera il più prossimo irid protestanti. 
Il che ha proscito fino a di nostri non solamente nelle persone del du figli del istiso Giacomo secondo per esser protestanti ma ancora nelle persone dei principi della casa di Hanover, per esser questi i più prossimi eredi protestanti. In prova di che ci anche ben informato del story di principi di questo secolo, sa, che la principessa Anna, de loro chiamata regina. Valendo favorire Giacomo Terzo so a fratello ad esclusion della casa di Hanover speedy persona accreditate per indurlo a dichiararsi protestanti ed in questa maniera togliere el unico impedimento, che ostis al possesso del di lui regno. Ma quella medesima assistenza speciale di Dio, che dia forza a Giacomo secondo so a padre di sacrificare tre regni per la s. Feed, Dia altrisi forza al di lui figlio di recuser coraggiosamente si fata proposizione per recuperarli. Cio presupposto e cosa indubitata, che ancia a giorni nostri la s. Si non canoniza nian trattato di pace, a cui per mezzo de suoi ministri non intervenga, e molto mino a prova qualunque che passa a sir o direttament o indirettament lessivo de suoi dritti e della s. Chiesa Illinois di Cui Capo A I L Samo Pontefis Vicario di Gesù Cristo, Anzia Majur, Che Se Ni Dano Lu Occasioni, Six Si Fano Contro Lu Davuta Protest. Or, Chi Pio Medera in Dub Bio, O Niger, Che Passa Darsi un Decreto Publico Pu Direttament Contrario alla Nostra S Feed, Conseguentement Pu Lessivo de Dritti della S Madre Chiesa di Quello di Cui Si Trata. Per mezzo del quale viene privato de derido della succession chiang porta impresso il fortunato carattere di essere di le figliolo. Quindi e che i sami pontefici principiando de Innocenzo eleven o di Santa Memoria Judicarono non esir upo di fer alcuna esplicita protesta contro di un si iniquo decreto servendosi e bastandogli in luogo di questa il continuato riconoscimento. Che ha fatto la s. Si della casa real stuarda per gli unisai e legitimi successori del regno, in consequenza di che veniva la s. Si medesima a riscadere per nullo il decreto stesso che per indiretto e tessitament avrebbe approvato semper che soltanto negato av sai legitimi successori catolici il devuto riconoscimento. Ed in fatti six passa un gran divano fra el indispensable riconoscimento che far di la s, si della real casa stuarda, ad esclusion di quella di Hanover de quel che passa nel riconoscimento almino implicito, che fa la medesima s. Si di altri principi eredici. Per modo di esempio. Il papa certament natradena ha correspondenza alcuna coira di svizia e di Danimarca. Ma CIO unicament per assir aglino eredici, non gia perci loro impugno negi la legitima succession dell'assir dira. Quindi in ei diarge stessi stampati call approvazione della corte di Roma, non si fa difficulta di enunciarli per redis visia, per redi Danimarca. Ma nel caso nostro non solo puo il samo pontefis traiter direttament cala casa di Hanover per assir eretica, Ma ne per puo in alcan modo na ancia te sediment riconoscir il capo di quella per legitimo successor del regno di Inghilterra. Poish verabi in tal gaisa a canonizer, ed amateur direttament per valido e sussistent il sedetto inique decreto. Di tutti questi fatti e princip si a veduto dal mondo intero a qual segno era persuasa ed imbavuta la s mem. Di clementi undecimo il quali nellato di ricevere. E di abracciar con paterno amore la maesta di Giacomo Terzo, allorchi per sua unico refugio in virtù de fratati di pace, ai quali tutti gli altri principi catolici. Esclusion il samo pontefis, estredi ferono di acconsentire, si porto nello stato ecclesiastico, e successivament a Roma, persuaso, dico, Illinois es. Padre ed imbavuto del sedet massim e sentimenti non si contento di riconoscire, e di trater la real persona di Giacomo Terzo per unico e legitimo redil Inghilterra. Ma intendendo di valora nella di lui persona riconoscire tutta la regia sua prosepia, 
non lascio nemezi na industri per carcarn la propagazione ed in consequenza procurargli un legitimo successor, epero effettuato. Che fu il matrimonio di Giacomo Terzo Cala Principessa Sobieski. Facilitato non poco de qualsh lettera del Papa scritta al imperador, fra poci messi de ven gravida la regina e circa gli ultimi giorni del anno 1720 travasi prossima al pardo, ed allora ils. Padre conoscendo de una part la necessita di dover rendre incontestable la legitimazione del parto, e dal ultra intendendo el obligo preciso, in cui retravesi la s. Seed, per non contradire a s e stessa, e per vi più semper fare adi protestativi contro el accionato ingiasto decreto, di riconoscere la futura prole quale read presuntivo. E legitimo successor del regno di Inghilterra si accensa a fair questo ato cala maggiori solanita possible. Per l'occhi val als padre, che facero caiamate per assir presenti al pardo Illinois Segro Collegio, Illinois Senato Romano, i primi prelati e principi romani, e la primaria nobilita di Roma. E siccum la maista della regina stento a parterer per lo spazio di tre giorni in circa in tutto questo tempo farono ripien lo anticamere di sua maista dei referti respettabilissimi personaggi. I quali vicendavalment suro gavansi gli uni agli altri, con averbi ancora per natato alcuni dei signori cardinali. In mezzo a dunk di concesso così respettable in ac ai 31 di December dell'anno sudetto Carlo Odordo Principi di Gauls riconosciuto per tale e consequentement per irid presuntivo della corona dal medesimo samo pontefis. Il quale non tardo punto a farlo annunziare a tutto il popolo per mezzo dello spero del canone di Castello. E ca sia lecito rifletir che se il rejacamo terzo stato fos in pacifico possesso del suo trono, non potiva il sedetto nato principi ricevir maggiori anori, ed adi più declaratorge del suo drido successivo alla corona. La sola formalita, che per part della s. Seed remanere pot eva al compimento di questi adi si era la tradizione del fasci benedet solite mandarsi ai soli eredi necessarge del test coronate, non gia elettive, ma unicamente successive, ma perci sesso di vivre la s. Memoria di Clementi undecimo, prima che facero del tutto terminate lo det fasci, tocco al di lui successor innocenzo tradesimo compire questo ultimo ato. Com, egli fis cala magier solanita possible mandando a questo effetto preciso un obbligato con tutte lo formalita e ceremoni solite predicarsi cal altercordi. De tutto questo recanto non si puo negare che apriscono nel sua pieno lo obbligazioni che ha la real casa stuarda alla smem. Di clementi undecimo, ma apriscono altertanto quanto stava a cuor di quel samo pontefis il decoro della s. Seed e cum ben intendiva el indispensable necessita de cui era estreta a sassanir inviolabili idridi della casa real sedetta, vediva benissimo ils. Padre, che tutti questi replicati adi di riconoscimento dovevano necessariamente in asperer il governo di Inghilterra massimament contro i catalisi ed in conseguenza assir in qualsh maniera di osticolo al buon successo del missioni. Capiva altrasi che egli solo era el unico principi catolico, che faceva questi adi di riconoscimento, con tutto cio tenendo avanti gli occhi la giustizia della causa che diveniva punto di religioni. Elaboramento che non mai abbastanza potiva rimestrare la s. Seed al suprasitato decreto, e per fine el obligo preciso de suoi successori in non di perturci giamai de quanto egli fissiva a pro di una famiglia si bene marita della s. Seed, non assido punto di esigurli con tant solanita, per mezzo del quali tagli eva a suoi medesimi successori qualunque ragion di dub bio circa il tradimento de vuto al principi di gauls, seguita la mort del di lui padre. Jacesh sapiva benissimo il samo pontefis che riconosciutosi una volta dalla s. Seed per irid presuntivo di un regno un figlio, non più o metera in dub bio alla mort del di lui padre, che gli succeda in tutto, ed in conseguenza nella sua dignita e eni suoi honori. 
In quella gaisa appuntu, che nel impero, non astanti che sia stato elitivo, riconosciutosi una volta dalla s, seed alcuno rida, romani non puo ella dispensarsi, seguita la morte del imperador, dal riconoscerlo per di lui successor. Pieno pertanto il glorioso clementi undecimo di questi giustissimi sentimenti nel addo stesso di morire. Val manifestar a tutto il sagro collegio qual si fos la sua premiera perci castantment si mantenus quanto eglia viva fado verso la real casa, facendogli su di cio una speciale raccomandazione. Fedelissimi e zelissimi esecutori del operazioni e del testamento di un tanto papa sono stati tutti i pontefici successori principiando de innocenzo tredesimo fino a clementi tredesimo felismente regnanti. Tutti hanno trattato e riscardato il figlio primogenito di Giacomo Terzo come principi di Gauls. Sio successor del regno di Inghilterra. Quindi daqui il principi comincio ad essere messo al udienza dei sami pontefici non six a stata mai la minima difficulta circa il trattamento, anzi non metendosi in dubbio. Che tra lo altra distinzione computer gli deves una sedia a braccio simile a quella del risua padre. Il che è lo style della s seed verso gli eredi presentivi di un regno. A questa sola particolarita prego la maista del re, che si deves derigare in sua presenza a solo ed unico fine mantenere lo style del regno di Inghilterra, che porta non passa any ancha il figlio primogenito sedir in ugual sedia cal padre present. E per adorire a quest brame della maista sua gli a stata semper data una sedia cameral di appoggio, ma bensi senza bracci. Remain ora ad a saminare la contradizione. Ed asserti, che ni segarebero ogni qual volta la s, seed negas di riconoscir il principi di gals per legitimo successor del ref sua padre alla mort di medesimo. Cerebero questi fuere di dubbio senza numero, na si facile sereb elaxinarli tutti, pure eni scorerimo alcuni. E primerament sic cum il principi di gals per lo spazio ornai di 45 anni e stato in possesso del titolo e del prerogative di principi di gals, non si gli passono ora negare, o sia egli present o sia assent. Senza derigare e contradire espressament agli adi più seleni di se papi consecutivi. In secondo luogo ani segareb, che quella medesima, persona, alla quelli la s. Seed oggi da tradimento e riscarda cum principi di Gauls, che vale a dire successor natural del regno di Inghilterra, cum lo e il delfino in Francia, ed il principi di Asturias in Spagna, domani verendo a mort del padre, sesi ricusa. Quando ella eni depart, di riconoscerla cum succeduta al padre medesimo nella dignita ed honori cal fado niga, che sia stato principi di Gauls. In terzo luogo qual tradimento potra darsi, morto il padre, al sedetto principi? Force di principi di Gauls? Ma si averta ch, egli non lo e più. Dun che o gli compete lo stesso tradimento ch, aviva il padre a cui succedito, o convera dire che non gli competiva per tanti anni il titolo, e lo prerogative di successor. Quarto. A finch il papa faccia una innovazione di questa natura contraddittoria ed aposto allo stabilimento di suoi antecessori six vol qualsh causa quelli certament non six ani six puo esir. Poi si alcuno di principi catalici sono stati costretti a retrocedere dal riconoscere la real casa stuarda per legitimo eride e successor del regno di Inghilterra. A avenuto in consequenza dei diversi trattati di pace cal present governo di Inghilterra che li mitiva in necessita di riconoscere la succession eretica com era stata stabilita dal famoso decreto del Parlamento, ma tal causa ogien un ben vid che. Non puo a dersi dal s. Padre in alcun modo, egli non hamai fado, ne puo for trattati di alcuna sorta co principi eretici. Egli nepur ha adorito in questa part ai sedetti trattati di pace di altri principi, sopra tutto egli non ha potuto mai nepuo riconoscere per valido, 
o sussistent i el famoso referido decreto contro del quali, cum si a axinado di sopra. Serve di incontrastabile protesta i el continuato riconoscimento della casa real stuarda. Anzi de caverabi i el quinto asserto di gravissimo pregiadizio alla s. Seed, e con amorazion di tutti i buoni. Mentre sassando di riconoscir i l principi di gauls cum successor del re sua padre, verabi i l papa in certa maniera a rivicare tutte le protest fat de suoi antecessori. E sene inferareb una pregiadise evilissima consequenza. Sio che quando in un stato eretico i l principi si faccia catolico sia in facolta di sudditi per questo solo motivo di esclitterlo dal principato. Sesto. Che non vid el asserto gravissimo, che ni succedere ebeni, publici diarge stampati fin ora cal, autorita della est, seda semper per lo spazio di tanti anni in una stessa maniera? Sato il titolo di Inghilterra d'avra force scriversi Giorgio Terzo? Ma questo non si puo, mentre non six a mai avuto luogo, ni puo el asir riconosciuto per redal papa. Davra dunque lasciarsi sato i l sedetto titolo Carlo Odordo Principi di Gauls, Enrico Benedetto Duce di York. Ma i l padre dave? Se egli e morto, non six a più Principi di Gauls. Dunque questo titolo non gli compete. Sic o bisona indicarlo per o bisona casarlo, e casar anzi per semper i l titolo di Inghilterra, come se più non six fos. Remain finalment ad a seminare, se nelli circustans present della s. Seed riconoscendo i l papa in caso di mort del re Giacomo Terzo i l di lui figlio gia per tanti anni in possesso del titolo e del prerogative di principi di gauls per di lui successor nelli dignita ed honori. Passa a giusta ragion cio caiamarsi novita. Ci scrive si appella al mondo tuto, ai nemesi medesimi della casa real. Magia de questi stessi sente replicarsi ad una voce, che sareb anzi novita per la s. Seed fair il contrario, sareb contradizione a s e stessa, sareb appravere cio che non puo appravere, e per fine si usareb una grandissima ostilita alla casa real in benemerenza di avir sagrificati tre regni per la s. Feed, privandola col fado del solo asilo, in cui passa rise dir con decoro, e di cui esteta in possesso per il decorso di tanti anni. Na six a certament principi catolico che non canosca per tutti i motivi sopradetti el indispensable necessita in cui trovesi la s. C di non fer altrimenti, e capiscono tutti benissimo che nian principi a tenuto a render conto all altro del operazioni, che egli fa, particolarment quando sono consigens. E principe del proprio stato, ed in effet non ostanti che tutti i principi catolici in corpo abiano ultimament ricassato di riconoscir il re di Polonia. Ed il solo papa con du principi eredici lo abiano riconosciuto, quelli piro de a principi catolici ha fatto mai querila su di cio alles. Padre, o facendola non fos per contentarsi di una si giusta risposta, qual sareb? Che il papa non è obbligato a render ragion del su operazione in alcun circostans. Che in questo non ha fatto altro, che segaire lumassum, ed i principe della est seed, e finalment, che a lui basta, che gli costi della validità del illusione, e del davuta convenience usate al suo annunzio, e per conseguenza alla sua persona? Ma nel caso nostro semper cres el argumento. Poi il riconoscimento di un re di Polonia potreb amatir qualch is same, o discussion. Ma qual discussion o is same puo mai ricci dursi nel riconoscir la legitima succession di un figlio al padre dopo la sua mort nelli di lui prerogative ed honori? Non agia questo riconoscimento cum quello in realtà, ad un uovo ma bensi una sola necessaria conseguenza di quello. Che gia fu stabilito de tanti anni di sami pontefici, allorchi riconibero il figlio di Giacomo Terzo. E tutti gli argumenti, che ader si potrebero, acciosh la s. 
Seed faces una simul novita di dispensarsi dal riconoscere il principe di gals alla morte del di lui genitore per sua legittimo successor, potevano a dersi, ed avevano anzi magier forza per impedire il riconoscimento del medesimo. In qualità di principe di gals dalla s. mem. Di clementi undecimo con tutte cal circustans e solanita gia rifrite. Mentre in che tempi il Papa fu il solo principe cattolico, che ricanab il figlio di Giacomo Terzo per principe di Gauls. E quantunque la casa di Hanover si avides che questo atto fosse un impegno presso dalla s. Seed, cum certament lo era, di diverlo in appresso riconoscere per legittimo successor del padre dopo la di lui mort, cio non astanti non apporto alcuno di che cattivi effetti. Force ideati. O tenuti de alcuna persona poco informate e pratish dello stato del cos in quel regno. Chi ha scritto questa memoria in ultimo si di chiera, che non ha avuto altro scopo, che togliere i scrupoli di alcuni poco in tisi del cos del mondo, e ribatir la difficulta che for susciter si potreb di nemesi non mino della casa real. Che della s. Seed. Del resto i protesti veramente tenuti alla continue dimostrazione di paterno amore, e clemens usate dalla santita di nostro signore felismente regnanti verso tutta la sedetta casa real, che non puo neper sospiter. Che mancando a suoi tempi il regiacomo terzo voglia punto deviar dal savasim traxi indicatigli de suoi gloriosi antecessori. Nota, siccum dopo stessa la present memoria. Per troppo non ha mancato più di uno di metera in dub bio i sentimenti della santita di nostro signore felismente regnanti verso la real casa. Quasi che facero totalmente diversi de quella de suoi antecessori. Ed in conseguenza patersi sapor essere un semplice complimento verso la santita sua quel tanto che con fiducia si viva presuppone elestensor nel ultimo della memoria persio lo stesso ha creduto uno preciso d'ovra di giustizia. Ed in simi di gratitudine rispettosa verso li s. Padre di insurire in fine questa stessa memoria tutte lo latir. Che persono aver rapporto alla present risoluzione presa dal real principe di Gauls di ritornare in questa capitale. E siccome a Paris più chiaro della luz del sol, quali siano i sentimenti precisi del s. Padre verso la real casa, e la persona del real principe di Gauls sedetto tanto autenticamente manifestati, così lo stesso estensor creed non asservi bisogno di glossa per far conoscere quanto siano insistenti, e false le precorse assertive. E con quanta ragion e fondamento abbia rimestrato l'estensor tutta la fiducia e sicurezza nei sentimenti della santita sua e quanto li abbia ben comprisi il real principe di Gauls. Jacques Unicament in virtù de la medesimi sia accinto alla risoluzione di restituirsi a Roma. Translation. Concerning the indispensable necessity of recognition, by the Holy See, of the Royal House of Stuart, as the sole and legitimate successors to the Kingdom of England. And concerning the inconsistencies and incongruities which would ensue, should she follow the contrary course, being one which would little become the dignity of the Holy See. He who presents this memorial wishes to state the case briefly, basing his reasonings on public and well-known facts. No one in the world is ignorant of the fact that King James II was hunted from his throne in odium religionis. The very people who were scheming for his expulsion would have been the last to deny two infallible principles. The first, that the Kingdom of England was, of its nature, an hereditary one, the second, that the royal person of James II was the lawful successor. Wishing therefore to find an adequate pretext for deposing him, without destroying the right of succession, which is, by law, unalterable, they, to serve their own ends, brought forward the question of the establishment in the kingdom, already made by law, of the Anglican religion, and making as their chief complaint, that the fact of the king being a Catholic placed that law in constant and imminent peril of destruction and subversion, they made an act of parliament in which, while claiming to explain the spirit of the laws of succession, they declared at the same time that it was not fitting that any one whosoever should succeed who was of the Catholic religion, 
or who did not conform to the dominant religion. By virtue of this act, then, were James II. And his Catholic offspring deprived of the throne, and his nearest Protestant relative was called to succeed to it, whose line has continued to do so even to our own days, not only in the persons of James II's two daughters, who were Protestants, but also in those of the princes of the House of Hanover, these being the nearest Protestant heirs. In proof of this, any one who has knowledge of the history of the princes of this century knows that the princess Anne, called by them queen, wishing to show favor to her brother James III. To the exclusion of the House of Hanover, sent accredited persons to try to persuade him to declare himself a Protestant, and to remove, in this manner. The only obstacle that stood in the way of his possession of his kingdom, but that special grace of God, which gave strength to his father, James II. To sacrifice three kingdoms for the holy faith, likewise gave strength to his son to refuse courageously any such means of regaining them. This, one may take for granted, is an undoubted fact, that then, as now, the Holy See is bound by no treaty of peace, in the arranging of which, by means of her ministers, she has had no voice. And how much less does she approve of any act that can, either directly or indirectly, infringe on her rights and those of Holy Church, the head of whom is the Supreme Pontiff. The Vicar of Christ, rather should such arise she would make fitting protests. Now can it be questioned that any public decree could be more directly contrary to our holy faith, and consequently could infringe more seriously on the rights of Holy Mother Church, than that of which we are treating. By means of which the rights of succession are denied to any one happy enough to be one of her sons? Hence it is that the Supreme Pontiffs, beginning with Innocent XI, of pious memory, did not deem it necessary to make any explicit protest against such an iniquitous decree, contenting themselves instead with the continued recognition which the Holy See has always accorded to the royal house of Stuart. As the sole and legitimate successors to the throne, so that the Holy See came to regard this decree, to which, had she refused to recognize the legitimate Catholic successors, she would have been indirectly and tacitly agreeing, as null. And indeed, there is a great comparison to be drawn between the recognition given by the Holy See to the royal house of Stuart, to the exclusion of the house of Hanover, and that which this same Holy See accords to other heretical princes. As, for example, the Pope certainly is in no treaty, and has no correspondence with the kings of Sweden and Denmark, but this is solely because they are heretics, not because he denies in any way their legitimate right to their succession. Thus, in the papers printed with the approbation of the Court of Rome, no difficulty is raised as to speaking of them as King of Sweden and King of Denmark. But in the case in point, the Most High Pontiff treats directly with this heretical house of Hanover, though he cannot by any means recognize its head as the legitimate successor to the Kingdom of England. So that in this manner he is ratifying the aforesaid iniquitous decree, and directly admitting it as valid and real. It is plainly seen by the whole world how deeply imbued with these facts and principles was Clement XI. Of blessed memory, who, when His Majesty King James III. turned to him as his only refuge, on account of the Treaty of Peace, to which all the Catholic princes, with the exception of His Holiness, were constrained to consent, carried him away to the Papal States, and afterwards to Rome, the Holy Father. I say, fully imbued with and convinced of the aforesaid sentiments and truth, did not content himself with simply recognizing and treating the royal person of James III. As the sole and legitimate King of England, but, wishing to recognize also all his royal progeny, he spared no trouble to ensure that the propagation of the line should be carried on, in order to procure him a legitimate successor. This was effected by the marriage of James III. With the Princess Sobieski, which was not a little facilitated by letters written by the Pope to the Emperor. In a few months it became known that the hopes for an heir were to be realized, and towards the last days of the year 1720, as the time of his birth approached. The Holy Father knowing on the one side the necessity of rendering the legitimacy of the birth indisputable, and on the other, realizing that the Holy See must in no wise contradict herself. But must act in such a manner as to show most decidedly her protest against the unjust decree, by recognizing the future offspring as heir apparent and legitimate successor to the throne of England. He took upon himself to see that this event should take place with the greatest possible solemnity. And therefore, by the wish of the Holy Father, there were called to be present at the birth, the Sacred College, the Roman Senate, the
the highest Roman princes and prelates, and the foremost nobility of Rome. And although there was a delay of three days before the birth took place, during the whole of this time the anterooms of Her Majesty were filled with these most venerable personages, who relieved one another by turns. While some of the cardinals sat up each night. Thus, in the midst of so honorable an assembly was born on December 31st of the aforesaid year, Charles Edward, Prince of Wales, acknowledged as such, and consequently as heir apparent to the crown, by the supreme pontiff himself. Who without delay had the birth announced to all the people by means of a salute from the canon of the castle. And here it is allowable to reflect that even had King James III been in peaceful possession of his throne the aforesaid newly born prince could not have received greater honors, nor could his right to succeed to the crown have been proclaimed more unquestionably. The only formality which could have put a finishing touch to the rest was the traditional delivery of the swaddling clothes, which it was the custom to send only to the heirs of crowned heads, and then only to those reigning by succession. Not by election but, as Clement XI. Of pious memory died before this matter was concluded, it fell to his successor, Innocent XIII, to complete it, which he did with all possible solemnity, sending an ambassador, with all the formality and ceremonies observed with other courts. From all this, it cannot be denied that the obligations under which the royal house of Stuart lay to Clement XI of blessed memory are very plainly shown, but it is also shown just as plainly how much His Holiness had at heart the dignity of the Holy See and how well he realized the absolute necessity by which he was bound to sustain the rights of the aforesaid royal house inviolable. The Holy Father saw plainly that all these repeated acts of recognition must necessarily greatly embitter the English government against the Catholics, and, in consequence, must, in a manner, be an obstacle to the success of the missions. He also understood that he alone was the one Catholic prince who had made this act of recognition. With all this, keeping before his eyes the justice of the cause, which was quite apart from the question of religion, the abhorrence that the Holy See could never sufficiently show to the aforementioned decree, and, finally, the strict obligation of his successors never to depart from the line he had taken towards a family which deserved so much from the Holy See, he did not hesitate for a moment to pursue this course with great solemnity, thereby robbing his successors of any reason of doubt concerning the treatment owed to the Prince of Wales on the death of his father. Since His Holiness knew well, that once a son was recognized as heir apparent by the Holy See, no doubt could be raised that at the death of his father he should succeed to everything, and therefore to his dignity and honors, in the same way that in the empire, notwithstanding its being an elective state, once the Holy See recognized anyone as king of the Romans, she could not afterwards, on the death of the emperor, free herself from recognizing his successor. The mind of the glorious Clement XI was so full of these just sentiments at the moment of his death, that he wished to show plainly to all the sacred college how great was his anxiety that what he had done towards the royal house should be permanently maintained. Laying on them a special charge to that effect. All the succeeding popes, beginning with Innocent XIII, down to Clement XIII, now by the grace of God reigning, have been most faithful and zealous executors of this trust, and all have treated and regarded the firstborn son of James III. As Prince of Wales, therefore as successor to the King of England. Hence, ever since the Prince has been admitted to audiences with His Supreme Holiness, there has never been the slightest difficulty as to his treatment, or rather, there has been no doubt, that among other fitting distinctions, he should have. As did the King, his father, an armchair, which it is customary for the Holy See to offer to the heirs apparent to a throne. But, in this one particular, His Majesty asked that a slight modification might be made in his presence, for the one and only reason of maintaining the custom of the Kingdom of England. Where even the eldest son in the presence of his father is not allowed to sit in a seat equal to his, and to comply with His Majesty's wish, the Prince has always been given an easy chair, but without arms. There now remains to examine the contradictions and inconsistencies which would arise each time that the Holy See refused to recognize the Prince of Wales as legitimate successor to the king, his father, at the death of the latter. These would be without doubt innumerable, it would not be easy to foresee them all, nevertheless we can mention some. Firstly, that as the Prince of Wales has for the space of forty-five years been in possession of the title and prerogatives of Prince of Wales, they cannot now be denied him, whether present or absent. 
without derogating and expressly contradicting the solemn line of action followed by six successive popes. In the second place, it must follow that if the Holy See today treats and looks on this same person as Prince of Wales, that is to say, as natural successor to the throne of England, as is the Dauphin to that of France, and the Prince of the Asturias to that of Spain, and tomorrow hearing of the death of his father draw back from recognizing him as succeeding to that father in dignity and honors, she thus denies that he ever was Prince of Wales. In the third place, how could she then recognize the aforesaid prince after his father's death? Perhaps still as Prince of Wales? But it is averred that he is that no longer. Plainly then, either he is entitled to the same treatment as that given to his father, whom he has succeeded, or, it is only right to say that he has not been entitled all these years to the prerogatives and rights of heir. Fourthly, before the Pope could make an innovation of this nature, so entirely at variance with the course adopted by his predecessors, it would be necessary to have some very strong reason, which neither exists now, nor ever can exist. For, if any of the Catholic princes have been constrained to draw back from the recognition of the royal house of Stuart, as legitimate successors and heirs to the throne of England, it has only been in consequence of their entering on different treaties of peace with the present government of England, which has put them under the necessity of recognizing the heretical succession, as established by the famous Act of Parliament. But no such cause can possibly affect the Holy Father in any way. He has never made nor can he make treaties of any sort with heretical princes, neither has he ever taken part in the aforesaid treaties of peace of other princes. Above all, he never has recognized, nor can he ever recognize, as valid or real, this same famous decree, against which, as has been shown above, the continued recognition of the royal house of Stuart serves as an indisputable protest. And from this we come to the fifth serious inconsistency, which might be most prejudicial to the Holy See. For if the Pope should cease to recognize the Prince of Wales as successor to the King, his father, it is evident, even to his most humble admirers, that he would be, in a way, revoking all the protests made by his predecessors. And a very dangerous consequence might ensue, namely, that should the prince of any heretical state become a Catholic, it would be within the power of his subjects, for this one reason only, to deprive him of his rights and inheritances. Sixthly, is it not easy to see the serious inconsistency that would arise in the public records, which, up till now, have, with the authority of the Holy See, been printed for so many years in the same manner? Under the heading of England should there then be inscribed the name of George III? But this is not possible, since he has never been, nor can be recognized by the Pope as king. Should there not rather be entered under the above heading, Charles Edward, Prince of Wales, Henry Benedict, Duke of York? But where is the father? If he is dead there is no longer a Prince of Wales, then this title does not belong to him. Either the title should be that of king, or it should be abolished, with that of England, as if it no longer existed. It only remains then to examine whether in the circumstances in which the Holy See is now placed, the papal recognition, as in the occasion of the death of King James III, of the son who has been for so many years in possession of the titles and prerogatives of the Prince of Wales, as successor in dignity and honors, can, in any justice be called an innovation. He who writes appeals to the whole world, even to the enemies of the royal house, though even these he can hear declaring as with one voice that the innovation would rather be, that the Holy See should act to the contrary. It would be a self-contradiction, in that it would be showing approbation of that of which she does not approve, and further. It would be showing great hostility to the royal house in return for its having sacrificed three kingdoms for the holy faith, in depriving it of the only refuge to which it can rightly turn, and in which it has trusted for so many years. And there is no Catholic prince who does not well understand how impossible it would be for the Pope to follow such a course. They know well that no prince is called upon to account for his doings to anyone else, more particularly when they concern matters or principles relating to his own state. And indeed, notwithstanding that all the Catholic princes in a body have lately refused to recognize the King of Poland, and only the Pope, with two heretical princes have done so, the Catholic princes, have. In this action of the Holy Father found no cause of quarrel, or, if they have found any, they have been satisfied with the just remark, that the Pope is not obliged to give any reasons for his actions under any circumstances, and that, in this case, he has only followed the rules and principles of the Holy See, 
and lastly that it is sufficient for him that he is satisfied with the validity of the election, and of the treatment accorded to his ambassador, as representing his own person. But in our case, this only strengthens the argument, in that the recognition of the King of Poland admitted of some inquiries and discussion. But what discussion or inquiry can be necessary in recognizing the legitimate succession of a son to a father, after the death of the latter? In reality there is no comparison between the two cases, this last recognition being nothing new, but rather the necessary consequence of the understanding that was established years ago by the Supreme Pontiffs. That they should recognize the son of James III. And all the arguments that could be cited, in order that the Holy See should give herself a dispensation from now recognizing the Prince of Wales as legitimate successor on the death of his father. Might have been brought forward just as reasonably, and with greater force, to hinder Clement XI. Of pious memory from recognizing him as Prince of Wales, as he did with all ceremony, as has already been stated, being at that time the only Catholic prince who did so recognize him. And although the House of Hanover saw that this act constituted a promise from the Holy See, which it certainly did, to recognize the prince as legitimate successor of his father, after the death of the latter, this, notwithstanding, brought none of those evil effects, perhaps chimerical, which were feared by some people who were but ill-informed or little conversant with the state of affairs in the kingdom. He who has written this memorial would have it understood in conclusion, that he has no other aim in view than to remove scruples felt by some who know little of the affairs of the world. And to combat the difficulties that perhaps might be raised by enemies, not only of the royal house, but of the holy see. For the rest, there has ever been such continual clemency and fatherly love shown by His Holiness, now by the grace of God reigning, towards the whole of the aforesaid royal house that it is impossible to believe, on the death of King James III. That His Holiness will in any way depart from the most wise example set by his predecessors of glorious memory. Note, as, after the completion of this memorial there were not lacking those who cast doubts on the sentiments of His Holiness, now by the grace of God reigning towards the royal house, suspecting that they differed from those of his predecessors. And who, therefore, might consider the lively confidence evinced by the writer in the latter part of this memorial simply as an empty compliment towards his holiness, this same writer has therefore considered it a strict act of justice. As well as a tribute of gratitude and respect, towards the Holy Father, to insert at the end of this memorial any letters that bear upon the present resolution of the royal Prince of Wales to return to this capital. And as the exact sentiments of the Holy Father towards the royal house and the person of the said Prince of Wales have been shown more unquestionably clearly than the light of the sun. So the writer considers any further comments and explanations unnecessary, to show how unfounded and false these suspicions are, and with how much reason and foundation the writer has relied so surely on the sentiments of the Holy Father. And how well the royal Prince of Wales has understood them, in that it is solely on the strength of the same that he continues in his resolve to return to Rome. Appendix 6. The Macdonalds. John, Lord of the Isles, died 1387, fourth in succession from Donald Progenitor of the clan, had two wives, one, Amy Macruary, two, the Princess Margaret, daughter of Robert II. To marry whom he repudiated or divorced Amy. The lordship of the Isles went to the descendants of the princess. The hereditary clan chiefship, which ordinarily descends to the senior heir male, did not necessarily follow the title. The lordship of the Isles was taken from the Macdonalds and annexed to the crown in 1494, and the question who is supreme hereditary chief of clan Donald has ever since been a matter of strife. Glengarry and Clanrenald descend from Amy Macruari, the first wife, and are therefore senior in blood, but it is doubtful which of these two families is the elder. Last century the general preference was for Glengarry, but the new Scots peerage and the clan Donald historian favor clan Renald. Sleet and Keppoch descend from the Princess Margaret, Sleet coming from Hugh, third son of Alexander, Lord of the Isles, died 1449, grandson of John, and son of Donald of Harlaw. While Keppoch comes from the fourth son of John and Princess Margaret, and could only have a claim if there were a flaw in the pedigree of Sleet. Doubts have been expressed of the legitimacy of Hugh of Sleet but these have been set aside. Glencoe's progenitor was Ian, son of Angus O.G., died 1330, Bruce's friend who fought at Bannockburn, the father of John, Lord of the Isles, mentioned above, but the Sianakis have pronounced him illegitimate. 
From this Ian the Glencoe clan has been known as Mackian for centuries. It is interesting to know that in the summer of 1911, the three hereditary heads of the families having serious claims on the supreme chiefship of the clan, Glengarry, Clanrenald, and Sleet, Sir Alexander of the Isles, signed an indenture mutually agreeing to cease from active assertion of their claims, and that in the event of more than one of them being present with the clan, precedence for the occasion would be decided by lot. Appendix 7. Genealogical tables showing the kinship of certain Highland chiefs and leaders in 1745. Note. These tables have been compiled chiefly from the genealogical information given in the third volume of the History of Clan Donald. Click for a full-size version. Appendix 8. Lists of certain Highland gentlemen who took part in the 45. Macdonalds. Clan Ranald Branch. Ranald of Clan Ranald, Chief. Ranald, Young Clan Ranald. Ineas, B.R. of Kinlochmoidart. Alan of Morar. Alan, Brother of Kinlochmoidart. Alexander of Boysdale, Clan Ranald's brother. Alexander of Glenaladale, Major. Alexander, Brother of Dale Leah. Alexander, His son. Angus of Borodale. Angus of Dale Leah. Angus Masichain, Borodale's son-in-law, S.U.R.G. in Glengarry's regiment. Donald, son of Clan Ranald. Donald of Kinlochmoidart. Hugh, Bishop, B.R. of Morar. John of Goydale, B.R. of Morar. James, uncle of Glenaladale. James, B.R. of Kinlochmoidart. John, son of Morar. John, brother of Glenaladale. John, son of Borodale. Killed at Culloden. John, Bis, son of Borodale, author of Narrative, Lion and Morning, Volume 3. John, Doctor, B.R. of Kinlochmoidart. Neil Masichain. Ranald, son of Borodale. Ranald of Belfinlay. Ranald, brother of Kinlochmoidart. Ranald, son of Morar. Roderick, uncle of Glenaladale. Glengarry Branch. John of Glengarry, Chief. Alistair, Young Glengarry. Alexander of Octra. Angus, Son of Glengarry. Angus, B.R. of Loch Gary. Alan, Brother of Leek. Alan of Cullachy. Archibald, Youngest Barrisdale. Call, Young Barrisdale. Donald of Loch Gary. Donald of Lundy. Donald, his son. Donald, young Scotus. John, his brother. John of Arnabia. John of Leek. Ranald, doctor, uncle of Glengarry. Ranald of Sean. Ranald, brother of Leek. Ronald, Nat. Son of Barrisdale. Ranald, brother of Arnabia. Donald Roy MacDonald, brother of Bailshare of the Sleep Branch. Served in Glengarry's raid. Kepic Branch. Alexander of Kepic, Chief. Alex, of Dalkisney, at Hole Brig. Alan, his son. Angus, natural son of Kepic. Archibald, B.R. Of Kepic, Captain. Archibald of Clionaig. Donald, brother of Kepic, Major. Donald of Turnadrish, Major. Donald Glass, son of Bohunton. John, B.R. of Dalkisney, at Hole Brig. John O.G., son of Bohunton. Ranald of Aberarda. Glencoe Branch. Alexander of Glencoe, Chief. James, his brother, Captain. Donald, his brother. Donald, a Glencoe cadet, poet. Camerons. Donald Cameron of Lochiel, Chief. John, his father, retired chief. Alexander of Dungallon, major. Alexander, his son, standard bearer. Alexander of Druinnesale. Alexander, B.R. of Lochiel, priest. Alexander of Glenavis. Alan of Lundavra, lieutenant. Alan of Collart, lieutenant. Alan, brother of Glenavis. Archibald, doctor, B.R. of Lochiel, A.D. C. To Prince Charles. Donald of Iraq. 
Donald of Glenpean. Duncan, Fortingal, Epis Chaplain. Duncan, Nine Mile Water. Ewan of Inverlochi, Captain. Ewan of Donny, Captain. Ewan, Uncle of Collart. Ewan, Brother of Druimnasale. Hugh of Anak. James, Ensign, KLD at Preston Pans. John, Brother of Collart. Ludovic of Torcastle. Cameron of Iraq, Captain. Of Clunes. Of Kinlahleven. Of Strone. John, Presbyterian Minister, Fort William. Mackenzie's. Lord Cromarty's Regiment. The Earl of Cromarty. Lord MacLeod, his son. Colin Mackenzie, B.R. of Balwan, Captain. John of Ardlock, Captain. William, brother of Kilcoy, Captain. William, B.R. of Allen Grange, Captain. Donald, Ernhavani, Captain. Colin, Kalakudin, Captain. Donald, Fetterboy, Captain. John, Elgin, Surgeon. Alexander, B.R. of Dundonald, Lieutenant. Roderick, B.R. of Kepak, Lieutenant. Alexander of Cory, Lieutenant. Hector Mackenzie, Lieutenant. Alexander, Milltown of Ward, Lieutenant. Alexander, Una Ross, Lieutenant. Alexander, Kill End, Officer. Colin of Badlulkrak, Officer. Barrisdale's Regiment. Alex. Mackenzie of Lentron, Major. Kenneth and Colin, his brothers. Kenneth, brother of Fairburn, a schoolboy, Captain. John Mackenzie of Torden was a nephew of Macdonnell of Kepic, and attached himself and his following to his uncle's regiment. MacLeods. Alexander, son of Miravonside, A.D.C. To Prince Charles. Donald of Bernera. Donald of Gualtergil, Sky. Malcolm of Rasa. Malcolm, cousin of Rasa. Murdoch, son of Rasa, S.U.R.G. John of Glendale. Roderick, his brother. Roderick of Cadbull. McKinnon's. John of McKinnon, Sky, Chief. John, his nephew, Elgal, Sky. John of Coria Chatton. McLean's. Sir Hector of Duart, Chief, Major in Lord John Drummond's French Regiment. Made prisoner in Edinburgh, June 9, 45, and retained in custody throughout the campaign. Allen, Son of Calgary, Mull, Lieutenant. Allen, son of Drimnan, Morvern. Charles of Drimnan, Major. Hugh, son of Kilmory, Mull, Captain. John, Ryder, Inverness. John, brother of Kingerlock, Captain. Another brother of Kingerlock. Lachlan, Nat. Son of Drimnan. McLaughlin's. Lachlan of McLaughlin, Chief. Alexander, son of Cory, Captain. Alex. Tidewaiter, Fort William, Major. Archibald, Maryburg, Ensign. Dugald, Inversanda, Captain. James, Morvern, Lieutenant. Kenneth of Killinacanic, ADJ. Lachlan of Inishconal, Captain. John, Rev, Epis Chaplain. Fraser's. Simon, Lord Fraser of Lovat. Simon, Master of Lovat. Alexander of Fairfield, Major. Alexander, Stratherick. Alexander, Son of Relich, Captain. Alexander, Ledchen. Alexander of Balcregan, Captain. Alexander, B.R. of Culdethel, Captain. Donald, Moy, Captain. Charles, Year of Fairfield, ADJ, Gen. Charles, Year of Inveraliki, LT, Call. Hugh, son of Fraserdale, Captain. Hugh of Ledclun. Hugh, Myrton. Hugh, Inverness, ADJ. Hugh, Dorburn, Borlam. Hugh, Little Garth. James of Foyers, LT, Call. John, son of Moidai. John, Year of Bakrabin. John of Bruich. John, Kilmerak, Ensign. John, Byrefield, Captain. 
John, Rossi, Kincardin. Simon, Dalhapel, Captain. Simon of Aknacloich, Captain. Simon of Ochnodonch, Captain. Simon, Vintner, Officer. Thomas of Gorchaleg. William, Year. Of Kulbaki, Captain. William of Culmone, Captain. William, Fort Augustus, Captain. William of Dalarnig. Macpherson's. Ewan of Cluny, Chief. Alexander, King Yusi. Alexander, Blanche Beg. Andrew, son of Benatcher, Captain. Angus, Flichity. Donald of Brekaki, Captain. Donald, Ruthven, Badenoch. Ewan, Lagan of Nud. Ewan, Dalwini, Lieutenant, Call. Hugh, Coraldi. John, Clooney. John, Patakran. John, Garvamore, Captain. John of Strathmishy. Kenneth, Ruthven, Badenoch. Lachlan, Year. Of Strathmishy. Lewis, Delrady, Major. Malcolm, Dow, Balacroan. Malcolm of Foinus, Captain. William, Ruthven. Mackintoshes. Lady Mackintosh of Mackintosh. Alex. McGillivray of Dunmaglas, Lieutenant, Cull. Gillis McBain of Dalmagary, Maj. Alexander Mackintosh, Elrig, Captain. Angus Mackintosh of Far, Captain. Angus of Isaac. Duncan, Drummond. Lachlan, Inverness, Lieutenant, Cull. Simon, Daviot. Farkaharsons. Alex, Lintrathan, Captain, Ogilvies. Charles, Drumnopark, Glenmick, Ensign. Cosmas, Jr., of Tombia. Donald of Ocryacan, Captain. Francis of Minaltry, Colonel. Francis, Bog, Tarland, Ensign. Henry of Whitehouse, Captain. James of Balmoral, Lieutenant, Call. John of Altery, Captain. John, Lintrathan, Lieutenant, Ogilvies. John of Aldlerg. John, Bog, Tarland, Ensign. Robert, Tullock, Glenmick, Enns. Robert, Mill of Ocryacan, Enns. William of Brofderg, Captain, Ogilvies. William, Mill of Ocryacan, Enns. Farkaharsons of Inveri, names not found. For the Stuarts of Appen, see a list of persons concerned in the rebellion, Scott. History Soci, Volume 8. For the grants of Urquhart and Glenmoriston, see Urquhart and Glenmoriston, by William Mackay, Inverness, 1893. For the Gordons, see The House of Gordon, Volume 3, Gordons Under Arms, by J. M. Bullock, New Spalding Club, 1912. For the Athole Regiments, see Volume 3. Of Chronicles of the Athole and Tullibardine Families, by the Duke of Athole, Edinburgh, privately printed, 1896. Footnotes. In this narrative, unless otherwise indicated, events occurring in Great Britain are given in old style dates, those on the continent in new style. Original information on the Scots plot is to be found in the life of Lord Lovat written by himself, London, 1797, a collection of original papers about the Scots plot, London, 1704, original papers, edition by Jazz, Macpherson, London, 1775. Major Fraser's Manuscript, edition by Alex. Ferguson, Edinburgh, 1889, The Lockhart Papers, London, 1817, and an eclectic account in Hilburton's Life of Lovat, London, 1847. Extracts from many of the original authorities on this and subsequent incidents are given usefully and ingeniously in consecutive narrative form by Professor Sanford Terry in the Chevalier de St. George, London, 1901. Original Information, Histoire de Revolutions d'Ecosse et de Lande, The Hague, 1758, of which there is a Dublin reprint of 1761. The Secret History of Colonel Hook's Negotiations in Scotland in 1707, of which there are London, Edinburgh and Dublin editions, all of 1760, it is practically a translation of the Histoire de Revolutions. The Correspondence of Colonel Nathaniel Hook, an exhaustive work edited by Rev. W. D. McRae, 
Roxbury Club, 1870. A not very friendly account of Hook's mission is given in the Lockhart Papers. The military state of Scotland at the time is to be found in an account of the late Scotch invasion as it was opened by my Lord Haversham in the House of Lords, London, 1709. The story of the naval expedition is given in Memoirs du Comte de Forbin, Amsterdam, 1730, of which there is an English translation, the third edition is dated London, 1740. The possibility of treachery was suggested by Hook, and his story is to be found in a Gasque M.S. Hook, who had been bred to the sea, found the steersman going on the wrong course. He was put right, but as soon as Hook's back was turned he went wrong again. See Jacobite Lairds of Gask, London, 1870. Esmond, Book 3. Chapter 1. The authorities on the 15 are to be found noted in most standard histories. This statement bears the authority of a M.S. in the Bibliothèque Nationale, and a casual reference in a letter of Bishop Atterbury's. See Martin Hiley, James Francis Edward, The Old Chevalier, London, 1907. A full account from the original authorities of Clementina's rescue and marriage is to be found in narratives of the detention, liberation, and marriage of Maria Clementina Stewart, edited by J. T. Gilbert, Doctor of Laws, Dublin, 1894. Clementina, by A. E. W. Mason. The best account of this expedition is in Mr. W. K. Dixon's exceedingly clear and exhaustive introduction to the Jacobite attempt, Scottish History Society, Volume 19. Edinburgh, 1895. All the original authorities for this incident and the preceding Swedish plot are indicated in the notes. Original authorities, Life of Christopher Layer, Norwich, 1723, Howell's State Trials, Volume 16. A full account is given by Lord Mahone, History of England, Chapter 12. The dispositions by the court at Rome are to be found in James Francis Edward, M. Hiley, and the King Over the Water, London, 1907, Shield and Andrew Lang. Hahn. Arthur Dillon, second surviving son of Theobald, 7th Viscount Dillon. Born at Roscommon, 1670. His father raised a regiment for James II. At the Revolution, which Arthur accompanied to France, where he became its colonel, 1690. Served in Spain, Germany, and Italy. Lieutenant General under the Duke of Berwick at Barcelona, 1714. Created Viscount, Jacobite, in the Peerage of Ireland, 1717. Created Earl, Jacobite, in the Peerage of Scotland, 1721. Made Knight of the Thistle, 1722. Died at Paris, 1733. Ruvigny, Jacobite Peerage. Shield and Lang, The King Over the Water, pages 360, 363. Mahone, History of England, Chapter 12. Ruvigny, Jacobite Peerage. It is worthy of note that although the New Scots Peerage as a rule chronicles the Jacobite titles conferred on Scottish nobles, there is no mention of this peerage to Sir James Grant in that work, see Scott's Peerage, Volume 7, pages 480-483, nor is it referred to in his biography in the Grant family history, Sir W. Fraser, The Chiefs of Grant, Volume 1, pages 371-392. For the action of the Grants in the 45, see Infra, Eat Seek. The Lockhart Papers are the principal authority for Jacobite history in Scotland from 1702 to 1728. James Urquhart was the only son of Jonathan Urquhart of Cromarty and his wife Lady Jean Graham, daughter of the second Marquis of Montrose. Jonathan was the last of the Urquharts who owned the estate of Cromarty, famous owing to its possession by Sir Thomas Urquhart, the translator of Rabelais. Jonathan's affairs having got into disorder, he sold his ancestral property to George Mackenzie, Viscount Tarbat, who was created Earl of Cromarty in 1703. James Urquhart married Anne Rollo, daughter of Robert Rollo of Powhouse, and had an only child, Grizzle, who died unmarried. Colonel Urquhart was a man of noble spirit, great honor, and integrity. He served in the wars both in Spain and Flanders with great reputation, but left the army, and lived a retired life. In him ended the whole male line of John, only son of the first marriage of John, tutor of Cromarty. 
the representation devolved upon William Urquhart of Meldrum, Douglas, Baronage. Colonel Urquhart was born in 1691 and died on January 3, 1741, family papers. His appointment as Jacobite agent for Scotland is dated May 28, 1736, Ruvigny, Jacobite peerage. Not the famous conqueror of Almanza, who was killed in the War of the Polish Succession when besieging Philipsburg, on June 28, 1734, but his son, known until then as the Duke of Lyria. His commission as colonel is dated October 22, 1715. Ruvigny, Jacobite Peerage. For general information about Gordon of Glenbucket, the reader is referred to Mr. J. M. Bullock's monumental work, The House of Gordon, New Spalding Club, Aberdeen, 1912. For Glenbucket's character and his actions in 1745, see Infra e Seek. It is remarkable how the designation of Glenbucket has adhered to the family for generations, although the land from which it was derived was parted with 179 years ago. Gordon's descendants are still tenants of the farm of St. Bridget's, in Glenlivet, which was old Glenbucket's home in 1745, and are still termed Glenbucket, in the district. For the MacDonald marriages see the genealogies and history of Clan Donald, Volume 3. M. Highly, James Francis Edward. French historians generally blame Fleury for his timidity, and ascribed to him the decline of the splendid French navy, which he allowed to fall into decay for fear of English jealousy. The commission is dated January 28, 1738. See Stuart Papers in Brown's History of the Highlands, Volume 4. See Infra. The terms of this message are given from a state paper in the French archives of which the following is an extract, I Almanda en Angleterre K. Luzil de S.E.S. Sujets Acasis Etate S.I.V.I.F. Chou I L Louis semble cool on parade opposer les Montagnards de C.E. pays à la plupart de troupes que le gouvernement avait alors sur pied, e chou I L Y orate lu de tout esper meme sans secour à tranger. Pour vous que les Anglais fides prisent de leur côté de justes measures. C. Colin, Louis XV. E. Les Jacobites. For Semple's descent and claim to the title, see Appendix. C. Infra. C. Infra. A. G. M. McGregor, History of the Clan Gregor, Volume 2. Of the associators only three were out in the 45, the Duke of Perth, Lovat, and Lochiel. Lord John Drummond, who was brother-in-law of Traquair, remained inactive. Prince Charles spent the night of February 2, 1746, at his house, Fairnton, now Frontower, near Creef. Lord Traquair remained in England. He was arrested at Great Stoughton in Huntingdonshire, on July 29, 1746, and committed to the Tower. But was released without trial before August 1748. Traquair's brother, John Stuart, married in 1740 and retired from the concert then. Sir James Campbell was too old for action. MacGregor of Balhaldies was in Paris during the campaign. The name MacGregor was then proscribed and all members of the clan had to adopt another name, that adopted by Balhaldi's branch was, Drummond. Balhaldi's father, Alexander, was a man of some consequence. He had been a trader about Stirling, and made some money, and he married a daughter of Sir Ewan Cameron of Lochiel, his son Balhaldi being thus a first cousin of Lochiel of the Forty-Five. In 1714 the clan Gregor being chiefless, certain of its leading members elected Alexander to be hereditary chief. A. G. M. McGregor, History of Clan Gregor, Volume 2. He was created a Scots baronet by the Chevalier in 1740, and he died at Balhaldy House, Dunblane, in 1749. His son, William, was born in 1698. Though never in Scotland after 1743 he was attainted in 1746, and specially exempted from the Act of Indemnity of 1747. He married Janet, daughter of Lawrence Oliphant of Gask, at Paris in January 1758. He died near Paris in 1765. The designation Balhaldi is spelled variously in contemporary documents, Boholdi, Bacaldi, Bahadi, etc. C.F.R.L. Stevenson's Catriona, Last Chapter War was declared with Spain, October 19, 1739. Abridged from a state paper in the French archives, 
of which portions are printed in Capitaine J. Collins Louis XV. E. Les Jacobites, Paris, 1901. The Emperor Charles VI. Died on October 20, 1740, and France interfered in the War of the Austrian Succession the following August. Cullen. A. G. M. McGregor, History of Clan Gregor, Volume 2. Cullen. Lord Marischal wrote to the Chevalier in June 1740, telling him that the King of Spain had refused an audience to the Duke of Ormond on this account. Mahone, History of England, 3rd edition, Volume 3. App, page 4. Say Infra, pp. 12, 22. Le Roy Trace Crétine, Touche du Zile de Ecossais, Etait Port à leur accorder les secours dont ils avaient besoin, chou en consequence. Sa Majeste Valette bien fair transporter Don C. E. Royaume touts les troupes irlandaises que attendent à son service, avec les armes et munitions et les 20. 000 livres sterling coup on demand et pour aider les montagnards à se mettre en campagne, Colin. This document is printed by the special permission of the French government. The original signed and sealed with seven seals is preserved in the National Archives in Paris. It was very disappointing to find that no trace of this list of Highland chiefs referred to could be discovered. Balhaldi's Memorial, History of Clan Gregor, Volume 2. See Appendix. He died on January 29, 18th OS. That Fleury had proposed something is most probable. He had for some time been complaining of the insults, what today we call pinpricks, with which the British government had been annoying France in a time of peace. These pinpricks culminated in June 1742 when a British army under Lord Stair landed in the Netherlands, with the intention of thwarting the French in their campaign against Austria. Infra, N. I L N Y a pas grand inconvenient que le minister voit que le rempart de la mer en met pas entièrement el Angleterre a couvert de enterprises de la France. Colin. Infra, pages 41, 42. Memorials, pages 93. 428. The Affairs of Scotland, 1744-46, by Lord Elcho. Edited by Honorable Evan Charteris, Edinburgh, 1907, Lord Elcho gives a list of members of the club who undertook to join the prince in any event. Memorials. Anxious to learn the sources of this information, I wrote to the author of the volume to inquire, and received a courteous letter informing me that these statements were made on the authority of the Stuart Papers. Memorials. Infra. Trial of Lord Lovat. Memorials. Life of the Duke of Cumberland, London, 1766. Lord MacLeod wrote a narrative of the campaign, including the march to Thurso. It is printed in Sir W. M. Fraser's Earls of Cromarty, Volume 2. Pages 379 each seek. Chiefs of Grant, Volume 2. Family Information. See the Earl of Aberdeen, by the Honorable A. Gordon, London, 1893. Cuman of Kinnamont, Gordon of Coberti, and Erskine of Pitadry. See Blackwood's Magazine for May 1829. Scottish Historical Review, Volume 5. Chiefs of Grant, Volume 2. Spalding Club Miscellaneous, Volume 1. Ibid. Compare. M.S. Order Book in Editor's Possession. The story is told with considerable fullness in Henderson's Life of Cumberland, p. 239, where the schoolmaster's name is given as Mackety, and where the blame of the sentence is ascribed to Holly. The punishment was 500 lashes at each of the cantonments. In a biographical appendix to his Life of Colonel Gardiner who was killed at Prestonpans. London, 1747. Original correspondence on the relations between the Prince and Lord George Murray, together with references to contemporary authorities on the Battle of Culloden, will be found in the itinerary of Prince Charles Edward, Scott. History Soci, Vol. 23, 1897. Scottish History Society, Vol. 23. For Flora MacDonald's Relationships, see Genealogical Table. See Lion in Mourning, Vol. 1. Ibid, Volume 2. C.F. Infra, N. 2. 
Ruvigny, Jacobite Peerage. This letter, dated Kinlochiel, August 22, arrived after Sir James Grant went to London and was forwarded to him. He sent it unopened to Lord Tweedale, Secretary for Scotland. The letter is preserved in the Tweedale archives. Urquhart and Glenmoriston, Inverness, 1893. pp. 275 to 276. pp. 292 to 294. pp. 307 to 309. Chiefs of Grant, Volume 2. High Court Index Book No. 1. Scots Magazine, Volume 9. Pages 246, 247. The name in the original documents is spelt sometimes with one S and sometimes with one T, sometimes with one or both these letters doubled, occasionally he is called Grossert. In modern times the name is spelt Grosset by Miss Collins, a descendant of Walter. In the New Scots Peerage it is spelt Grosset, Volume 1. Newcastle Papers, British Museum, Ad. MS 32710, F. 491. Record Office, State Papers Dom, George II. Bundle 98. Newcastle Papers, previously quoted. Family Papers. See pages 336 and 402. Grosset's statement, corroborated by Falconer and Sharp, is elaborated in the Newcastle Papers quoted above. He performed his duties at great hazard to his life. The rebels robbed and plundered his house at Alo and his house in the country, Logie, to such a degree that they did not leave his infant children even a shirt to shift them, and pursued his wife and daughter to an uncle's house. To whose estate they knew Mr. Grosset was to succeed, plundered that house, Bredisholm, near Coatbridge, stripped his wife and daughter of the very clothes they had upon their backs and used them otherwise in a most cruel and barbarous manner. Scott's Magazine, Volume 7 Record Office, State Papers Dom, George II, Bundle 91. This is one of the very rarest of Jacobite pamphlets. There is a long account of the harsh proceedings of the Edinburgh magistrates towards Robert Drummond, the Jacobite printer who published the poem, in Hugo Arnott's History of Edinburgh, 1778, Book 3. Chapter 4. See also Book of the Old Edinburgh Club, Volume 8, in which the poem is reprinted for the first time. Mr. J. R. N. MacPhail, K.C., has sent me a copy of accusations laid against Grosset in December 1747. These are nine in number, he is accused, one, of keeping an open trade at a low for smugglers, particularly in the tobacco way. Two, of secreting the public revenue for attractive years and of vitiating and forging the accounts. Three, of granting land permits for wine to smugglers all over the kingdom. Four, of arranging false prices with merchants who purchased at rope goods seized from smugglers. 5. Of suborning evidence even to perjury in connection with the sale of goods taken from the rebels. 6. Of being an accomplice of smugglers in trade and profits. 7. Of passing goods after seizure and of accepting a bribe. 8. Of mutilating the books of the public office. 9. Of fraud circumvention and oppression in many different cases. Scott's Peerage, Volume 1. The Jacobite accounts of this incident will be found in Jacobite memoirs. In Maxwell of Kirkconnell's Narrative, and in Sir William Fraser's The Earls of Cromarty, Volume 2. Home, History of the Rebellion, ch. 8. See Appendix, Cardinal York's Memorial. Lion and Mourning, Volume 3. Lent to me by Lumiston's great-grand-niece, Mrs. G. E. Forbes, Edinburgh. The winter of 1741-42. Charles, Stuart, 5th Earl of Traquair, succeeded 1741, died 1764. See Appendix. William McGregor or Drummond of Balhaldy. James Edgar, Secretary to the Chevalier de St. George. A younger son of David Edgar of Keithock, Forfarshire. Entered the Chevalier's service as secretary 1716, and held that office for 47 years. Became secretary of state in October 1763, and died September 24, 1764, predeceasing his master by 15 months. Cardinal André Hercule de Fleury. 
born 1653, became French prime minister in 1726, died in January 1743. Donald Cameron, 19th of Lochiel, the gentle Lochiel, of the 45. He succeeded his grandfather as chief of the Camerons in 1719, his father John, who died 1748, having transferred his rights to his son. Donald Cameron died in France, 1748. Sir James Campbell of Auchenbreck, 5th Baronet, died 1756, father-in-law of Donald Cameron of Lochiel. His wife was Janet, daughter of John MacLeod of MacLeod, and aunt of Norman MacLeod the chief in 1745. Charles, Douglas, 3rd Duke. Born 1698, succeeded 1711, died 1778. William, Douglas, 3rd Earl of March, succeeded his cousin as 4th Duke of Queensbury, died unmarried 1810. The Bold Q of George III, S. Reign. George, Keith, 10th and last Earl Marischal, born 1694. Succeeded 1712. Joined Lord Mar in 1715, and commanded the right wing of the Jacobite army at Sheriff Muir. Forfeited and attained Ted. Participated in the Spanish invasion of 1719. C. Dixon, The Jacobite Attempt of 1719, Scott. History Soci, Volume 19. In 1744 was residing near Boulogne. Took no part in 1745. Entered service of Frederick the Great. Pardoned by George II, 1759, died at Potsdam, unmarried, 1778. James Keith, brother of the 10th Earl Marischal, born 1696. Attained Ted for participation in the 15. Entered the Spanish army, and in 1728 the Russian army with the rank of Major General. Although an attained Ted Jacobite, he visited London in 1740, and was received by George II. As a Russian general, Scots Mag. Volume 2. In 1747 entered service of Frederick the Great as Field Marshal. Killed at the Battle of Hockkirchen 1758. And likewise to settle a correspondence with Scotland the manner in which we had formerly conveyed letters being very precarious and at the same time so much suspected that the government had caused search the ships in which the letters generally came. But by good fortune there happened none to be aboard that time. Ineas MacDonald, a banker in Paris, fourth son of Ranald MacDonald III of Kinlochmoidart. Accompanied Prince Charles to Scotland. Surrendered in 1746. Condemned to death but pardoned on condition of residing out of the United Kingdom. Was killed in France during the Revolution. Aimlot de Chela. French Foreign Minister, 1737-1744. Catherine Darnley, half-sister of the Chevalier daughter of James II, by Catherine Sedley. Born 1682, died 1743. Third wife of John Sheffield, 1st Duke of Buckingham, who died 1721. Colonel William Cecil. Long the Jacobite agent in England. Relationship uncertain. In a memorandum in the French Foreign Office he is called Uncle de Lord Salisbury. Was apprehended in 1744. His deposition, in which he denies all knowledge of a plot, is given in Fitzroy Bell's Murray's Memorials. Secretary of the Duchess of Buckingham. Charles Smith, a merchant or banker in Boulogne. His wife, daughter of Sir Hugh Patterson of Bannockburn, Prince Charles's host when besieging Stirling Castle in January 1746, was aunt to Clementina Walkinshaw. Their son married the heiress of Seton of Touch. The ceremony was performed by Mr. William Harper of Edinburgh at Linlithgow on the day of the Battle of Prestonpans. Charles Smith, who had come to Scotland for the event, posted out from Edinburgh bearing the news of the victory to the Jacobite congregation. Ingram, a Jacobite stronghold of the church. I dare say the cardinal never shed a tear on that account nor indeed allowing his concern to be never so great I think it reasonable to believe so great a minister would act the part of a child. If he had so mean an opinion of these folks and their memorials were so ridiculous as they are represented he must either have been quite dote and consequently not capable to understand anything otherwise it would have been no difficult matter to make him sensible of the absurdity of their proposals. 
Marichal de Mailboy, a great nephew of Colbert, commander in chief in the War of the Austrian Succession. If this was the cause of his death, I must be of the opinion of a great many that he was then become an old woman and incapable of any enterprise that required courage and activity. And indeed, all the world with these two gentlemen themselves owned him to be of a very frightened, timorous disposition. It was at this time Mr. Drummond told me the story of the Swedish troops and the discoveries of it made by the Queen of Spain, which I shall relate at large afterwards. See Post. This thought was the least reason could assign to Mr. I'm a lot for my coming over, as I could not tell him it was owing to a letter we had received from Mr. D. Rummond, which I have repented of since, for I told him if he was instructed by the cardinal, as they said, he certainly would have let me see that these gentlemen had no reason to give such encouragements. Which would have at once shewed them in their true light. This Mr. Drummond and Lord Semple insisted I should say to excite the French to action and I then did not think it any great crime to use them as they had often done us by imposing upon them. I shall leave it to the reader to determine how far this answer of Mr. Aimlot agrees with what Mr. D. Rummond advances in his letter and if it be at all reasonable to imagine that the cardinal had resolved upon an invasion when the person he had employed in this affair had never read the memorial given in concerning it nor even understood the manner in which it was concerted and carried on in Scotland and again whether or not Lord Semple had succeeded as he bragged in preventing much delay by persuading the cardinal to make Mr. Aimlot privy to the whole affair. I mentioned before that the king had ordered a sum not exceeding nine hundred pounds stir yearly to be paid to Sir J. Ames, C. Ampel, provided money could be raised he had hitherto got no more than two hundred pound Lord T. R. A. Q. U. A. I. R. had paid him so I was instructed to know why it was not answered as promised. Which I accordingly did, when Mr. Drummond said he thought it very odd that the people in Scotland could not give him that small pension when Lord T. R. A. Q. U. A. I. R. had offered Lord Semple credit for one thousand pounds the year before when in London. I told him people had little money to spare and that since the gentleman was in a manner starving I would write to the king about it as directed. Upon which he said in a passion I had better not do it for it would hurt them in the king's eyes as it must look bad that people who proffered doing so much could not advance such a trifle. And I remember he said the king would not fail to look upon them as tamperers which I never did mention to them looking upon it as the heat of passion. He then said as he had all along made it his business to advance their interest and honor, he would fall upon a method of raising a sum of money to the value of five or six thousand pounds upon a bond payable at the restoration with six per cent. of interest and that d, uke of, p, earth, l, ord, t, r, a, q, u, a, i, R. L. Oki, L. and I should bind for it, and that he would even endeavor to get an equal sum for D. Yukov, P. Earth, on L. Ord, T. R. A. Q. U. A. I. R.'s particular use upon the same conditions. As I then did not know my man, I went on to what he proposed and did not write to the king about it, neither did I till after I found out the double fetch he had in it. He at this time was applying to have a pension settled upon himself, which my writing in behalf of Sir J. Ames, C. Ampel, would certainly have prevented as the king had ordered him to stay at home in the view of receiving the forementioned sum. Then his proposing to raise this sum for the D. Uke, of P. Earth, S. Use was a means to encourage him to advance him one hundred pounds, which he desired I would tell his grace he would draw upon him at my leaving London, which he accordingly got. During all the time I was at London after my return from Paris I kept it secret from Call Cecil and Mr. Smith that I had ever been there, and gave it out that I had been in Kent making a visit to one Dr. Rutton, an old fellow student at Leiden, so upon the footing of my not knowing anything that was passing I told Call. Cecil in conversation upon my return to Scotland the king's friends would inquire of me if I had not been to wait of him and what news I had got so begged to know what I should say. He told me he at that time could say nothing positively but if the French did not do something soon the affairs of England in particular and Europe in general stood in such a way that in three month time he would order affairs so as to call the king over with his own attendance only this vaunt was so ridiculous that I had great difficulty to keep my countenance and gave me a very low opinion of every other thing he said. One evening after I had waited an hour in L, Ord, T, R, A, Q, U, A, I, R's lodgings at Edinburgh till such time as he should come in to talk with me about his journey to London he told me he understood that I was no friend to Bishop Keith. 
and upon asking what ground he had to think so, he told me that one Mr. Gordon, a Roman Catholic bishop, had informed him of it, it seems Bishop Keith was of his acquaintance had been complaining to him that I had not represented him in a favorable light. By which I conjectured that Keith had been applying that way to be named Bishop of Edinburgh for how should L. Ord, J. Own, Drummond have acquainted Lady Clan Ronald of Mr. Rattree's being named, which was a thing entirely foreign to both him and her if Keith had not been endeavoring to procure that preferment through the interest of the Roman Catholics. And Lord Drummond did write to Lady Clan Ronald that I had procured an order for Bishop Rattree's election is certain. For it was by her means quite well known in Edinburgh before I came back from London and Lord T. R. A. Q. U. A. I. R. assured me from Bishop Gordon that L. Ord, J. Own, had wrote it to Lady Clan Ronald. My Lord T. R. A. Q. U. A. I. R. made all the dispatch possible to settle his affairs at home, being sensible how necessary it was for him to be ATT London and set out from his own house on the 6th of April. For this ecclesiastical episode in Murray's career, see Appendix. Thomas Rattray, D.D., Laird of Craighall Rattray, Perthshire. Born 1684, consecrated bishop at large, 1727, afterwards bishop of Brehan, and subsequently of Dunkel. Primus, 1739, died 1743. See Introduction, page 23. Thomas Cochran, 6th Earl died 1737. Robert Freebairn, consecrated bishop at large, 1722, Primus, 1731, bishop of Edinburgh, 1733, died 1739. Dremelier, a Peebles higher estate adjoining Broughton. The proprietor was then Alexander Hay of Dremelier, and Whittingham, East Lothian, the latter now the property of Right Honorable A. J. Balfour. A grandson of the first Earl of Tweedale, ancestor of the Hayes of Duns, born 1701, died 1789. He and his brother William were both Jacobites. I think there can be little doubt that this is the draft of the lost letter searched for in vain by Mr. Fitzroy Bell at Windsor, Murray's Memorials, N., and referred to by Mr. Lang, History of Scotland, 4. 441. As Traquair left on April 6, C. Ante, and Post, this letter was probably written in that month. Narsum is a cipher name for John Murray. Robert Keith, kinsman and tutor of the 10th Earl Marischal and his brother, born 1681, consecrated bishop at large, 1727, bishop of Orkney, Caithness and the Isles, 1731, superintendent of Fife, 1733. Succeeded Rattray as Primus, 1743, died 1757. Author of A History of Scotland, and of the well-known Catalogue of Scottish Bishops. James, Barry, 4th Earl of Barrymore. Born 1667, died 1747. An ardent Jacobite, who sent his son to join the French army when the invasion of 1744 was expected. French minister in London. It won't be amiss to insert here the story mentioned before about the design of sending over some Swedish troops which my Lord T. R. A. Q. U. A. I. R. mentioned to me on his return from London the last time he went up. Mr. Drummond told me at Paris as an instance of the sincere intention the Cardinal had to serve the King, that he was sensible of the great hatred the English bore to the French and for that reason proposed to the Spanish ambassador at Paris. Campo Florido that provided his master would take ten thousand Swedes into his pay he would endeavor to procure them by the means of some of the chief nobility. The king not being to be trusted on that head as he was looked upon as friends to the family of Hanover and would take care to have them transported. That the Spanish ambassador immediately wrote to his master who sent back an answer willing to pay the troops but upon some condition which I now cannot charge my memory with. This the cardinal took highly amiss and told him that his master was not to bargain with in such cases, upon which the Spanish ambassador immediately dispatched a courier. But before the return of it there was a paragraph in the Amsterdam Gazette telling that the King of Spain and some of his ministers were carrying on a scheme of great consequence but being known by the Queen was prevented. It seems as he said the Queen had been informed of it by some of the ministers and judging that should it be put in execution it would necessarily put an end to war with England that she was very fond of and to put a stop to it she put in that. 
paragraph in the Amsterdam Gazette to the Cardinal which had its object for there was not any more mention made of it. It was no great wonder then I was deceived of his lordship having not the least reason to suspect, and he a little shy cunning fellow on all occasions professing an attachment to nothing but truth and most disinterested loyalty. This must have procked from wrong information for since that time they have made considerable levies and everybody agrees there are not above ten or eleven thousand in the island. I.E. George II. This was in the year 1737. If Gordon of Glenbucket went over to Rome, so far as ever I could learn without having any authority from the gentlemen in the highlands, unless it was from his son-in-law Glengarry and General Gordon. Praying the king to come to Scotland that all were ready to rise in arms. But his majesty was too wise to give in to such a rash and inconsiderate a project and send over Captain Will Hay to have the opinion of his friends by which he might judge how far what Glen Bucket had said was to be credited. Mr. Hay sent for me then in Holland and insisted upon my coming which I did, but I believe found few people of Glen Bucket's opinion save the late Lord Kinmore who I went to the country and brought to tune to see him. But the case was now greatly altered as all the world were becoming sensible of that the interest of Great Britain must ever be sacrificed to that of Hanover as long as this family continued upon the throne. That parliamentary schemes were nothing but chimerical, together with the few troops that were left in the island and the distance they were then from the coast which prevented their coming in time before the country was reduced. As likewise the miserable prospect of the country being ruined by the vast standing army that would necessarily follow upon a peace as the levies during the war would be considerable and no prospect of a reduction after their return but rather a certainty of their being continued. This seeming the fairest opportunity to bring us under a military government. These and many other reasons made L. Oki, L. B. of opinion that now was the time to strike a bold stroke for the king, and by Sir A. Lexander, M. Actinald, S. Letter to the Duke of P. Earth. It would seem these reasons did influence him and were sufficient grounds for the proposal. John, Lindsay, 20th Earl, born 1702. Entered Russian army, was badly wounded at Krotska, 1739, fighting the Turks, and never properly recovered. First Colonel of the 43rd, afterwards 42nd, Highlanders. Brig, Gen, at Fontenoy, Maj, Gen, 1745. Came to Scotland February 1746, and commanded the Hessian troops under the Prince of Hesse in Stirling and Perthshire. Died 1749. Nay Honourable and Stuart, daughter of Alexander, 6th Lord Blantyre. Died March 1743. I.E. John Murray. This is evidently the letter that Murray complains bitterly Traquair showed to Balhaldy, and on his advice destroyed, Murray's memorials, pages 58 to 60. This letter I wrote in the smoothest style possible purposely to show him that the king's friends were so far from having any inclination to dictate to him. That on the contrary they wished by all means to have him heartily to promote the restoration, and shewed the letter to Lord T. R. A. Q. U. A. I. R. N. L. Okiel. L before I gave it his lordship to carry and they both approved of it. I had mentioned in my letter to the king that the ship by which our letters used to come was much suspected and had been searched, so one of my errands was to have a new conveyance settled which was done from London to Paris by Mr. D. Rummond, but could be so easily done from London here. His Grace the Duke of P. Earth, when I had the honor of seeing him at York on my road. Desired I would acquaint His Majesty that he had a scheme for taking Stirling Castle and desired His Majesty would empower him upon the seizing of it to give a commission to whom he should think fit to name as governor for the time it was garrisoned with his men as they would the more willingly obey if the commander was named by him. But told me no particulars of his project neither did he since when I told him what the king had wrote. Mr. Edgar having wrote about it in a former letter occasioned my telling him that it was borrowed by Lord T. R. A. Q. Ware a frequent cipher name for the Chevalier de St. George. Mr. Drummond told when at Paris that the method he had taken with the gentlemen of the Highlands was this. He talked to them of the situation of the country and that a restoration was the only thing would save us, with a great deal more to this purpose. Which brought all those that inclined that way to declare how sensible they were of it and that they were very willing to promote it so soon as an occasion should offer. 
Upon which he told them that it was impossible for the king to undertake any things not knowing who were his friends and that he thought they should take care to acquaint the king of it. Then it was natural for them to say they were contented his majesty was informed it, but did not know of a method how. Upon which he told them that he would not absolutely promise, but would endeavor to fall upon a method to acquaint him. This I took to be a safe way for the person that engaged them and as his majesty was not quite satisfied with it as he said he desired me to write my opinion of it which to the best of my remembrance was in a few words. That I thought no body would be so ridiculous as to inform against themselves by telling they had given a commission to such a person to ye king as it must redound to their own disadvantage for as there was none present when the matter was spoke off to a person that was to deliver it had no more to do but deny it and his not engaging absolutely to make it known was keeping his correspondence a secret. For which reasons I was then of opinion that the same method might be followed in the low country, but upon trial found it almost impossible and dangerous, first because the generality are not so loyally inclined as in the highlands and consequently not so easily brought to speak their mind, and the next place they have no following, they generally tell you. Of what use is the king's knowing that I wish him well, I am only single person, that can be of little service, thirdly the present government has been at pain to persuade people. The king is betrayed and that passes at Rome, but what they are fully informed of which makes people shy and afraid to have any dealings that way as they are near the court of justice and less able to shift for themselves, and fourthly. When a number of those people come to be spoke to they will some of them especially who are not brought all length in confidence impart to the other that such a man talked so and so. Whereby the thing may come to be known and render it dangerous for the persons, all this occurred to me upon serious reflection and found the difficulty of it. Upon talking to some with folks here in that style after my return and succeeded with none but two Mr. N, of D, N and Mr. C, R of C, R, G, T, H, the last of which was drunk and repented next day for which I gave it up. A non-juring minister at Edinburgh, father of Lord S. Grove. Sir Alexander MacDonald of Sleet, Sky, 7th Baronet. His first wife was an Erskine, died 1735. Widow of James, Ogilvy, 4th de jure Earl of Airlie, died 1731. The Earl of Airlie mentioned here was his brother, 5th de jure Earl, died 1761. He remained passive during the 45, but his son Lord Ogilvy raised two battalions for Prince Charles. Henry, Duke of York, afterwards Cardinal. I cannot now recollect from whom I had that information, but it was such that in the time I had reason to credit it. This was owing to Sir A. Lexander, M. Actonald, having promised for a number superior to what Mr. Drummond had marked him down for and at the same time as some folks were laying to his charge we did not believe it was thought fit to say something favorable of him as we had an entire confidence in his honesty. Bishop Rattray died at Edinburgh, May 12, 1743. Battle of Dedingen, fought June 16 Old Style, or 27th New Style, 1743. The Highland Regiment, originally the 43rd and afterwards the 42nd, was raised in the name of John, 20th Earl of Crawford, then lying wounded at Belgrade, in 1739, and first embodied 1740. It was sent to London in 1743, and there its members, who understood on enlistment that their service was for the Highlands only, were persuaded that the government intended to send them to the plantations or to sell them into slavery. When encamped at Highgate more than 200 of them left the camp by night in May 1743 and started to march to Scotland. They were overtaken and surrounded when near Oundle in Northamptonshire. They surrendered and were marched prisoners to the Tower. Three of their leaders were executed, Corporal Samuel and Malcolm Macpherson and Private Farquhar Shaw, all of Clan Chatton. There had been heavy recruiting for the Scots Brigade in the service of the Netherlands. Sir Thomas Gordon of Ulston, third baronet, whose grandfather, killed at Bothwell Bridge, and father were eminent Covenanter leaders. Murray hoped to secure the adherence of the Cameronian Covenanters through Gordon and Dr. Cochran, C., and others. C. F. Murray's Memorials. Sir James Stewart, C. Appendix. David, Weems, Lord Elcho, eldest son of James, fourth Earl of Weems. Joined Prince Charles at Edinburgh and served through the campaign forfeited, and lived in exile until his death in 1787. See his memoir by Hahn. Evan Charteris, 
preface to a short account of the affairs of Scotland, 1744-46. Norman MacLeod of MacLeod, 19th Chief, born 1706, died 1772. He engaged to join Prince Charles although he came alone. But he changed his mind, was the first to communicate the prince's landing to the Lord President, and was the vindictive foe of Prince Charles throughout the whole adventure. This was Alexander, or Alistair, Lord Lovat's second son, by his wife Margaret Grant, sister of Sir James Grant of Grant. Born 1729, died unmarried 1762. The school at Preston Pans was kept by Mr. John Halkett who had been tutor in Lovat's family at Castle Downey. Peggy Vince was a tavern in Preston Pans. Alexander Carlyle gives an account of an extraordinary carouse there in 1741, at which Lovat, Erskine of Grange, Halkett, for Fraser Henchman, young Lovat, Halkett's son, and Carlyle were present. Lovat said grace in French, and he swore more than fifty dragoons at the fish. The claret was excellent and circulated fast. There was a piper at the tavern, and the landlady's daughter Kate was very alluring. Lovat, then seventy-five, and Grange not much younger, warmed with wine, insisted on dancing a reel with Kate Vint, this was a scene not easily forgotten. A banquet at Grange's house of Preston, with a new deluge of excellent claret, finished what Carlyle calls a very memorable day. Carlyle, Autobiography. About this time Sir J. C. A. Empey, L. L. had the misfortune to have his house burnt and lost everything in it even to his body cloaks. The deplorable situation he was in, never having received any of the money promised him save two hundred pound call for immediate assistance, and still the more so, that he had from time to time borrowed money upon his honour to return it in such a time. As he had always reason to expect his pension wowed answer, his failing in which necessarily weakened his interest in the country, for two reasons, first that he had no money to enable him to entertain and visit his neighbours and two ndly so he was not able to keep his word to them from whom he had borrowed it. Both chagrined him and naturally made him the less confided in other matters, for which reasons I wrote presently to my lord T, R A, Q, U A I, R, to write Mr. Drummond then at London, that the money might be got as he then had the bond one mentioned before in his custody, but he still put it off by saying that nothing could be done in it till he went over, as the money was to be got in France which was a most ridiculous reason, for he told me in Paris that it was through Lord Semple he was to find it, which had it been the case there was no occasion for the things being delayed till he went over. As he was to have no influence but ought to have sent it to Lord Semple. However I don't believe it will be found upon inquiring why t, Lord Semple knew anything of the matter for Mr. Drummond would not agree that I should mention the thing to him when at Paris, so that I am fully convinced that it was as I have said before, all a fetch to prevent writing to the king about it, for fear that he should be disappointed of the four. Zero 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 livres a year he has since got settled upon him. Lord Lovat must surely have been deceiving or deceived. It was the proud boast of the Monroes that the clan had remained constant to covenanting principles and to the Protestant succession, being the only Whig clan that never wavered. The Munros were the only Highlanders who joined Cope on his march to Inverness in 1745. John Boyle, 5th Earl, succeeded as 5th Earl of Cork, 1751, a man of letters, friend of Swift, Pope, and Johnson, died 1762. Of Winstay, 3rd Baronet, MP for Denby, an ardent Jacobite, almost openly avowed. February 7, 1744. He is married to a sister of mine, and upon the change of the ministry was made keeper of the signet, through the Marquess of Tweedale's interest in the room of Mr. Macmillan the writer. Thomas Hay of Huntington, East Lothian, Advocate. Keeper of the signet, 1742-46, raised to the bench as Lord Huntington 1754. His brother, John Hay of Resselrig, W.S., succeeded John Murray as secretary to Prince Charles on Murray's falling ill at Inverness in 1746. Robert Dundas of Arniston, 1st President Dundas, born 1685, was Lord Advocate, 1720-25, raised to the bench as Lord Arniston 1737, became Lord President on the death of Duncan Forbes of Culloden 1748, died 1753. He was the father of Henry, 
Dundas, 1st Lord Melville. Sir John Inglis of Craymond, Postmaster General of Scotland. Alexander Arbuthnot of Knox, merchant in Edinburgh, grandson of the 1st Viscount Arbuthnot. Became Commissioner of Customs 1742, died 1769. Andrew Fletcher, Lord Milton, nephew of Andrew Fletcher of Saltoon the great opposer of the Union. Born 1692, elevated to Scottish bench 1724, Lord Justice Clerk 1735-48, died 1766. Joshua Guest, born 1660, Lieutenant General 1745, died 1747. This is the only categorical statement which I am aware of that guest was commander-in-chief in Scotland before the appointment of Sir John Cope, February 18, 1744. C.F. Book of Old Edinburgh Club, 1909. Hunter of Polmood was buried in Dremelier Churchyard on Thursday, February 23, 1744, which dates this incident. His son, Charles Hunter, was married to Murray's sister, Veronica. William Dugall, wine merchant in Edinburgh, a brother-in-law of John Murray's. See Memorials, pages 66, 301, 311. Probably Dr. Cochrane of Rough Foil, a physician in Edinburgh. He may have been a connection of Murray's, whose Aunt Margaret was married to Alex. Cochrane of Barbaclaw. C.F. Memorials, pages 38, 54. John Leod of Miravonside, Stirlingshire, an advocate. His son, Alexander, was ADC to Prince Charles. Hartree, a Peeblesshire estate, in Kilbucho Parish, about seven miles from Broughton. The Laird of Hartree, John Dixon, was married to Murray's Aunt Anne. French Fleet wrecked, February 25 Old Style, March 7 New Style, 1744. On this occasion, as on a subsequent escape from capture, the Duke took refuge in the Invercald country. See Post, p. 271. Charles Stuart, 5th of Ardshiel, a cadet of Appen. He led out the Stuarts of Appen in 1745. Fled to France after Culloden and died 1757. He is the chief for whom Alan Breck collected rents. See Kidnapped, by R. L. Stevenson, Chapter 9. Balhaldi. Probably House of Commons. Balhaldi. Balhaldi. The names in this letter have been deciphered partly by comparison with other ciphers, partly from information given by Murray in his memorials, occasionally by conjecture, in which last case the word probably is prefixed. Semple or Balhaldi. Probably September 21, 1744. Murray wrote two letters to Prince Charles from St. Lys, on September 21, which was a Wednesday. Both are given in Murray's memorials pages 376, 379. Probably Captain Cleffin of Villagas's regiment, the second Scots regiment in the service of the Netherlands. See Murray's memorials, pages 101, etc., for this, and following notes. Prince Charles. Rotterdam. Captain Anderson, also of Villagas's regiment. Officers of his regiment, probably. Colliers, that is the regiment of the Honorable W. P. Collier, son of the 1st Earl of Portmore, Colonel of the 3rd Scots Regiment in the Netherlands. Lord Elcho. Prince Charles. Probably September 30, 1744. Dr. Barry. Probably Adam Cockburn, a hosier in John Stone's Court, Charing Cross. C. Murray's Memorials. Not quite intelligible, something probably omitted but apparently meaning that letters for the prince are to be addressed to the care of Amoris, an occasional pseudonym for Charles Smith of Boulogne. Prince Charles. The King of France. Probably the English. Probably the Scots. A Restoration. Earl of Traquair. Scotland. Scotland. Perhaps Sky, referring to the clan of Sir Alexander MacDonald, who was then in collusion with the Jacobites. Prince Charles. Probably Nisbet of Dalton. C. Murray's Memorials. Probably England. Earl of Traquair. Sir James Stuart. Duke of Perth. Lochiel. Duke of Perth. Earl of Traquair. 
Prince Charles. Probably English and Scots. MacLeod of MacLeod. Sir James Stewart. Probably young Glengarry, whom Mr. Andrew Lang identifies as Pickle the Spy. N.B. I am satisfied the reason for their so doing was that they found themselves blown, and imagined Mr. Burnett would soon drop them, for which they were resolved to prevent him by refusing to act, and thereby give themselves the air of significancy. As for the reason they give, in my opinion it is inexpressibly frivolous and even betraying of their own want of a hearty zeal, for their master's interest. For had I, either from roguery, ignorance, or folly, deceived Mr. Burnett in what I said, it was no reason for their giving up a scheme of such extensive consequence, which plainly shows it's not from principle they act. At the same time I cannot see the least ground to believe they had any scheme going on, as they kept no correspondence with any of the ministers save Mr. Ori, as I was informed whose department did not lead him to treat of such like matters, neither was there then the least thing for an expedition. As to my advice to Mr. Burnett, it is sufficient he knew it to be in every sense absolutely false, but the view they had in so doing is too obvious not to be seen through. They knew Kinney was just going over, and, as he is a man of consequence in the country, could they have influenced him against me they would thereby have broke the force of my representations. Being satisfied I would not fail in my arrival here to make known their shameful procedure to Mr. Edward's friends, and I must observe since at it was a very convenient time as Mr. Burnett seemed resolved to make the money they promised to procure for arms, the touchstone of their veracity, and the French's sincerity, so that their refusing to act at that time prevented the S.D., v. believing them baffled men. Captain John Drummond, a nephew of Balhaldi's. Prince Charles. Prince Charles. King. Rome. The Chevalier de St. George. Duke of Perth. Earl of Traquair. Lochiel. Scotland. James Fia of Clustrain, or Clusterdon, in Stronzi, constituted himself a Jacobite leader in Orkney and attempted to raise men for the prince. In March 1746 when Lord MacLeod took his regiment to Thurso, Mackenzie of Ardlock, invited by Fia, went over to Strumness to raise men and money. None of the islanders were willing to go out, and Ardlock declined to take unwilling recruits although Fia offered to press some men. Ardlock, however, carried off 145 pounds of cess and a quantity of smuggled brandy. For his indiscretion, Fia's house of sound in the island of Shappensee was burnt down in May by the crews of a squadron sent to hunt down Jacobites, while Fia concealed himself in Caithness until the passing of the Act of Indemnity. C. Allen Fia, the real Captain Cleveland, L. in M. 2. 337. A battle fought at Altamarlock three miles west of Wick, in 1680, between George Sinclair of Kice, afterwards 7th Earl of Caithness and Sir John Campbell of Glenarchy, afterwards 1st Earl of Bredalban. Sinclair's kinsman the 6th Earl, falling into debt and having no children, had disponed his titles, property and heritable jurisdictions to Sir John Campbell, the principal creditor, who married the Earl's widow in 1678. Having managed the previous year to secure a patent from Charles II. As Earl of Caithness. Sinclair of Kice resisted his claims by force, and Campbell marched an army of his own men and some royal troops to Caithness. The first advantage was with the Sinclairs, who celebrated the event with drunken revelry aggravated by finding a whiskey laden ship strategically stranded by the Campbells in Wick Harbor. Next day, the Sinclairs were defeated. It was on this occasion that the air, the Campbells are coming, was composed by Finlay MacAvore the celebrated piper of Bredalban. Calder, hissed. Of Caithness, the courts found later that Kice, grandson of the fifth earl, was entitled to the Caithness earldom. Sir John Campbell was compensated by being created Earl of Bredalban in 1681, but with the precedency of the Caithness grant 1677. This Mr. Gilchrist is scathingly treated in The Lion, 3. 36. He went to Edinburgh and thence to London to misrepresent and asperse the bulk of the Caithness gentry as enemies to the present establishment. He is further said to have collected 250 guineas for himself and to have made his friends believe that he could not continue in Caithness for the wicked Jacobites who had threatened to take away his life and destroy his family. The writer, a nonjuring minister, who had been a prisoner in London, 
add sententiously honest wigry that never thinks shame of lying for worldly interest. George Sinclair of Geese, afterwards captured at Dunrobin, was the only Kaith Ness Sinclair of position who joined the Jacobite army. Lord MacLeod marched through Kaith Ness in March 1746, but though the proprietors professed Jacobite sympathies, very few joined his standard. Fraser, the Earls of Cromarty, too. 398. Sir James Stewart of Bury, Orkney, took no active part in the Rising, but he was apprehended on suspicion in May 1746, and taken prisoner to London, where he died of fever in the new jail, Southwark, the following August. George, Mackay, 3rd Lord Ray, born in 1678, S.U.C. His grandfather C., 1680, supported government in 1715, was largely instrumental in establishing the Presbytery of Tongue 1725, d. 1748. William, Gordon Sutherland, 16th Earl, b. 1708, S.U.C. His grandfather 1720, d. 1750. His wife was Lady Elizabeth Weems, and of Lord Elcho of the Forty-Five. His father acted vigorously against the Jacobites in 15 and 19. Ascent in ancient times was the territory of the MacNichols or MacRichels or Nicholsons, but in the time of David II. Torquil MacLeod IV, of Lewis, married the heiress and obtained the lands. The MacNichols emigrated to Skye, where they have been for centuries. MacLeod's second son inherited Ascent, and there were twelve MacLeod lairds. The last of these was Neil MacLeod who was tried in 1666, and again in 1674, for betraying the great Marquis of Montrose and other crimes. He was acquitted, but, probably owing to the expense of the trials, he fell into debt, and was driven from his lands which were acquired by the Mackenzies. C.F. N. 1. C. Post. The writer is wrong here. It was the first Earl's grandfather, Sir Roderick Mackenzie, 1579-1626, the terrible tutor of Kintail who married Margaret heiress of Torquil MacLeod of Lewis and Cogeach. George, Mackenzie, 1st Earl of Cromarty, 1630-1714, was the antiquary. He was an original member of the Royal Society, London, founded 1662. See Post. A battle at Scare na Calic on Lokalsh, between the Straits of Kyleria and Kylochan. According to the Clan Donald historians, the battle was fought in 1603. It was not Glengarry, Donald, 7th of Glengarry, who died in 1645, aged 102, but his eldest son Angus, young Glengarry, who was killed. Now called Glensheel. The church was erected in the hamlet of Muick. It is hardly likely that the Macrays will accept this suggestion of descent without strong corroboration which does not seem to exist. A very different origin is given by the Rev. Roderick Morrison, Minister of Kintail in 1793, it is generally allowed that the Mac Rays emigrated from the Brays of Aird, on the Lovat estate, to this place. Though what induced them to prefer the mountains to the plains is not universally agreed upon, yet certain it is, that long after their residence in Kintail, they maintained a firm alliance with the Frasers of Aird. The tradition which prevails, that an inscription was set up nigh the entrance to Lovat House, bearing, that no Mac Ray must lodge without, when a Fraser resides within, is not wholly without foundation. When the Mac Rays first entered Kintail, there were several clans inhabiting it, particularly the Mac Ollays, of whom no vestige now remains. The Mac Lennons, a small tribe in the parish of Glensheel, were the only people that would not yield. These Mac Lennons, at the Battle of Alden, were entrusted with Seaforth's colors. The novelty of the preferment roused them to action and stubborn resistance, which proved fatal to the clan, for many were slain. And their widows, eighteen in number, were afterwards married to Mac Rays. The boundaries which divide the Mac Rays from the Mac Lennons are marked by a river which runs into Lochduich. But common observation may easily trace a line of distinction from the difference in their language and accent. Mr. Morrison gives the derivation of the name as Mac Rag, the son of good fortune, applied by the founder to his son after some successful exploits. Statistical account of Scotland, 6. 242. The story of the great slaughter of McClellan's at Alden is modified by latest investigators. 
The word rag or wrath may mean either good fortune or grace, and the latest clan historian, Reverend Alex. McRae, is of opinion that the name has an ecclesiastical origin as the son of grace applied to a holy man of old. Relying on tradition, he inclines to believe that the McRae's were from clunes in the Aird and were of common origin with the Mackenzies and Macleans. The Kintail McRae's were not out in 45. There was, however, a certain Captain Macraw in Glengarry's regiment, he attended Prince Charles when in La Haber during his wanderings, also a Lieutenant Alexander Murray from Banff. And one of the French officers taken prisoner at sea on the voyage to Scotland, was Captain James Macrath of Berwick's regiment. Gilchrist McGrath or Mcra entertained the prince in Glen Shiel in his wanderings. Murdoch Mra, nearest relation to the chieftain of that name, was barbarously hanged as a spy at Inverness protesting his innocence. L. in M. I. 205, 342, 3. 378, 2. 205, 299. C. Dixon, The Jacobite Attempt of 1719, Scott. History SOC. Volume 19. The Long Island is the name given to the chain of the Outer Hebrides from the butt of Lewis to Barra Head, comprising Lewis and Harris, North Uist, Benbecula, South Uist, Iriska, Barra and Mingule. The story of the transference of the lands of the ancient and powerful family of MacLeod of Lewis to the Mackenzies is one of the most pitiful in Highland history. Towards the middle of the 16th century, Roderick or Ruari, MacLeod, the last undisputed MacLeod of Lewis, married, as his first wife, a natural daughter of John Mackenzie of Kintail. The wife eloped, the son, named Torquil Conanac, was repudiated. Torquil was brought up at Strathconnan, hence his to name, by the Mackenzies, who embraced his cause. From that moment the family of Lewis was doomed. Partly by purchase, partly by marriage, but largely by intrigue and violence the lands of MacLeod were acquired by the Mackenzies. Lewis was driven to anarchy, feuds of the worst type ensued, father against sons, brothers murdering brothers. Government interfered. Lewis was forfeited and parceled out among lowland colonist adventurers, who were thwarted by the Mackenzies, and at last were glad to go, and in 1610 to dispose of their rights to Mackenzie, who had become Lord Kintail the previous year. Any rights that remained to his cousin Torquil MacLeod were made over to the Mackenzies. Meantime, in 1605, Kintail's brother Roderick had married the daughter and heiress of Torquil, and became possessed of the mainland property of Koyjak. As soon as the Mackenzies obtained the island, they promptly restored order, the remaining members of the old MacLeod family were murdered or driven out under a commission of fire and sword. Kintail's son became an earl in 1623, and took his title from Loch Seaforth in Lewis, while his uncle Roderick, tutor of Kintail, terrible and ruthless, of whom the Gaelic proverb says, there are two things worse than the tutor of Kintail. Frost in spring and mist in the dog days, built a castle in Strathpeffer, which he called Castle Leod and when his grandson obtained the earldom of Cromarty in 1685, the second title then assumed was that of Lord MacLeod. To show that the heritage of the old family of MacLeod of Lewis remained with him. Roderick MacNeil of Barra was from home when Prince Charles landed in the neighboring island of Ariska, July 45. He took no active part in the rising but was arrested on suspicion in July 46, taken to London, released in 47. For the MacDonald divisions and claims, see Appendix. John MacKinnon of MacKinnon was the only one of the three Sky chiefs who went out. He joined with his clan at Edinburgh, and served throughout the campaign, but was absent on duty in Sutherland when Culloden was fought. He was attained Ted. Prince Charles went to him in his wanderings, and the chief conducted him from Skye to the mainland, for which service he was made prisoner, taken to London, but released in July 47. He died in Skye, in 56, aged 75 years. He was a son-in-law of Archbishop Sharp of St. Andrews. This is a reference to the well-known story of the conversion of the islanders. The laird, a man much respected, an elder of the Kirk, reproved by the General Assembly for allowing his people to remain in popery, retrieved his character by driving his tenants from the Catholic chapel to the Protestant church with the vigorous application of a gold-headed cane. Called by the Highlanders a yellow stick, 
from this the Presbyterian religion became known in the islands as Kratom Abadabai, the Creed of the Yellow Stick. C. F. Belisheim's History Cath Church Scott. 4. 188. Called the Parish of the Small Isles. Modernly, Lockhorn equals Hell Lock. Scotus and Barrisdale were brothers, both being uncles of the chief of Glengarry. The elder, Angus MacDonnell of Scotus, was an old man in 45, and died the following year. He remained at home, but his eldest son Donald went out with Glengarry. Donald fell wounded at Culloden, and was supposed to have died on the field. The clan historians, however, state that evidence has been found in the Stuart papers at Windsor that certain marauders landed from a ship at night, carried off a number of wounded, among them Donald of Scotus, who after various adventures was captured by Turkish pirates, and held in bondage ever afterwards. History of Clan Donald, 3. 324, two of Scotus's younger sons John and Alan were captains in Glengarry's regiment. Donald's eldest son Ranald fought on the government side in 45 in Loudoun's regiment. Ranald's grandson succeeded in 1868 as 18th hereditary chief of Glengarry. For Macdonnell of Barrisdale, see post. The Morar family was really not a cadet, but the senior branch of the Clanrenald family, descended from the eldest son of Dougal, 6th Clanrenald, who was deposed by the clan for cruelty and oppression. And his children excluded forever from the chiefship, which was conferred on his uncle. Dougal was assassinated in 1520. His family, on whom the lands of Morar were conferred, were known as the MacDughail Morar. In 1745, the Laird of Morar was Alan, whose mother was a MacDonald of Sleet. He must have been an elderly man, as his wife was an aunt of Lochiel's, the youngest daughter of Sir Ewan Cameron by his third wife, daughter of the Quaker David Barclay of Uri. Morar was one of the first to meet the prince on his reaching Lucknanuak in July 45. He served as lieutenant colonel of the Clan Renald Regiment. Prince Charles and his wanderings came to him for hospitality in July 46, and Morar could only give him a cave to sleep in as his house had been burned down. His reception of the prince, prompted it is said by young Clan Renald, was very cold, and he was the object of fierce invective by the chief of MacKinnon and of sorrowful reproach by Charles himself. L. in M. 3. 187. According to the clan historians, Morar had the reputation of being an unmanly, drunken creature all his life. History C. L. Donald, 3. 256. Mr. Andrew Lang says that Morar was the author of the Journal and Memorial of P. C. Expedition into Scotland, printed in the Lockhart Papers, which is a principal source of knowledge of the early days of the adventure. Mr. Lang did not remember his authority, but was certain of its authenticity. I had been assured in Moidart that the journal was by young Ranald of Kinloch Moidart, but without proof. Alan of Morar died in 1756. His eldest son, John, was out, but in what capacity he served I have failed to trace. Morar's stepbrother, John of Guidale, was a captain in the Clan Renald Regiment. Another stepbrother was Hugh MacDonald. Who had been educated for the church in France. He was reported to Rome as a scion of one of the noblest branches of the MacDonalds. He himself is distinguished even more for his zeal and piety than for his honorable birth, and is also a man of singular prudence and modesty. Belisheim, 4. 386. He was consecrated Bishop of Diana in Partibus in 1731, and appointed Vicar Apostolic of the Highlands. The bishop visited the prince on board ship on his first arrival, and implored him to return. When the standard was raised in Glenfin and it was blessed by Bishop Hugh. What part he took during the campaign I do not know, but after the debacle, he accompanied Lord Lovat in his hiding in Morar. When the fugitives were pounced upon by Ferguson's party, see post, pages 90, 244, Lovat was captured, but the bishop escaped and went to France, in September, along with Prince Charles. He returned to Scotland in 1749, when he had an interview with Bishop Forbes, who veils his identity by calling him Mr. Hugh. L. in M. 3. 50. He was betrayed in July 1755, and arrested, released on bail, and obliged to reside at Duns until the following February, 
when he was sentenced by the High Court to perpetual banishment. Scots. Mag. 17. 358, 18. 100. By connivance of the authorities, the sentence was not enforced, and he remained in Scotland until his death, which occurred in Glengarry in 1773. The Kinlochmoidart family descends from the ninth clan Renald, died in 1593. The laird in 1745 was Donald MacDonald, his mother was Margaret Cameron, the only sister of Lochiel of the 45, his wife was a daughter of Stuart of Appin. Donald, as a boy, had fought at Sheriff Muir. His brother Aeneas, a banker in Paris, came over from France with Prince Charles. On arrival in Scotland Aeneas was sent to summon the laird. Kinlochmoidart, who was given a commission as colonel and made aide de camp to the prince, was at once dispatched to summon his uncle Lochiel and other Jacobite leaders. Prince Charles lived in his house from August 11th to 18th. When a captive the following year, Kinlochmoidart was asked what made him embark in the adventure, Lord, man, he replied, what could I do when the young lad came to my house? Carlisle in 1745, it is interesting from the point of view of Highland hospitality to compare this reply with the advice given to Prince Charles by Clan Renald's brother, Boysdale, who had an interview with the prince at Iriska on his first arrival, but refused to rise. When he found it impossible to dissuade the prince from his enterprise he insisted that he ought to land on the estate of MacDonald of Sleet or in that of MacLeod. For if he trusted himself to them in the beginning they would certainly join him which otherwise they would not do. The prince would not follow this counsel, being influenced by others. Bishop Geddes's M.S. Kinlochmoidart was made prisoner at Lesmahago in Lanarkshire, in November 45, while returning to the army from an unsuccessful mission to Sir Alexander of Sleet and MacLeod. The principal agent in his capture was a divinity student, Thomas Lining, afterwards rewarded with the living of Lesmahago. The chieftain was tried at Carlisle, and there hanged on October 18, 46. His head was fixed on the Scots Gate, where it remained for many years. His house was burned down. Kinlochmoidart's family was deeply implicated in the Rising. Four of his brothers served in Clan Renald's regiment, John, a doctor of medicine, who was one of Ferguson's victims in the furnace, he afterwards returned to Moidart. Ranald, whose chivalrous championship of the prince's cause, gave the first note of enthusiasm to the adventure, home, history Reb, comma, Allen who fled to France and perished in the Revolution, James, who was captured at Culloden, but escaped. He was exempted from the general pardon, and is supposed to have gone to America. A fifth brother, Aeneas the Paris banker, was captured, tried, and sentenced to death. He escaped from Newgate by throwing snuff in the turnkey's eyes, but being shod with loose slippers he tripped when flying along Warwick Lane and was retaken. He received a conditional pardon, returned to France and was killed in the Revolution. The property was acquired in 1726 by Sir David Murray of Stanhope, Peeblesshire, second Bart, the father of John Murray of Broughton. He died in 1729, but the work of developing the lead mines and minerals was carried on by his son, Sir James. In 1745 the proprietor was Sir David Murray, fourth Bart, nephew of Sir James, he was, out, served as aide de camp to the prince, and fought at Falkirk and Culloden. He was captured at Whitby endeavouring to escape, was tried at York. Sentenced to death, conditionally pardoned, and died in exile in 1770. The forfeited estate in Ardnamurhan was sold for £33,700. Of Torcastle, fourth son of Sir Ewan Cameron. He was attained Ted. After Culloden he remained in La Habre, and was agent for distributing money to the Camerons. At the end of 47 he was still free, having evaded all attempts at capture, Albemarle papers, of his subsequent career I have no knowledge. Sir Hector MacLean of Duart, Mull, 5th Bart, who was major of Lord John Drummond's French Regiment of Royal Scots, had been sent from France to Edinburgh in May, and was made prisoner there in June, and removed to London. He was tried for his life, but on proving that he was born in Calais he was treated as a prisoner of war. Charles MacLean of Drimnan, Morvern, joined the prince after the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden, where Drimnan was killed, his MacLeans were formed into a regiment with the MacLachlans, commanded by the chief of MacLachlan. 
Alan MacLean of Brolas, who succeeded Sir Hector in 1750, as sixth Bart, joined the government side. Scots Mag, 8. 141. Lachlan MacLachlan, was commissary general in the Jacobite army, killed at Culloden. For the MacLean and MacLachlan gentlemen, see Appendix. Rev. John MacLachlan of Kilchone, chaplain general of the clans, friend and correspondent of Bishop Forbes. Writing to the bishop in 1748, he says, I live for the most part now like a hermite, because all my late charge almost were killed in battle, scattered abroad or are cowed at home. L. in M. 2. 210. Dougald Stewart, 8th chief of Appen and last of the direct male line. Although a Jacobite and created a peer, as Lord Appen, by James, in 1743, he did not join Prince Charles. His clan, one of the first to rise, was led out by his kinsman Charles Stuart, 5th of Ardshiel. Dougald Stuart sold Appen in 1765, and died 1769. Alexander MacDonald of Glencoe was attained Ted, he surrendered some time after Culloden. He was in prison as late as 1750, date of release or of death not ascertained. Two brothers, James and Donald, went out with him in 45. Lochiel's brother, Alexander Cameron, third son of John of Lochiel, joined the Church of Rome, and became a Jesuit. I have failed to trace what part he took during the campaign. But in July 1746 he was arrested at Morar and put on board the Furnace, the ship of the notorious Captain Ferguson. Father Cameron was carried to the Thames, he suffered great hardships, and died at Gravesend on board ship. Albemarle Papers, L. In M. I. 312. The last clan battle of importance, known as the Battle of Mulroy, fought in Glenroy, August 1688. The Mackintoshes, who had obtained charters of Kepek's country, were ever at feud with Kepek, who legally owned none of the land his clan occupied. It is said that on this occasion MacDonnell of Kepek, Call of the Cows, treated his prisoner Mackintosh so kindly that the latter in gratitude offered him a charter of the lands in dispute. Kepik declined, saying, that he would never consent to hold by sheepskin what he had won by the sword. Historical of Clan Donald, 2. 645. Murray of Broughton, however, states that as the result of this battle Mackintosh granted Kepik an advantageous lease, which was still running in 1745. Memorials. In 1745 the chief of Kepik, Alexander, son of Call, was a Protestant. When his clan joined the prince he refused to allow a favorite priest to accompany it, and in consequence, a number of his people deserted when at Aberchalder. Kepek had been created a Jacobite baronet in 1743. His death at Culloden has been the theme of much romance. For some late light on the subject, see Mr. Andrew Lang's History of Scott, 4. 527. The Grants of Glenmoriston joined the Glengarry Regiment. Not the eldest son, but the third son, Alan Grant of Innerwick. He was taken prisoner by the Jacobites at the Bloodless Battle of Dorna. Lord John Murray's regiment is the Highland Regiment, Black Watch. See Post, E. Seek. Contrary to what I find is a general impression, the religion of Lord Lovat and his family, as well as his clan, was Protestant. It is true that in his days of outlawry and exile in France, about 1703, Lovat feigned conversion to Romanism, yet from his return to Scotland in 15, until his capture in 46, he conformed to the Presbyterian establishment. His bosom friend and crony was the gloomy and dissolute fanatic, James Erskine, Lord Grange. When in hiding after Culloden, along with Bishop Hugh MacDonald, in Loch Morar, C. Ante, Lovat informed the bishop that he had long been a Catholic in his heart, and wished to be received into the church. He was preparing to make his confession, but before the rite could be accomplished, the fugitives were dispersed by a party of Campbells and seamen from Ferguson's ship, and Lord Lovat surrendered a few days later. Though he desired the services of the chaplain of the Sardinian embassy while a prisoner in the tower, where on one occasion he pronounced himself a Jansenist, and although he declared J. E. Murs unfills and dined de à l'église romaine. There is no evidence, which I know of, that he ever formally joined that communion. See Post. Robert Bruce, 
ordained minister at Edinburgh 1587, moderator of the Kirk 1588 and 1592, was the son of Bruce of Erth, Stirlingshire, a rude and powerful baron of a family collateral with the royal Bruces. At first Bruce was in high favor with James VI, who placed him on the Council of Regency when he went to Denmark to be married, 1589, and appointed him to officiate at the coronation of Queen and the following year. Subsequently he thwarted the king in his ecclesiastical policy as well as in refusing to acknowledge the guilt of the Earl of Gowrie, who had been his pupil. James had him deposed from his parish and banished from Edinburgh, 1600. Part of his exile was passed at Inverness, 1605-9, and again 1620-24, where he preached to crowded congregations every Sunday. He died at Kinnaird, 1631. See Post. The Valley of the Findhorn River, Inverness, Nairn, and Moray Shires. See Post, pages 100, 410. See Post, E. Seek. Now called Strathavon. Duncan Forbes of Culloden, B. 1685, M. P. Inverness Shire 1722, Lord Advocate 1725, Lord President of the Court of Session 1737, D. 1747. George, Mackenzie, Third Earl, B. About 1702, known as the Master of MacLeod until his grandfather's death, 1714, as Lord Tarbat until his father's death, 1731, when he succeeded to the earldom. His father, although a friend and cousin of Lord Mar, had not gone out in 1715. The Earl married, 1724, Isabella, daughter of Sir William Gordon of Invergordon, head of a family, noted for their zeal for the Protestant succession. He was captured at Dunrobin 1746, condemned to death by the House of Lords, released with a conditional pardon 1749, d. at London 1766. John, Mackenzie, Lord MacLeod, eldest son of 3rd Earl of Cromarty, b. 1727. Captured along with his father, pled guilty, received a conditional pardon 1748, went abroad 1749, entered the Swedish service when the old Chevalier, at the request of Lord George Murray, sent him the necessary funds for his military outfit. Became Colonel, aide de camp to the King of Sweden and Count Cromarty, returned to England 1777, raised a regiment for King George, first known as MacLeod's Highlanders, the 73rd, subsequently the 71st, and today the Highland Light Infantry, MP. For Rossshire 1780, family estates restored to him 1784, m. 1786, Marjorie, d. of Lord Forbes, d. sp. 1789. There were three MacDonalds all bearing the designation of Barrisdale in the 45, who are often confused, and who for distinction's sake may be termed here, Old Barrisdale, Young Barrisdale, and Youngest Barrisdale. Old Barrisdale was Archibald MacDonald, an uncle of Glengarry and a brother of Scotus. He paid his respects to Prince Charles at Glenfinnan, but took no active part in the rising, probably being too old to go out. In May 1746, however, his house was burned down by Cumberland's order, and he was carried prisoner on board a ship of war, but was soon released. He died in 1752. Young Barrisdale was Archibald's eldest son, Carl MacDonald, who is a prominent figure in the rising. He was born in 1698. A man of commanding talent, he filled the role of Highland Kate Rand to perfection, and raised a following absolutely devoted to him. He became captain of the watch and guardian of the marches for Western Inverness Shire, a vocation, similar to that of his great prototype, Rob Roy, which he exercised with rigor and occasional cruelty. He was able to purchase several wadsets, which gave him territorial importance in the Western Highlands. He further strengthened his influence in Rossshire by his marriages, his first wife being a daughter of George Mackenzie of Balmaki, and his second wife a sister of Alexander Mackenzie, then Laird of Fairburn. He joined Prince Charles at Aberchalder on August 27 at the head of Glengarry's Noidart men, fought at Prestonpans, and when the prince went to England he and Angus MacDonald, Glengarry's second son, were sent back to the Highlands to raise more men. Barrisdale greatly disliked his first cousin Loch Gary, who commanded the Glengarry battalion, so he managed to raise a regiment of his own. Murray's M.E.M., pages 280, 441. He fought at Falkirk, but was not at Culloden, being absent on service in Rossshire.
In June he was captured and taken prisoner along with his son to Fort Augustus, and there he received a ten days protection on condition of giving certain information to government. For this he was seized by the Jacobites, carried prisoner to France, and confined at St. Malo and Saumur for two years and four months, was not attainted in 1746, but was excluded from the Act of Indemnity in 1747. He returned to Scotland in February 1749, but was again arrested by government, taken to Edinburgh Castle, and kept a close prisoner without trial until his death, June 1, 1750. A friendly account of this remarkable man will be found in the history of Clan Donald, 3. 337, and an unfriendly one in Mr. Lang's Companions of Pickle. Youngest Barrisdale was Call's eldest son, Archibald, who was not quite twenty years old at the beginning of the adventure. He acted as major of the Glengarry Regiment. His name was included in the list of attainders in 1746, apparently in mistake for his father. He was made prisoner along with his father in 1746, first by government and afterwards by the Jacobites. He was carried to France, where he was held in durance for a year. He returned to Scotland, and in 1749 was again imprisoned by government along with his father, but was immediately released. Once more he was arrested in 1753, at the time when Dr. Archibald Cameron was taken and executed. Barrisdale was tried and sentenced to death in March 1754, but reprieved. He was kept a prisoner until 1762, when he was finally released. At his own request he at once took the oath of fealty to government, and accepted a commission in the 105th Regiment, the Queen's own Royal Highlanders, which was disbanded the following year. He died at Barrisdale in 1787. Captain in Cromarty's regiment, was captured at Dunrobin, tried at Southwark in 1746, pleaded guilty and was condemned to death, he was not executed, I am ignorant of his subsequent career. Simon Fraser, b. 1726, after Culloden gave himself up to government, attained Ted 1746, pardon 1750, joined the Scottish Bar 1752, acted as advocate depute in the Appen murder trial, an episode immortalized in R. L. Stevenson's Catriona. Raised a Highland regiment for the government 1757, and served with it under Wolfe in Canada, regiment disbanded 1763, MP Inverness 1761, family estates restored to him 1774. Raised a second regiment of two battalions 1775, for the American War, which he did not accompany, regiment disbanded 1783, died a lieutenant, general 1782. Sir Walter Scott calls the master of Lovat the good son of a bad father. A very different account is given by Mrs. Grant of Lagan, he differed from his father only as a chained-up fox does from one at liberty. See Wariston's diary, etc., Scott. History Soci, Volume 26. Charles Fraser the Younger, B. 1725, nephew and heir presumptive of William Fraser of Inverallachy, Aberdeenshire, the senior cadet of Lovat's clan. His father, Charles Fraser of Castle Fraser, younger brother of the Laird of Inverallachy, had inherited the property of Muchall or Castle Fraser, Keme, Aberdeenshire, on the death of his step-grandfather Charles, fourth and last Lord Fraser, who lost his life near Banff by falling over a precipice while in hiding to avoid capture after the fifteen. In 1723 the elder Charles Fraser was created Lord Fraser of Mushall, by the Chevalier in recognition of his services, and particularly those of his father, who died bravely asserting our cause. And in consideration of the earnest desire of the late Lord Fraser, when we were last in Scotland, to resign his titles of honour in favour of the said Charles's father. I am not aware of what these special services were, nor why the elder brother William was passed over both for the Castle Fraser inheritance and the Jacobite peerage. Charles Fraser eventually succeeded to Inverallachie in 1749 on the death of his brother William. He was probably too old to go out in 1745, and his son went out as Lovat's lieutenant. Colonel, in accordance with the ancient Highland practice and the policy of Lord Lovat as being nearest in blood to the chiefship. Young Inverallachie was killed at Culloden and the story of his death is very painful. It is first told in a general way in The Lion, 2. 305, 3. 56, 
and afterwards with more detail by Sir Henry Seton Stewart of Allenton in the Antijacobin Review of 1802, p. 125, as follows. When the celebrated General Wolfe, at this period a lieutenant, colonel in the army, was riding over the field of battle with the D, of CMBLD, they observed a Highlander, who, though severely wounded, was yet able to sit up, and, leaning on his arm, seemed to smile defiance of them. Wolf, said the D, shoot me that Highland scoundrel, who thus dares to look on us with such contempt and insolence. My commission, replied the manly officer, is at your R, L H, S's disposal, but I never can consent to become an executioner. The Highlander, it is probable, was soon knocked on the head by some ruffian less scrupulous than the future conqueror of Quebec. But it was remarked by those who heard the story, that Colonel Wolfe, from that day, visibly declined in the favor and confidence of the commander-in-chief. We believe that some officers are still alive who are not unacquainted with this anecdote. Mr. Beckles Wilson, Wolfe's latest biographer, accepts the story as regards Wolfe but doubts its applicability to Cumberland. Wolfe, it must be remembered, was on Hawley's staff, not Cumberland's. These generals could easily have been mistaken for each other. The action is very like Hawley, who was hated by the soldiers, who nicknamed him the hangman, and who held his military talents in contempt, a feeling shared by Wolfe. Moreover, it was a Jacobite cult to vilify the Duke, and to impute all cruelties to him personally. Seton Stewart was not an entirely unprejudiced writer, he had been brought up in an atmosphere of uncompromising Jacobitism. He was a cousin of Sir James Stuart of Goodtrees and of Provost Stuart of Edinburgh, both of whom suffered, while his wife was granddaughter of Charles Smith of Boulogne, the Jacobite agent frequently mentioned in Murray's papers. See Ante. James Fraser, ninth of Foyers, Loch Ness, descended from the third Lord Lovat, was one of the most ruthless and devoted henchmen of Lovat, who made him Bailey of Stratherick. He received from Prince Charles a special commission, dated September 23, 1745, to seize President Duncan Forbes and carry him prisoner to Edinburgh, an enterprise which failed. His name was excluded from the Act of Indemnity, but he was afterwards pardoned and his estates restored. It was to his house that John Murray of Broughton was carried the day before Culloden. N.B., most of the Chisholms are Papists. This does not quite accord with the clan history. Roderick, the chief of Chisholm, was then forty-eight years old. What part he took in the rising is not on record, but he was specially excluded from the act of indemnity. His eldest son Alexander seems to have stayed at home, his second and third sons were officers in the government army, and fought under Cumberland at Culloden. His fourth son, who was a physician in Inverness, afterwards provost, seems to have taken no part, his youngest son, Roderick O.G., led out the clan. He headed about eighty of the Chisholms at the Battle of Culloden, himself and thirty thereof were killed upon the field. Mackenzie, History of the Chisholms. The laird was then Alexander Mackenzie, sixth of Fairburn. According to the Marquis d'Aguilles, French envoy to Prince Charles, Fairburn's wife was Barbara Gordon, of whom he gives the following account in a dispatch to his government, un Fort Jolie Person, Celsi et Epa Banni Son Marie. Mais Malger Lie, L. Avendu S.E.S. Diamonds E.D.S.A. Vaisel Pour Lever de Homs. L. Ramas Sent Cinquante de Plus Braves du Pius, Chuel a Joint a Su de Melody Seaforth, Su la Conduite de Son Beaufrère. Cotton, un protege de Beauchemont, the brother in law may be Carl MacDonald of Barrisdale, who married her husband's sister, or it may be Kenneth Mackenzie, her husband's brother, who, although only a schoolboy, was a captain in Barrisdale's regiment. Lord Rosebery's list of persons concerned in the rebellion, this lady is not mentioned in the genealogies of Alex. Mackenzie's History of the Mackenzies, which are, however, manifestly incomplete. Alexander McGillivray of Dun Maglas, the lieutenant. Colonel of Lady Mackintosh's regiment, and Gillis McBain, Dalmagary, the major, were both killed at Culloden. N.B., the laird of Mackintosh got a company in the Highland Regiment. He raised a full company and they all deserted except eight or nine. And, daughter of James Farquharson, ninth of Invercald, and Margaret Murray, daughter of Lord James Murray, and uncle of Lord George Murray, b. 1723, d. 1787, m. 
Ineas Macintosh 22nd of Macintosh, who, though a Jacobite peer, refused to join Prince Charles, preferring to serve that monarch who was able to pay him half a guinea the day and half a guinea the morn. Notes to Waverley, ch. 19. The chief raised a company for King George with the result noted above, while his lady raised the clan for Prince Charles. Of this lady we get the following enthusiastic account by the Marquis d'Aguilles. L. Amoit Epperdumont's son Marie Chuel Espera Longtemps de Gagner au Prince. Mais, I and Apris Chu I L Essitoit Enfin Engage, avec le President, a server la Maison de Hanovre, L. Enivalut plus Lavoir. L. N. E. Sen Tint Paula, L. Soliva un Parti de S.E.S. Vassos, a la Test Desquels L. M. I. T. Un Trace Beau Cousinca, Jusxla, L. Avoit Amy in Utilement. Macintosh Fud obliged a quitter son lit, S.A. Maison E.T. S.E.S. Terrace. Lintropied Lady, un pistolet d'une main et de l'argent de l'autre, parcourt le pious, menace, don, promet, et, en moines de quins jours, ramasse 600 homes. L en avoit envoi moiti off a kirk, ka y arriva la veil de la batali. L avoit redenu l'autre moiti pour esi garder de son mari et de laudenca, a inverness, eni toyant chue trois luz de son chateau. Le prince logia chez l, a son passage. L. S. offered a lie avec la grace et la noblesse d'une divinite, car reine ne si beau que cette femme. L. lie presenta tout sa petite armée chou l avoit rassembly, et après avoir parle a ux soldats de ce chou i l s devoyant a la situation, a ux droits et a ux vertus de leur prince. L. jura trace categoriquement de casser la tête au premier que sen tourneroid, après avoir, i s c s u, Brule sa maison et chasse sa famille. Au rest, elle a toujours passé, jusque ici, pour être trace moderi, trace sensi. Say, ici, elle fait de la première education. Son père, pre à la budelie de Preston en 1715, avoit res long temps prisonnier, e couru risque de la vie. Elle n'a pas vingt du ansa elle could découvrir le projet chou avoit fate MacLeod d'un lever le prince, et, en verite, say el solca la fate etuer. Cotton. The last sentence refers to the incident known as the route of Moy, post, when Lady Mackintosh's thoughtful vigilance saved her prince from imminent risk of capture. A month later, March 20, her husband was taken prisoner at Dorna by the Jacobites. Prince Charles sent the chief to his wife at Moy, saying that he could not be in better security or more honorably treated. This may have been the occasion of the story told by Bishop Mackintosh to Chambers, the lady was jocularly known in the army as Colonel N. When her husband was ushered into her presence she greeted him laconically with, Your servant, Captain, to which he replied with equal brevity, Your servant, Colonel. After Culloden Lady Mackintosh was arrested at Moy and taken to Inverness. She was released after six weeks confinement. In spite of her martial reputation and her undaunted resolution, there was nothing masculine about her appearance. She was a slender, rather delicate-looking girl, she took no part in the fighting but remained at home during the campaign. In after years when in London, family tradition says that she became a favorite in certain royal circles, and there on one occasion she met the Duke of Cumberland, and with him she exchanged some piquant raillery, see narratives in A. M. Shaz Mackintosh's and Clan Chatton, Seek. Culcairn, now called King Craig, in Roskeen Parish. George Monroe, born in 1685, brother of Sir Robert Monroe of Foulis, see post. Culcairn was shot in Noydart in August 1746 while wasting the country and carrying off cattle in company with Captain Grant of Nakando, of Loudoun's regiment. It is said he was shot by accident instead of Grant, by the father of one Alexander Cameron, whom Grant had shot a short time previously. L. in M. I. 91, 312. C. F. Ante, N. Kenneth, Mackenzie, eldest son of William, 5th Earl of Seaforth, attainted 1716, d. 1740, but for the attainder he would have been 6th Earl. He was styled Lord Fort Rose, which was the second Jacobite title of his grandfather, created Marquis of Seaforth by James VII. After his abdication, he was born about 1718, 
MP for Inverness 1741-47. And for Rossshire from 1747 until his death, 1761. Lord Fort Rose, who was generally, though not officially, called Seaforth in Scotland, adhered to government in the 45. Though his support was of the paltriest description, his defection gave great pain to Prince Charles. Fort Rose's wife was Lady Mary Stuart, daughter of the 6th Earl of Galloway. This lady raised men for Prince Charles, with the result narrated in these pages. Of her the French envoy informs his government, on a sure que son zeal a gali celui de deux autres, Lady Mackintosh and Mrs. Mackenzie of Fairburn, quoi chuel perwas moines vive et moines courage use. It was their son who raised the 1st Battalion Seaforth Highlanders, 72nd, for which service he was created Earl of Seaforth in the peerage of Ireland. The Rosses of Rossshire are rather mixed up here. At this time there were two distinct races of Ross in the county, which should not be confounded. The Celtic family of Ross, of whom the ancient head was the Earl of Ross, was originally known as the Clan Gilandres, servants of St. Andrew. The earldom passed by marriage of heiresses in the 14th and 15th centuries, first to the Leslies and afterwards to the Macdonalds, lords of the Isles. The chiefship of the clan, however, went to the heir male, Ross of Balnagowan. In the year 1711, David Ross, the last of the Celtic family of Balnagowan, died. The natural heir was Ross of Pitcalmy, his next of kin. Pitcalmy was a Roman Catholic or Episcopalian, anyhow he was not a Presbyterian, and Balnagowan was influenced by his wife, Lady Anne, daughter of the fourth Earl of Moray, a bigoted Presbyterian. To disinherit the natural heir and bequeath the property to General the Han. Charles Ross, a younger son of George, 11th Lord Ross of Hawkhead, in Ayrshire. Fraser Mackintosh, Antique. Notes, the family which thus became Ross of Balnagowan had no connection with the Celtic clan of the same name, but was descended from a Norman family named de Rose. In 1745 Balnagowan with its great territorial influence had come to George, 13th Lord Ross, and the master of Ross his eldest son, afterwards 14th and last Lord Ross, received the command of one of the independent companies raised in 1745. He was garrisoning Inverness Castle, then called Fort George, when it was captured by the Jacobites, February 20, 46, he remained a prisoner on parole until the end of the campaign. He was one of the very few officers who did not break his parole. C.F. Post, pages 207, 364. The Rosses of Inverchasley and Pitt County, who belonged to the ancient Celtic clan Gil Andres, sided with the government, but young Pitt County, Malcolm Ross, who was a grand-nephew of President Duncan Forbes, went over to the Jacobites. He had served as ensign in Loudoun's regiment at Prestonpans, where he was taken prisoner by the Jacobites and released on parole. He seems to have been the only government officer who deserted to the Jacobites. His name was included in the list of attainders. MacLeod of Guineas was representative of the MacLeods of Ascent, C. Ante. John, a brother of Neil MacLeod, tried for the betrayal of Montrose, left Ascent and settled in Easter Ross where his son Donald, an officer in the Scots Brigade in Holland, purchased the estate of Guineas. Donald's son Hugh was laird in 1745. His wife was a niece of President Duncan Forbes of Culloden. See Post, E. Seek. This refers to the fiasco known as the Thar Route of Moy, February 16. 46, when by a stratagem, a blacksmith and a few other retainers of Lady Mackintosh, made Loudon believe that the whole Jacobite army was upon him, he fled back to Inverness, whence he retreated across the Kessock Ferry to Rossshire. The principal, perhaps the only, victim of the expedition, was Donald Ban Macrimmon, MacLeod's famous piper, who was shot by the blacksmith. C.F. Post, for details, see Home, History Reb, C.H. 9, L., in M., 149, etc. George Grant of Culban, brother of Sir James Grant of Grant, major in the Highland Regiment, Black Watch. He surrendered Inverness Castle, then called Fort George, to Prince Charles, February 20, for which he was subsequently tried by court-martial, and dismissed the service. C. Ante. Now called Strathavon, pronounced Strathon, Banffshire. It is generally called Strathdon or Strathdown in documents of this date. 
perhaps from the local pronunciation, plus the archaic D, which occasionally appears in place names, e.g. Strathdurn for the Valley of the Urn or Findhorn. There was an ancient church of Donan in the valley perhaps from the same root. George Forbes of Skeletor, M. Glenbucket's daughter Christiana Gordon. He escaped to France after Culloden, joined Lord Ogilvy Scott's regiment in the French service, he never returned. William, Duff, of Braco and Dipple, b. 1697, d. 1763, M.P. Bantshire 1727-34, created Baron Braco of Kilbride 1735, and in 1759 Viscount Macduff and Earl Fife, all these titles being in the peerage of Ireland, M. 1, Janet, d. of Fourth Earl of Findlater, and 2, Jean, d. of Sir James Grant of Grant. He, his father, and his grandfather made enormous purchases of land in Aberdeen, Banff, and Moray Shires, particularly on the forfeitures after Mars rising in 1715. He joined Cumberland in 1746. Among the Jacobite prisoners who pled guilty is Robert Forbes, printer, son to New. Scott's Mag, 8. At his trial it is stated that he was a farmer. His home was at course in the parish of Cole, Deeside. He was captain in one of Lord Lewis Gordon's battalions, and was one of the officers left at Carlisle and captured there. He was sentenced to death but was not executed, of his subsequent career I have no knowledge. Cope reached Aberdeen September 11, and left it by sea September 15, 1745. John's Haven, a fishing port on the Kincardine coast, about 25 miles south of Aberdeen. Tory and Futhai, Foot D, fishing villages near the mouth of the D, Aberdeen. James Moyer of Stony Wood, an estate on Donside three miles above Aberdeen. He was very active in the Jacobite cause, and while the prince was in England raised a battalion, of which Lord Lewis Gordon was titular colonel. After Culloden he escaped to Sweden, where he resided until 1762, when he was permitted to return to Stonywood. He died in 1782. His correspondence in 1745-46 is printed in the Spalding Club Miscellaneous, Volume 1. York Street Caddis equals messenger porters of a low street in Aberdeen. Francis Farquharson of Minaltry, near Ballader on the D, that a Baron Ban, of the 45, raised a regiment from Deeside and Braemar. He was made prisoner at Culloden, tried at London, and condemned to death, but reprieved. He was kept prisoner in England, latterly with considerable liberty at Berkhampstead, Hearts. He was liberated in 1766, and returned to Minaltry, where he devoted the rest of his life to improving the social and material condition of his country. He introduced into Aberdeenshire improved methods of farming, which he had carefully studied while in exile in England. His name is still cherished in the county as the man who did much to make Aberdeen the great farming county it became. He died in 1791. The Duke of Perth had twice to flee from Drummond Castle, first in March 1744, immediately after the failure of the projected French invasion. A party of 36 dragoons and 150 foot was sent from Stirling under Lt. Col. Whitney, afterwards killed at Falkirk, to surround the castle, but the duke escaped, Cron. Athole and Tullib, too. For 73, the second time was in July 1745, referred to post, n. 2. This occasion was a treacherous attempt of his neighbor, Sir Patrick Murray of Octotire, and Campbell of Inverraw both officers of the Highland Regiment, Black Watch, to capture him while dining at Drummond Castle. The story is detailed in The Lion, I, 290. Now spelt Balmoral, the king's home on Deeside. The laird was badly wounded at Falkirk and took no further part in the campaign. Hamilton's home was Sandstown, now called Huntley Lodge, beside Old Huntley Castle. He was left governor of Carlisle when the Jacobite army left it on their way south, November 21. And on their return in December Hamilton was made governor of the castle, while Townley, an Englishman, was left governor of the town. Carlisle surrendered to Cumberland December 30. Both Townley and Hamilton were hanged on Kennington Common. See also Post. His home was Dunbenon, close to Huntley. The whole, tune, was burnt down in 1746. James Petrie, advocate in Aberdeen, 
joined the local bar 1743, appointed Sheriff Depute May 8, 1744. The last deed ascertained to have been lodged before him is dated September 23, 1745. Petrie went into hiding after the 45. As he was not specially excluded from the Act of Indemnity of 1747, he was able to resume practice at the Aberdeen Bar by taking the Oath of Allegiance, which he did in April 1748. Littlejohn, Rec, Sheriff Court of Aberdeen, 3. 116. Alexander, 4th Lord Forbes of Pitt Sligo, B, 1678, S.U.C. 1691, attained head 1746, hid in his own country of Buchan, and was never captured, D, 1762. Boyne, a district in the north of Banffshire. The Enzi, northwestern Banffshire, with part of Murrayshire between the Spey and the Bucky Burn. William Moyer of Lawnmay, Lady Errol's factor, was Stony Wood's brother. He acted as deputy governor of Aberdeen during the Jacobite occupation. Mary, Hay, Countess of Errol in her own right, the last of the Hayes of Errol. She married Alexander Falconer, but left no issue. On her death in 1758, she was succeeded in the Errol title by James, Boyd, Lord Boyd, son of the Earl of Kilmarnock, executed in 1746, whose mother was the daughter and sole heiress of Lady Errol's sister Margaret. Wife of the attained head Earl of Linlithgow and Callender. He assumed the name of Hay. George, Gordon, 3rd Earl, B, 1722, S.U.C. His father March 30, 1745, D, 1801. His mother was Lady Anna Murray, died in 1725, a sister of Lord George Murray, his stepmother, Lady Anne Gordon, sister of Lord Louis Gordon. The Duchess of Gordon was his sister. James, Ogilvy, 5th Earl, B, 1689, S.U.C. 1730, D, 1764. He had been imprisoned in 1715, on the outbreak of Mars Rising. John, Keith, 3rd Earl, B, 1699, S.U.C. 1718, D, 1772. His wife was A.D. of Erskine of Grange, Lord Mar's brother. His father, 2nd Earl, was out in 15. James, Forbes, 16th Lord, B, 1689, S.U.C. 1734, D, 1761. His first wife was sister of Lord Pitsligo, his second wife, a sister of Sir W. M. Gordon of Park, both ardent Jacobite leaders. Alexander, Fraser, 12th Lord, B. C., 1684, S.U.C. 1715, D., 1748. He was a supporter of the Hanoverian government, but took no active part in public affairs. Scots Peerage, 7. 446. C. Anti, N. 3. Buchan, Northern Aberdeenshire and part of Eastern Banffshire, for Marden, the district south of Buchan, between the sea and the Don. The Laird of Lees was then Sir Alexander Burnett, 4th Bart, D. 1758. Rev. George Law, of Aberdeen, acted as chaplain to Stonywood's regiment, made prisoner at Culloden, tried at Southwark in December, and acquitted. I am not aware of any active part taken by Seton. It is mentioned that the French officers were made burghers of Aberdeen in December, and that Seton received a similar honor, also that in February his lodging was ransacked and, some papers, mystically written for five or six years back, found. Spald. Club. Miscellaneous, I, 360 and 385. Fourth son of Alexander, second Duke of Gordon. B. C. 1724, lieutenant in the navy, but joined Prince Charles, Edinburgh. Was appointed by him Lord Lieutenant, of Banff and Aberdeen Shires. Escaped after Culloden, and died at Montreal, 1754. At Fountainhall, East Lothian, twelve miles from Edinburgh. The Duchess was Henrietta Mordaunt, daughter of the celebrated Earl of Peterborough. On her husband's death in 1728, she brought up her numerous children as Protestants, though her husband's family was hereditarily Catholic. For this she received, in 1735, a pension of £1,000 a year, 
which it is said she forfeited for entertaining Prince Charles to breakfast on the roadside as he passed her gates. Her son, the third duke, took no active part in the 45, but his influence was against his brother and the Jacobites. He seems to have remained in Gordon Castle down to March, but he left it on the 8th, in the most secret manner he could, probably to avoid meeting Prince Charles, who visited the castle a few days later. The Duke then joined Cumberland in Aberdeen. S.M. 8. 138. William Baird, born in 1701, d. 1777, of Ochmedden, in the Aberdeenshire parish of Aberdour, on the borders of Banff, the last of an ancient family, of which the baronet families of New Byth and Sauton are cadets. His wife was a sister of the first Earl Fife, then Lord Braco. He was author of A Genealogical History of the Bairds, reprinted, London, 1870, and another of the Duffs, which was privately printed in 1869. Charles Gordon of Blelock, near Aboyne, Deeside. A district of Aberdeenshire, south of Strathbridge and southwest of Formartin, comprising the valleys of the Uri and the Gady. Lord John Drummond landed a force of about 800 men composed of his own French regiments of Royal Scots and a piquet of fifty men from each of the six Irish regiments in the French service. They landed on November 22 at Montrose, Stonehaven, and Peterhead. Two of Drummond's transports were captured by English men-of-war, among the prisoners so taken was Alexander MacDonnell, young Glengarry, Mr. Lang's Pickle the Spy. These were Lord John Drummond, brother of the titular Duke of Perth, and Lord Louis Drummond. The latter, 1709-92, the lieutenant. Colonel of Lord John Drummond's French Royal Scots, was the second son of John, Drummond, second, but attained Ted, Earl of Melford, whose father had been created Duke of Melford by James VII. While in exile in 1692, and Duke of Melford in the French peerage by Louis XIV. In 1701. Lord Louis lost a leg at Culloden. He died in Paris, 1792. These manifestos are printed post, pages 292, 293. John Halliburton was an officer in the French service, he arrived at Inverness with dispatches two days before the Battle of Culloden. Murray's M.E.M. After Culloden he assisted in the distribution of the money, of which Cluny's treasure was a part, landed by the French ships at Loch Nanuac in May 1746. Albemarle Papers. This Highland dress for lowland men is detailed by Lord Lewis Gordon to Stonywood as plaid, short clothes, hose, and shoes. Spald. Club Miscellaneous, 408. John, Campbell, 4th Earl of Loudoun, B., 1705, S.U.C. 1731, D., 1782. Raised a regiment of Highlanders in 1745, disbanded 1748. Adjutant General to Sir John Cope at Prestonpans, sent to Inverness to command the troops in the North, October 1745, Commander-in-Chief in America 1756, but recalled the same year. General and Colonel 3rd, Scots, Guard 1770. Order of the Right Honorable the Lord Louis Gordon, Lord Lieutenant of the Counties, and Governor of the Towns of Aberdeen and Banff. Whereas I desired and ordered J. Moyer of Stonywood, to intimate to all the gentlemen and their doers, within the said counties of Aberdeen and Banff, to send into the town of Aberdeen, a well-bodied man for each one hundred L. Scots, their valued rent, sufficiently clothed, and in consequence of my order he wrote circular letters to all the herders in the above counties, desiring them to send in a man sufficiently clothed, and k for each one hundred L. Scots of their valued rent which desire they have not complied with, therefore I order and command you, to take a sufficient party of my men, and go to all the lands within the above counties, and require from the herders, factors, or tenants, as you shall think most proper. An able-bodied man for his M, K, J, S service, with sufficient highland clothes, plaid and arms, for each 100 L. Of their valued rent, or the sum of 5 L. Sterl. Money for each of the above men, to be paid to J. M. of Stony Wood, or his order of Aberdeen, and in case of refusal of the men or money, you are forthwith to burn all the houses, corn and planting upon the foresaid estates, 
and to begin with the herder or factor residing on the lands. And not to leave the said lands until the above execution be done, unless they produce Stonywood's lines, shewing they have delivered him the men or the money. Given at Aberdeen this twelfth day of December, 1745. Subscribed Lewis Gordon. C. Ante. Of Monimusk, 2nd Bart, B. 1696, D. 1778, M.P. for Aberdeen. A brother of the Laird of Castlehill, Inverness, in whose house Prince Charles stayed in February 1746. He was a captain in Lord John Drummond's French Regiment of Royal Scots. After Culloden he was treated as a prisoner of war. By 1749 he had become Lieutenant Cull of the Regiment. L. in M. 2. 286. The Laird of Castlehill was Sheriff Depute of Inverness Shire, and was not a Jacobite. Highland Squatters. Humley is the ordinary North Country term for hornless cattle. Robert Jameson in a note to letter XXI. In the fifth edition of Burt's Letters from the North of Scotland, published in 1818, says, In the days of our grandfathers the lower class of Highlanders were, by their lowland neighbors, in the northeast lowlands at least, denominated humblies. From their wearing no covering on their head but their hair, which at a more early period they probably matted and felted. Donald Ban Macrimmon, of the celebrated race of hereditary pipers to the chiefs of MacLeod. This is the only mention I can recall of this pleasant story of his relations with his brother musicians. There is an exceedingly picturesque account, perhaps more picturesque than authentic, of Macrimmon's descent from a musician of Cremona, given in the Celtic Review, 2. 76, 1906. Though Macrimmon escaped death at Inverary, he was killed in the fiasco at Moy on February 16. C. Ante. When leaving Dunvegan for the anti-Jacobite campaign of 45 to 46, he had a presentiment that he would never return, and composed the words and music of a celebrated lament. Which was translated or paraphrased by Sir Walter Scott. Farewell to each cliff on which breakers are foaming. Farewell each dark glen in which red deer are roaming. Farewell, lonely sky, to lake, mountain, and river. MacLeod may return. But Macrimmon shall never. The banshee's wild voice sings the death dirge before me. And the pall of the dead for a mantle hangs o'er me. But my heart shall not fly, and my nerve shall not quiver. Though devoted I go, to return again, never. Sir Alexander Bannerman, 3rd Bart, of Elsick, Kincardenshire, the Merns. His mother was a Macdonald of Sleet. He escaped to France, died in Paris 1747. This seems to be a mistake. Lord Ogilvy's regiment marched to the north through Ogilvy's country from Perth, by Cooper Angus, Cordicky, Clova, Glenmick, Logie Colston, and Tarland, to Keith. Spalding Club Miscellaneous, I, 332. Kelly's probably means John Roy Stewart's regiment, which was originally intended for the Earl of Kelly. Now spelt Clat. Reverend Patrick Reed, Ord. 1723, d. 1759. John Bagot, a Franco Irishman, commanded the Prince's Hussars, raised at Edinburgh, of which John Murray of Broughton was titular colonel. By the French ambassador he is returned after Culloden as, bless us says considerable Montmays sans danger de la vie. Cotton, un protégé de Beauchamont. Reverend William Taylor, Ord. 1737, d. 1797, aged 89. On February 22. Three troops, about 130 men, of Fitzjames's regiment of horse landed at Aberdeen from France but without horses. There was great difficulty in mounting the men. Kilmarnock's horse, sometimes called Strathallans, or the Perthshire squadron, were dismounted and the horses given to the French cavalry, while the men were formed into footguards. By this time, says Maxwell of Kirkconnell, Pitsligo's horse was dwindled away to nothing, and many of its members had joined infantry corps. Two of Fitzjames's transports, the Bourbon and the Cherite, with 359 of all ranks, including the Comte de Fitzjames, were captured by English cruisers. On February 21 a piquet of 42 men of barracks, French, regiment landed at Peterhead. I can trace no record of this landing. 
it may refer to barracks piquets, c, or it may be a mistake. William Henry, Kerr, 1710 to 75, afterwards 4th Marquess of Lothian, Captain First Guards, Grenadiers, 1741. Aide de Ca to Cumberland at Fontenoy, Lieutenant, Colonel in Lord Mark Kerr's Dragoons, 11th Hussars, 1745, commanded the cavalry of the left wing at Culloden. His brother, Lord Robert Kerr, a captain in Beryl's regiment, was killed in the battle. Humphrey Bland, 1686-1763, author of a treatise on discipline. At this time he was a major general and colonel of the Dragoon Regiment now the 3rd Hussars. He was governor of Edinburgh Castle from 1752 till his death. He became commander-in-chief in Scotland in 1753. Probably a mistake for lieutenant. Colonel, the command is too great for a subalterns, and evidently means Robert Rich, 1714-85, son of Field Marshal Sir Robert Rich, whom he succeeded as 5th Bart. In 1768. Rich was at this time lieutenant. Colonel of Beryl's Regiment the 4th, now the K.O. Royal Lancaster Regiment. At Culloden Rich was badly wounded and lost his hand. See post. Probably means light-footed laddies. C.F. Oxford Dictionary, S.V. Ledger. Robert Hunter of Burnside, Manifieth, was captain in the Prince's lifeguards, and was very active throughout the campaign. He escaped to Bergen in Norway after Culloden, and for a time was held prisoner there, but apparently soon released, for in October he is on French King's pension list for 1800 livres as a gentilhomme Macassois arrivé de Puis Pou en France. This took place on March 17. The officer commanding the Jacobite party was Major Nicholas Glasgow, a lieutenant in Dillon's Irish French Regiment. He acted as major and military instructor to the 2nd Battalion of Lord Ogilvy's Regiment. He was made prisoner after Culloden and tried at London in November, but pleading that he was born in France and held a French commission, he was released as a rebel, the irons were knocked off his legs, and he was treated as a prisoner of war. The husbands of these ladies were all in the Jacobite army. Cullen House was the home of Lord Findlater. William Thornton, of Thornville, near Knaresborough, raised and equipped a company, known as the Yorkshire Blues, at his own expense in October 1745. He joined Wade's army at Newcastle, and his company was attached to Pulteney's regiment, 13th, now Prince Albert's own Somersetshire Light Infantry, which was below strength. His henchman and servant was John Metcalf, better known as Blind Jack of Knaresborough, afterwards celebrated as a civil engineer and maker of roads, but at this time a horse coper and itinerant musician. At Falkirk the company served as escort to the artillery which covered itself with disgrace. Blind Jack fought at the battle in which his master and Lieutenant Crofts were taken prisoners. After the battle Blind Jack retreated to Edinburgh along with the remains of the company, now reduced to 48 from an original strength of 64. In a quaint little book, The Life of John Metcalf, 3rd edition, Leeds, 1802, there is a long and graphic account of how this blind man succeeded in rescuing his master. Donning a plaid waistcoat, the Jacobite uniform, he made his way from Edinburgh to the battlefield, where among the marauders hunting for plunder he found the wife of Lord George Murray's cook, who gave him a token for her husband. Giving out that he wished to be employed as a musician to Prince Charles, he made his way to Lord George Murray's quarters at Falkirk, where that general gave him a glass of wine and he had a conversation with several of the Jacobite leaders. Confined on suspicion for some days, he was acquitted by a court-martial. Finding his captain, he had him disguised as a Highlander and managed to escape with him. How Crofts and Simpson escaped I do not know. The Rev. Ensign was Patrick Simpson, minister of Fala, near Dalkeith, born in 1713, Ord. 1743, transferred to Cluny, Dunkel. 1759, d. 1771. How he joined Thornton's Blues, I do not know. One would rather have expected to find him in the Glasgow Regiment, see post. The original ensign of the company had died at Newcastle, and Thornton may have appointed Simpson when in Edinburgh. Simpson had the reputation of being a sportsman, particularly an angler. Scott, Fast Eye. The Dictionary of Nat Biog says that Blind Jack fought at Culloden, 
but it is not so stated in the life quoted above, and if this passage is correct it precludes the possibility. There is no mention in the life of this incident at Elon, nor any account of the company leaving the army. Cumberland left Aberdeen on April 8. Meaning a verminous swarm of redcoats. A very considerable list of houses burnt in Aberdeen and Banff shires is given in the Lion in Morning, too. 334, 335. By the Earl of Ancrum, aide de camp to His Majesty, and commanding the forces on the eastern coast of North Britain. Whereas arms have been found in several houses, contrary to His Royal Highness the Duke's proclamation, this is therefore to give notice, that wherever arms of any kind are found, that the house and all houses belonging to the proprietor or his tenants, shall be immediately burnt to ashes. And that as some arms have been found underground, that if any shall be discovered for the future, the adjacent houses and fields shall be immediately laid waste and destroyed. Lord Loudon's orders, whereas great part of the king's arms belonging to the regiment commanded by the R.T. Han. The Earl of Loudon, were taken away by the rebels in Sutherland, and by them distributed to people of different parts of the country. Who, notwithstanding the many orders published by His Royal Highness the Duke, still detain them in their possession, these are to advertise such as do not deliver them in to the storehouse at Inverness. Or to the commanding officer of any part of His Majesty's forces who happens to be in their neighborhood, by the first day of August, that the possessors wherever they are found, whether civil or military, and of what rank soever, shall be prosecuted with the utmost rigor, as the law in that case directs. This was an incident that occasioned fierce indignation in Aberdeen. August 1 was the date of the accession of the Hanoverian dynasty. Lord Ancram ordered the bells to be rung and the houses to be illuminated. It had not been the custom to illuminate, and the magistrates only ordered the bells to be rung. The soldiers of Fleming's regiment, 36, now the Worcestershire, egged on by their officers, broke the windows, stoned the inhabitants, and did damage to the extent of 130 pounds, a large sum in those days to a town of the size of Aberdeen. In spite of the pretensions of the military authorities, who maintained that they were not liable to the civil government, the magistrates arrested a Captain Morgan and other officers, who were ringleaders in the riot. Morgan had been very active in hunting fugitive Jacobites, and his commanding officer, who calls Aberdeen, this infamous town, attributes his arrest to this cause. Representations were made to the Lord Justice Clerk and to Lord Albemarle, the Commander-in-Chief in Scotland, who both took a serious view of the case. The former writing to the latter that, the officers in the army were trampling on those very laws that they so lately defended at the expense of their blood. Anne Cram was rebuked by Albemarle and removed from Aberdeen, though the trouble still smoldered it was temporarily patched up. Alb Pap, Seek, Scots Mag, 8. 393. Six months later the regiment left Aberdeen, marching out, it is said, to the tune, Will Gang Nay Mare to Yon Tune. C.F. Post. Hugh, Abercrombie Semple, fifth son of Anne, Baroness Semple, and Francis Abercrombie of Fetternier. Succeeded his brother as 11th Lord Semple 1727, served at Malplaquet, 1709, as an ensign succeeded Lord Crawford as Colonel of the Highland Regiment, Black Watch, 1741, Colonel of the 25th, K.O., Scottish Borderers, 1745, Brigadier General 1745. Commanded the left wing at Culloden, superseded Lord Ancram at Aberdeen August 12, 1746, and died there November 25th following. Should be 25th, Sunday 24th was spent at Kendal, and Lancaster was reached the following day. L. in M. 2. 120, 193. I have little doubt that this name is a mistake for Geohagen, an Irishman, captain in Lally's regiment, to whom, Lord Elcho states, the prince gave a commission to raise an English regiment. The officers of the army remonstrated, and the commission was withdrawn. Elcho, Affairs of Scotland, Geohagen was one of the French officers taken prisoner at Carlisle. Not identified. David Morgan was a Welshman from Monmouthshire, a barrister at law. He joined the prince at Preston on November 27, along with William Vaughan and Francis Townley, all being from Wales. When at Derby it was determined to return to Scotland Morgan refused to go, saying, it were better to be hanged in England than starved in Scotland, tales of a grandfather. 
He left the army at Ashbourne, on December 6, to go to London to procure intelligence, with the knowledge and consent of the Prince and of Sheridan, Murray's Memorials, 434. At his trial he pled that he had escaped as soon as it was in his power, but this plea was repelled. He was executed at Kennington Common on July 30, along with Townley, and seven other English officers. Morgan is thus described in the complete history of the trials of the rebels, p. 170. David Morgan was about 51 years of age, born in Wales, and bred to the law, and had frequently, as a barrister, attended the courts at Westminster Hall, and elsewhere. He was a person of a very mean look, and seldom kept company with any gentleman of his neighborhood. And if it had not been for his estate, he might have starved, for he was so very lofty, and of so bad a temper, that no body but such as were beholden to him cared to employ him. This Morgan was possessed of a very good estate in Esti. Leonard's, Shoreditch, but he let it all run to ruin, because he would not pay the ground rent. The rebels called Morgan the pretender's counselor, and his advice was consulted on every occasion. Even after he was condemned, he was haughty and insolent beyond expression, and the very afternoon before his execution, he grumbled to pay the cook who dressed his dinner and said she was very extravagant in her demands. The morning, about six o'clock, before he went to execution, he ordered coffee to be made, and bid them take care to make it very good and strong, for he had never drank any since he had been in that prison fit to come near a gentleman. And because it was ready before he was unlocked, he seemed angry, and in a great passion. Morgan was the author of a rather dull satirical political poem of 630 verses, entitled The Country Bard or the Modern Courtiers, inscribed to H.R.H. The Prince of Wales, a quarto originally printed in 1741, and republished in 1746 after his execution. It is prefaced by a dedicatory letter to Sir Watkin Williams Wynne, the Welsh Jacobite baronet. In his dying declaration, handed to the sheriff on the scaffold, Morgan writes that he is a member of the Church of England. And that he has fully set forth his faith in a poem of two books entitled The Christian Test or The Coalition of Faith and Reason, the first of which he had already published, and the latter he bequeathed to his daughter to be published by her. Morgan seems to have had a certain notoriety as member of a Jacobite club at Westminster. Judging by a very coarse jeu d'esprit bearing the title A Faithful Narrative of the Wonderful and Surprising Appearance of Councillor Morgan's Ghost at the Meeting giving a full and true account of the behavior of the club on that occasion. This folio, for it has that dignity, is followed by another entitled An Appeal from the Late David Morgan, ESQ, Barrister at Law. Against a late scurrilous paper. My copy of the second pamphlet bears the note in contemporary handwriting, by one Fielding a concealer of the law, and it is possible it may be by Henry Fielding. Who at this time gave himself to ironical writing of this kind in the True Patriot and the Jacobites' Journal? Both pamphlets are full of topical allusions and scarcely concealed names. Morgan was also the subject of a brutally coarse print entitled, An Exact Description of the Solemn Procession of Councillor Morgan's Ghost to the Rump of the Westminster Independence. The only elucidation of this I can suggest is from a passage in the appeal above mentioned in which Morgan's ghost is made to visit his friends but, with neither a greyhound upon his breast nor a writ in his hand. Perhaps suggesting that in life he was in the habit of carrying writs and being accompanied by a greyhound. The colonel appointed was Francis Townley, an English Roman Catholic, b. 1709, fifth son of Charles Townley of Townley Hall, Lancashire, went to France 1728, and entered the French army. Served at the siege of Philipsburg under the Duke of Berwick, but after the peace following the war of the Polish succession, returned to England, and lived privately in Wales until 1745. The French king sent him a colonel's commission about the time of the intended invasion of 1744. See Townley Mises, privately printed. He was given command of the Manchester Regiment, as told here. Was left governor of the town of Carlisle when the army retreated to Scotland in December, entirely opposed to surrendering to Cumberland, flying into a passion with Hamilton, the governor of the castle. CPP. 118, 193, and declaring that it was better to die by the sword than to fall into the hands of those damned Hanoverians. Evidence at trial. At Hamilton's trial, evidence was given that he too desired to hold out to the last, but was overruled by his officers. 
Townley was tried at Southwark in July 1746. Pled that his French commission entitled him to be treated as a prisoner of war, not a rebel, but this was repelled as, being an Englishman born, it was illegal to serve a sovereign at war with the British king. Executed on Kennington Common, July 30th, and Hamilton on November 15th. The prince's lifeguards, there were two troops, one commanded by Lord Elcho, the other by Colonel Elphinstone, afterwards Lord Balmerino. The army left Manchester on December 1st. The quarrel which caused Lord George Murray's resignation of his commission as Lieutenant, Gen, took place at Carlisle on November 15th, when the command was given to the Duke of Perth. Daniel cannot be correct in stating that Lord George was not reinstated until the army was at Manchester, the quarrel was made up before leaving Carlisle on November 20th, when Lord George led the van. Daniel, who did not join the army until the 24th or 25th, is probably writing from hazy recollection of what he had been told. Weir or Veer was the principal witness at the trials of the officers taken prisoner at Carlisle. Jean Louis Ligonier, generally termed Sir John Ligonier, K.B., a naturalized French Protestant, B., at Castres, France, 1680, emigrated to Dublin, fought under Marlborough through most of his campaigns, Major General 1739, Lieutenant General 1743. Commanded the infantry at Fontenoy, commanded the army sent to Staffordshire to oppose the Jacobites, until relieved by the Duke of Cumberland, November 27, Commander-in-Chief 1757, created Viscount Ligonier 1757, Earl Ligonier 1766. Field Marshal 1760, D. 1770. He had a brother Francis, who succeeded Colonel Gardiner in command of the Dragoon Regiment, now 13th Hussars. Francis Ligonier, though suffering from pleurisy, fought at Falkirk, caught more cold, and died a few days later. December 6, 1745, Black Friday. The journals of the day and most authorities estimate the number at about 800. They consisted of Lord John Drummond's own French regiment, the Royal Scots, and the Irish Piquets, or fifty men picked from each of the six Irish regiments in the French service. Two of the transports were taken on the voyage and 260 of all ranks made prisoner. On the eve of Culloden, the French envoy reported to his government that the numbers of French troops then were Irish piquets reduced to a half but recruited by 148 prisoners and deserters up to 260 men, Royal Scots about 350. Detachment of Barracks Regiment, page 151, 42, Fitzjames's horse 131, making a total of about 780. Cotton, op sit. C. Ante. Tuesday, December 10. They have ordered a contribution of £5,000 for the insolence of the mob, but with much ado they have got it to one half, to raise it by one o'clock. Journal of Elizabeth Byram, Manchester, in 1745. Honorable Arthur Elphinstone, B. 1688. Held Captain's Commission in Shannon's Foot, 25th, now King's Own Scottish Borderers which he resigned in 1716 to join Mar's Jacobite army, served in the French army. On a pardon being offered to him he declined to accept it until he had received the Chevalier's consent, which was given, joined Prince Charles at Edinburgh, received the command of the second troop of lifeguards. On the death of his brother, January 5, 1746, he succeeded as 6th Lord Balmerino and 5th Lord Coupar, the army was then at Stirling. The day after Culloden he surrendered to the Grants. Tried by the House of Lords and condemned to death. Beheaded, August 18, 1746. Colonel James Alex. Grant or Grante, a member of the staff of the French Royal Observatory. He landed at Montrose in October along with the French envoy. He served as Master of Ordnance to Prince Charles. He planned the siege of Carlisle, which succeeded. He communicated a plan for the siege of Stirling Castle, which was abandoned, as it exposed the town to destruction, and the charge was given to another French engineer, Mirabel de Gordon, who utterly failed. Grant planned the siege of Fort Augustus, which succeeded. He then planned the siege of Fort William, but was disabled at the outset by a contusion from a spent cannonball. Mirabel was given charge of the siege, and again signally failed. Grant prepared an elaborate map of the expedition published in French, English, and Italian editions, which are all described in the itinerary, 
pages 104 to 107. The Yorkshire Hunters, a corps of volunteer cavalry, which did not distinguish itself greatly. Its war song, set to music, will be found in the Gentleman's Magazine, December 1745. Daniel probably means the Dutch troops, some of which landed at Berwick and the Tyne in September 45. The Hessians did not come over until February 46. See Ante. Should be Clooney McPherson. This is the celebrated Skirmish of Clifton, fought December 18, described by Sir Walter Scott in Waverley, Chapter 59. End note. Both sides claimed the victory. The late Chancellor Ferguson wrote an exhaustive monograph on the subject, Kendall, 1889, showing that both were technically right. The Jacobite rearguard fought to protect the army's retreat to Carlisle, and entirely succeeded in their object. Cumberland's troops retained possession of the field, but were too crippled to pursue. Daniel, I think, shows a certain animus in entirely ignoring Lord George Murray, who directed this action and fought it with great bravery and skill. At the surrender of Carlisle to Cumberland on December 30 the following officers were captured. English, twenty officers and one chaplain, of these nine officers and the chaplain were executed. Scots, seventeen officers and one surgeon, of these five officers were executed. French, three officers, who were treated as prisoners of war. In addition 93 English, 256 Scots, five French non-commissioned officers and men were taken prisoner. This date is wrong, it should be December 20, the prince's birthday and the day he left Carlisle. The date is often given as December 31st, which is the new style equivalent. Old style was used in Great Britain until 1752. The Rev. John Bissett, one of the ministers of St. Nicholas Church, Aberdeen, from 1728 to 1756. He was a man of strong personality who spoke his mind, and was not very popular with his brethren. Bissett kept a diary during the Rising of 45, most of which is printed in the Spalding Club Miscellaneous, Volume 1. In that volume there is no reference to this sermon, nor do I know when it was preached. It is referred to in general terms by the late Mr. What in his county history of Aberdeen and Banff, the sermon was probably printed or Daniel could not have quoted it, but Mr. P. J. Anderson, who has kindly searched the Aberdeen University Library, cannot find a copy. Bissett, though uncompromisingly inimical to the Jacobites, declined an official meeting with the Duke of Cumberland as a member of the Aberdeen Synod, but he obtained a private interview as he had reasons for being alone. Bissett so deeply offended the Duke that he refused ever after to enter a Presbyterian church. Henderson, History of the Rebellion, 5th edition. This refers to the Prince's army. The Prince himself was never in Aberdeen. A party of Dumfries townsfolk had cut off a detachment of the Jacobite army's baggage during the advance to England in November. As a reprisal Prince Charles fined the town £2,000. Only £1,100 could be raised in the time given, so he carried off the provost and another citizen as security till the balance was paid. Scots Mag, 7. 533, 581. The army began to arrive on Christmas Day. Charles himself entered on foot at the head of the clans on December 26. He remained in Glasgow until January 3. A very different story is told by Provost Cochrane of Glasgow, who wrote, Our very lattice had not the curiosity to go near him, and declined going to a ball held by his chiefs. Very few were at the windows when he made his appearance, and such as were declared him not handsome. This no doubt fretted. Cochrane Correspondence, Maitland Club, probably both versions have a certain amount of truth. And the situation must have been similar to that of an earlier royalist leader when riding through Edinburgh. As he rode down the sanctified bends of the bow. Ilk Carline was flighting and shaking her pow. But the young plants of grace they looked cuthy and slee. Thinking, luck to thy bonnet, thou bonny dundee. The prince's master of the household says, the prince dressed more elegantly when in Glasgow than he did in any other place whatsoever. Lord Elcho says he was dressed in the French dress. Mirabel de Gordon, a French engineer, who completely failed at the siege of Stirling, as he afterwards did at the siege of Fort William. Lord George Murray says of him that he understood his business 
but was so volatile he could not be depended upon, Lord MacLeod states that he was always drunk. Brown was a French Irishman, a captain in Lally's regiment, who came over with the French envoy in October. He was left in Carlisle, but escaped at the surrender. After Falkirk he was sent to France to carry the news of the victory to Louis XV. Who made him a colonel in the French army. He returned to Scotland in March in the Hazard Sloop, which was driven ashore by four men of war at Tongue in Sutherland, when the passengers and crew were captured by Lord Ray and his militia. Probably William Maxwell of Carrucan, Kirkubrishire, who acted as chief engineer in the defense of Carlisle against the Duke of Cumberland. See Ante, pages 173, 187. Whatever may have been expected or mentioned verbally, Cumberland's written conditions were, all the terms HRH. Will or can grant to the rebel garrison at Carlisle are that they shall not be put to the sword, but be reserved for the king's pleasure. Lord George Murray was criticized at the time, even by his friends, for being on foot fighting with his men instead of being on horseback as a general watching the action and controlling events. Elcho, Affairs of Scotland, criticism was also extended to other generals and staff officers, particularly to O'Sullivan, who was never seen during the action and was accused of cowardice. Sir Robert Monroe of Foulis, 24th Baron and 5th Bart. B. 1684, S.U.C. 1729, M.P. for Wickburg 1710-41. His mother was an aunt of Duncan Forbes of Culloden. Entered the army early, and was captain in the Royal Scots by 1705. Served under Marlborough in Flanders, where he made a lifelong friendship with Colonel Gardiner, killed at Prestonpans, a commissioner of the Forfeited Estates Commission 1716-40, appointed lieutenant. Colonel and Commandant of the New Highland Regiment, Black Watch, when embodied 1740, fought at Fontenoy, promoted in June 1745 to be Colonel in the 37th, now the Hampshire Regiment, which he commanded at Falkirk. Dr. Duncan Monroe, B. 1687, Sir Robert's brother, had been a doctor in India but retired home in 1726. He accompanied his brother from fraternal affection in the hope of being of use to him for the colonel was very corpulent. For George of Culcairn, a third brother, who fell a victim in 46, see Ante. I am not aware of any ministers killed, though there may have been some in the Glasgow and Paisley Volunteer or Militia Regiments, which suffered severely. In the Glasgow Regiment, commanded by the Earl of Home, was John Home, afterwards celebrated as author of Douglas and of A History of the Rebellion. He was lieutenant, and during the battle in command of a company of Edinburgh volunteers. Home with several other volunteers was taken prisoner and lodged in Dune Castle. One of the prisoners was the Reverend John Witherspoon, 1723-94, then Minister of Baith, near Paisley. Afterwards in 1768 President of Princeton College, New Jersey, a leader in the American Revolution, and a very active member of the First Congress of the United States. Home gives a graphic account of their escape in his history. Later in the year Home became minister of Athelstainford in East Lothian. Lockhart was a major in Chumley's regiment, the 34th, now the Border Regiment. He was taken prisoner at Falkirk and released on parole. After Culloden he especially distinguished himself by extraordinary barbarity and the perpetration of terrible cruelties on the hunted fugitives. For instances refer to the lion in mourning. Every man of common sense who has the least idea of military matters must well know that, where there is only a small body of cavalry attached to an army of light infantry, as in this case. Such cavalry must be inevitably harassed because there are not many bodies of horse to relieve each other. Note in the Drummond Castle MS. A village between Stirling and Bannockburn, spelt Street Ninians, but locally pronounced St. Ringans. John Baggett, C. Ante. C. Ante. Gordon Castle. C. Ante. This is a vague and incorrect report, probably the camp rumor, of Lord George Murray's doings at this time. By a remarkable secret march from Inverness, he simultaneously surprised, on March 17, a large number of military posts garrisoned by the government militia in Perthshire, taking 300 prisoners. He then laid siege to Blair Castle, defended by Sir Andrew Agnew but his guns were too small to hurt the old castle. He probably would have starved out the garrison, 
but the advance of Cumberland's army caused his recall to Inverness. This being from an enemy is perhaps the most flattering tribute to President Forbes's achievement for his government. C.F. Post. C. Ante. C. Ante. Cumberland left Aberdeen on April 8. Lady Catherine Gordon, daughter of the second Earl of Aberdeen. C. Post. April 15. This is a calumny founded on ignorance of what was passing at a distance from the local situation of the writer. Lord George was leading the van to the attack of the enemy's camp. Which would have been surprised if the rear division had not hung back, and retarded the advance of the van, till it was too late to storm. Note in the Drummond Castle MS. The fact was directly the reverse, Lord George had used every endeavour to induce the prince to cross the river, and occupy strong ground which Brigadier Stapleton and Colonel Kerr had examined two days before at his lordship's desire. Note in the Drummond Castle MS. Ruthven and Badenoch, on the east side of the Spey, near King Ucy. Daniel is a little out in his recollection of time. Culloden was fought on April 16, while he left Scotland on May 4, c. only 18 days after the battle. This gold was 40,000 Louis Dior's. Part of it, Cluny's treasure, was concealed in Loch Arcaig, and left there for nine years under the care of Cluny Macpherson. The British ships were the Greyhound, the Baltimore, and the Terror. S. M. 8. 238. William Harrison, a native of Strathbridge, whom, when most of his brethren had been taken prisoner or driven from their charges, went to the sheriff of Argyllshire, told him frankly that he was a Catholic priest. But had neither done nor meant harm to anybody, and begged protection. The sheriff was well pleased with his confidence, and gave him a paper signed by himself requiring of everybody to allow him to go about his lawful business unmolested. In consequence of this, Mr. Harrison, in the summers of 1746 and 1747, visited almost all the Catholics in the Highlands, administering the sacraments, and exhorting the people to patience and perseverance in the faith. Bishop Geddes's M.S. The ships left Lucknanuak on May 4, L. in M. 3. 383, Scots Mag, 8. 239. Son of Thomas Sheridan, a fellow of Trinity College, Dublin, D.C.L., Oxon, and F.R.S., an Irish Protestant who followed James II. Into exile and became his private secretary. His wife, it is said, was a natural daughter of the king. The son, Sir Thomas, who was a Catholic, was engaged in the fifteen appointed tutor to Prince Charles 1724 or 25, and created a baronet 26. Attended the prince at the siege of Gaeta 34. In April 44 after the abandonment of the French invasion the prince asked for him, and his father reluctantly sent Sheridan to France, warning his son to be careful in his dealings with him. Sheridan accompanied the prince to Scotland and acted as his private secretary throughout the campaign. On arrival in France in 46 he was summoned to Rome by the Chevalier, accused of deserting the prince but exhibited his written orders to leave. He died at Rome a few months later, his death being variously attributed to mortification at the Chevalier's reproaches, or to grief at the prince's disasters. He had accompanied the Marquis d'Aiguilles to Scotland as interpreter. John Hay of Resselrig, near Edinburgh, brother of Thomas Hay, Lord Huntington, who married the sister of John Murray of Broughton, c. He was an Edinburgh writer to the Signet, admitted 1726. Substitute keeper of the Signet 1725-41 and 1742-46, fiscal 1732-34, treasurer 1736-46. He acted as treasurer to the prince, and when Murray of Broughton fell ill at Inverness in March he succeeded him as secretary. Lord George Murray attributed much of the disaster of Culloden to his neglect or inefficiency in provisioning the army, a duty which Murray had always performed well. Hay held a colonel's commission in the Jacobite army. He attached himself to Prince Charles after leaving Scotland, became majordomo of his household when he went to Rome after his father's death in 1766, created a Jacobite baronet in that year, dismissed in 1768, returned to Scotland 1771 died 1784. Alexander MacLeod, an Edinburgh advocate, was aide-de-camp to the prince throughout the campaign. His father, John, also an advocate, 
was a grandson of Sir Norman MacLeod of Bernera, and was a first cousin of Lady Clanrenald. He had purchased Miravonside in Stirlingshire, two miles from Linlithgow. Alexander was sent from Edinburgh in September to summon to the prince's standard Sir Alexander MacDonald of Sleet and MacLeod of MacLeod, both his near kinsmen. This mission, in which he failed owing to the stronger influence of Duncan Forbes, brought on him the special anger of the government. He was attained Ted, and for thirty-two years he wandered in the wildest regions of the Western Highlands and Islands. He received a pardon in 1778, and died in 1784. He was in Rosse when Dr. Johnson and Boswell visited that island in September 1773. He was generally known as Sandy MacLeod in the islands, and had also acquired the nickname of Mkruslik, signifying a cross between Proteus and Don Quixote. He possessed the most boisterous spirits, which delighted Johnson and irritated Boswell. See Post, N. 2. Alan McDowell is a mistake for MacDonnell or rather MacDonald, as his name is afterwards correctly spelled. He was a native of the Isles and a clansman of Clan Renalds. He went out with the clan as chaplain when the standard was raised, and continued with the army until the end of the campaign. He also acted as confessor to the prince. He and Ineas Mgillis, the chaplain of Glengarry's men, were the only priests that accompanied the Highlanders to Prestonpans. They wore the Highland dress, with sword and pistol, and were styled captains. At the Battle of Falkirk Mr. MacDonald rode along the line and gave his blessing, which the Catholics received kneeling. From Culloden he accompanied the prince in his flight and in the earlier part of his wanderings, leaving him at Scalpa. Later on he was apprehended in South Uist, and sent with some other priests to London in Ferguson's ship The Furnace. He and four other clergymen were examined by the Duke of Newcastle, who informed them that they might leave the country on finding bail for one thousand pounds each not to return. They pointed out that the bail was quite beyond their power, on which the Duke smilingly replied that they were honest men and he would take each man's bail for the other. MacDonald went to Paris, and in 1748 to Rome, where he lived for many years. Bishop Geddes's M.S. I do not know if he ever returned. Sick in an M. A. Mag. Most likely an error caused by careless transcription and meant to read, to Gortlick's house, not Horge, a gentleman of the name of Thomas Fraser. Gortlick, more generally spelt Gorchaleg, belonged to Thomas Fraser, a cadet of Lovatz. It was in this house and on this occasion that Prince Charles had his memorable meeting with Lord Lovat, which is dramatically described by Mrs. Grant of Lagan. See Wariston's diary and other papers, Scott. History Soci, Volume 26. Stratheric. Neil, who at this period is writing from hearsay, is quite wrong here. Glengarry was not at home and the house was, without meat, drink, fire or candle, except some fur sticks. Had Ned Burke not netted a couple of salmon, there would have been nothing to eat. L. in M. I. 89, 191. Angus Mackeechain, or MacDonald, was a son-in-law of Angus MacDonald of Borodale. He had served in the campaign as a surgeon in Glengarry's regiment. The family of Mackeechain MacDonald of Dryminderach, Erisag, was a branch of the Clan Renalds, descended from Echine, or Hector, a younger son of Roderick, second Clan Renald. Neil Mackeechain was of the Mackeechains of Halbeg, a junior branch of the September. Both families have long since resumed their earlier name, MacDonald, dropping the name Mackeechain. This was the prince's second visit to Borodale House on Loch Nanuac. It was here he stayed on his first landing in July 1745. He came again to Borodale in July 1746, after his wanderings in the Hebrides, by which time the house had been burned down by Cumberland's soldiers, he finally returned to Borodale on September 19, whence he sailed for France the following day. Angus MacDonald, the taxman of Borodale, was a son of the fifth laird of Glenaladale, a cadet of Clan Renalds, and was a first cousin of Flora MacDonald. Borodale's descendant, Colonel John Andrew MacDonald, is today laird of Glenaladale. Captain Felix Wunnell, born at Rome, son of a brigadier in the Spanish service. He served in the Spanish army until 1744, when he joined Lally's French-Irish regiment as captain. Was sent to Scotland with dispatches from the Duc de Richelieu in March 1746. 
After Culloden he accompanied Prince Charles during the first two months of his wanderings and shared his discomforts. He was captured in Benbecula by Captain John Ferguson of the Furnace. He was confined in Edinburgh Castle until February 1747, when he was released on parole and subsequently exchanged, Scots Mag, 9. 92. He wrote a journal of his wanderings, which is printed in the Lion, I, 102, 365. John William O'Sullivan, B., in company. Carey, 1700, educated in France and Rome for the priesthood, and, it is said, Fielding's true patriot, took orders. Entered the family of Marichal de Mailboy as tutor, afterwards secretary. Joined the French army and served under Mailboy in Corsica, afterwards in Italy and on the Rhine. Recommended to Dargenson as an officer, who understood the irregular art of war better than any other man in Europe, nor was his knowledge in the regular much inferior to that of the best general living. Entered the household of Prince Charles about 1744, accompanied him to Scotland and acted as adjutant general, as well as private adviser, during the campaign. Was with the prince in his wanderings until June 20. Escaped to France in a French cutter. Knighted by the Chevalier about Christmas 1746, and created by him a baronet of Ireland 1753. Date of death not ascertained. Donald MacLeod of Gualtergill, on Dunvegan Loch, Skye, the faithful, Palinurus, of Prince Charles from April 21 to June 20. He was captured in Benbecula in July, and taken to London in Ferguson's ship, released June 47. Died at Gualtergill in May 49, aged 72. His wife was a sister of MacDonald of Borodale and a first cousin of Flora MacDonald. It seems absurd to write of seizing the boat and stealing away. In addition to the prince's five attendants, O'Sullivan, O'Neill, Alan MacDonald, Ned Burke, and Donald MacLeod, there was a crew of seven boatmen, probably the servants of Borodale who must have known. It is true, however, that the prince's intended departure was concealed from most of the Jacobite officers assembled in Eriseg. Neil is right as to the day of the week, but wrong as to the day of the month. It should be Sunday, April 27. See Itinerary. Reverend John Macaulay, son of the Reverend Ollie Macaulay, Minister of Harris, was ordained parish minister of South Uist in May 1745. He was subsequently minister of Lismore and Appen 1755, Inverary 1765, and finally of Cardra 1775. He died 1789. At Inverary he had a good deal of intercourse with Dr. Johnson in 1773, duly recorded by Boswell in the tour to the Hebrides. John Macaulay was the father of Zachary Macaulay, and grandfather of Lord Macaulay. i.e. Neil Mackeychain. Reverend Ollie Macaulay, formerly of Tyree, appointed to Harris 1712, died 1758, aged about 85. Reverend Colin Mackenzie was not minister of Stornoway but of Locks, the parish to the south of Stornoway. Should be April 30th. Donald Campbell was the brother-in-law of Hugh MacDonald of Bailshare and of Donald Roy MacDonald, the former of whom is mentioned later on. The latter, though of the family of Sleet, had served in Glengarry's regiment. Donald Roy took over charge of the prince when he said farewell to Flora MacDonald at Portree in Skye. L. In M. 2. 21. An anecdote of Campbell's fidelity to the prince when he protected him against a party headed by Ollie Macaulay the minister is given in the itinerary. Neil Mackeychain does not love Donald Campbell, but Ned Burke, who was one of the party, calls him, one of the best, honestest fellows that ever drew breath. L. In M. I. 191. Lady Kildin should be spelt Kildun. This lady was the wife of Colin Mackenzie of Kildun a grandson of the second Earl of Seaforth. Mackenzie's sister was the second wife of Donald, 16th Clan Renald, the mother of MacDonald of Boysdale, and stepmother of old Clan Renald of the 45. From private letters belonging to Francis, Lady Muir Mackenzie, I find that Colin Mackenzie was then in London. Neil Mackeychain is all wrong here in the sequence of events and in his dates. He was writing from hearsay only. The true sequence will be found with authorities for the same in the itinerary, pages 48 to 50. A quarter of a peck of oatmeal not threshed, but burnt out of the ear. 
this was strictly in accordance with Hebridean honesty, continued to this day. The prince desired to leave money on the rocks to pay for the fish, but O'Sullivan and Wunnell, not the islanders, dissuaded him. CFL, in M, I had 172. Prince Charles landed in Benbecula, Clanrenald's island, on May 11, and from this time onward Neil writes from knowledge, not hearsay. South Uist. Ranald was afterwards taken prisoner and sent to London. Corridale is a picturesque valley situated in the mountainous part of South Uist, which occupies the middle of the east side of the island, whose northern, western, and southern confines are wonderfully flat. Corridale lies about the middle of this district, running northwest from the sea, between the mountains Hecla and Benmore, each about 2,000 feet high. If approached by sea it was easy for a fugitive to get away to inaccessible hiding places in the mountains, while if attacked from the land he could escape by sea. Prince Charles's lodging was a forester's house not far from the shore. On the north side of the glen, close to the sea, there is a fairly commodious cave, traditionally but erroneously the dwelling place of the prince. This cave was probably the rock under which Neil left the prince while he looked for strangers. Considering the weather to be expected in this island, there can be little doubt that the prince often sat there for shelter while he looked out for passing ships as the cave commands an excellent view of the offing to the southeast. The actual stay at Corridale was from May 14 to June 5, although the prince was in South Uist until June 24. For details, see the itinerary. See Ante, an introduction. Moidart. In Ordnance Survey Glen Coich, to the west of Loch Gary. I have no knowledge of the actions here referred to. Donald MacDonald, second son of Clan Ronald served as captain in his brother, young Clan Ronald's regiment throughout the campaign. His mother was Margaret, D. of William MacLeod of Luskintyre, son of Sir Norman MacLeod of Bernera, and Catherine, D. of Sir James Mort MacDonald of Sleet, 2nd Bart. Donald's uncle, Alexander MacLeod, was at this time Laird of Luskintyre in Harris. Donald was afterwards captured and imprisoned in Edinburgh Castle, but discharged without trial. In 1756 he joined Fraser's Highlanders, the master of Lovats, fought with Wolfe at Quebec and was killed in a subsequent action. I.E. Boysdale. Hugh MacDonald of Bailshare, an island to the southwest of North Uist, was of the Sleet family, his father being a natural son of Sir James Moore, second Bart, and his mother a daughter of the 13th Clanrenald. As Sir Alexander of Sleet and Lady Clanrenald were both great-grandchildren of Sir James Moore, they were nearly related to Bailshare, being in the Scots phrase, first cousins once removed. Bailshare's sister was the wife of Donald Campbell, the prince's host in Scalpa. Hugh of Bailshare had been sent to South Uist by Lady Margaret MacDonald, the wife of Sir Alexander of Sleet then in attendance on Cumberland at Fort Augustus, while his men were out against the broken Jacobites. Lady Margaret had sent Bailshare secretly with money and little luxuries to relieve the prince's discomfort and to help him generally. At one time it was proposed that Bailshare should conceal Prince Charles in his own island, but the scheme was abandoned as it might compromise his chief, Sir Alexander. This power of drinking seems to have made a great impression. Bailshare told Bishop Forbes that the prince still had the better of us, and even of Boy Still, Boysdale, himself, notwithstanding his being as able a bowman as any in Scotland. It is generally assumed that Prince Charles acquired his drinking habits as a result of his hardships in Scotland, yet his anxious father had detected symptoms of an over-fondness for wine even before he left Rome in 1744. In a letter to Colonel Aubrian, Lord Lismore, his envoy at the French court, in August 1745, the old chevalier writes, La grande vivicite du prince, son penchant pour tout sorts de divertissements. Edion pu tro de gout chuil sembloit alor avoir pour le vin, leur ont fair coar fossement chuil s avoyant gagni quelque chose sur son esprit etil devint bienta par la leur heroes. Stuart Papers, Brown, History of the High, 3. 445. See Post, N. 3. Should be Ulinish. He was a first cousin of Sir Alexander MacDonald whose mother was a MacLeod of Greshornish. Alexander MacLeod was made sheriff substitute in Skye in 1773. In 1791 he was alive and in his 100th year. 
Captain John Ferguson was the fourth son of George Ferguson, one of six brothers, members of a family long resident at Inverary. The eldest was the celebrated or notorious Ferguson the Plotter, of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, other brothers founded the families of Pitt Four and Kinmundy. George lived and died at Old Meldrum near Inverary, so it may be supposed that his son, John, was born there. Nothing is known of his early career, but in 1746 John Ferguson was in command of HMS. Furness, which is always spelt Furness in the Scottish journals and narratives of the time, and was employed in hunting fugitive Jacobites. He was the, the black captain of the 45, one of the most active and ruthless of the government officers. His cruelties are a constant theme in Jacobite annals, see the lion from the index. Captain Wunnell, who was one of his prisoners, states that Ferguson used him with the barbarity of a pirate, stripped him, and ordered him to be put into a rack and whipped by his hangman because he would not confess where he thought the prince was. L. in M. I. 374. Ferguson was promoted in the same year, by the express interference and recommendation of the Duke of Cumberland, to be captain of the Nightingale, a new frigate just launched. He died in 1767. Records of Clan Ferguson Ferguson's greatest exploit was the capture of Lord Lovat, which was effected with skill. Lovat had taken refuge in an island on Loch Morar, a freshwater lake, and had removed all the boats on the loch to the island. Ferguson landed a party, who saw the fugitives, whom they could not reach, and by whom they were greeted with cries of derision. He then sent a boat ashore from his ship, carried it over a mile or so of rugged country, and launched it on Loch Morar. Lovat's party rowed rapidly up the loch and got on shore, but after three days' concealment, the old lord, unable from infirmities to continue the struggle, determined to give himself up. Sent word to his pursuers and surrendered to Captain Dougald Campbell of Akakrossan of the Argyle Militia. Fuya, which I have corrected from Fugia in the N. M. Mega, as it is a manifest error of the copyist or printer. Fuya gives the local pronunciation of the name of the island which is generally spelt O-U-I-A in the Lion, and Wii in the Ordnance Survey maps. It is spelt Fuay on. Alexander MacDonald of Boysdale, Clan Reynold's stepbrother, was carried prisoner to London, and kept there until July 1747, when he was released. This was Boysdale's third wife, and daughter of MacNeil of Barra. Captain Carolina Frederick Scott shares with Ferguson and Lockhart eternal infamy for his superlative cruelty to the hunted Jacobites of the Western Highlands. I found his name and that of Ferguson still perfectly remembered in the Outer Hebrides, and received with execrations. He was an officer of Guise's regiment, the sixth, now the Royal Warwickshire. His satanic zeal, like Ferguson's, was rewarded with promotion. In November 1746 he was appointed major in his regiment in the room of Major Wentworth, who was cashiered for surrendering Fort Augustus to the Jacobites, March 5, when three companies of Guise's regiment were made prisoners of war. Meaning Captain Wunnell. This is the Bainshil Kowinich of the Lion, I, 329, the Bain Ruchoinich of the Ordnance Survey. A hill on the north side of Loch Boysdale, 900 feet high, from whence the low-lying country of South Uist can be viewed from sea to sea. On the northern spur there is a cave accessible only by a precipitous narrow ledge, where shelter from the weather could be had and an outlook to the minch. Local tradition associates this cave with the prince. He possibly took shelter there on this momentous day. South Uist, even in summer, is a very rainy island. Hugh MacDonald of Armadale, in Skye, was Flora MacDonald's stepfather. He was a grandson of Sir James Moore MacDonald of Sleet, and was thus a first cousin of Sir Alexander's father, and of Lady Clanrenald's father, as well as of Bailshare and Mrs. Campbell of Scalpa. He was a captain in one of Sir Alexander MacDonald's independent companies out against Prince Charles. He had formerly been an officer in the French army. Henderson's Life of Cumberland Daughter of Alexander, Montgomery, 9th Earl of Egelinton Married as his second wife to Sir Alexander MacDonald of Sleet, d. 1799. At Alizari, on the slopes of Cheval, a hill to the south of Loch Einort, and rising to the northeast from Flora's old home of Milton, or Aravullan, on the low ground near the ocean. This was the hill pasture of her brother's farm to which the cattle were driven in summer, 
while the owners occupied shielings or temporary huts in the neighborhood. It was an excellent place to meet. The western side of the island is a wide belt of dead level links formed by the sand thrown up by the swell of the Atlantic and known as the Machar. No wayfarer on the Machar could easily escape detection even if he were miles away, and it was the night of the full moon. Flora's shielding was near the western end of the hill region of South Uist, and just about as far west as the prince could have dared to go without losing the shelter of the hills. Benbecula, that part of the Long Island lying between North and South Uist, and joined to these islands by sea fords passable only at low tide and thus easily guarded. I found that the custom of nicknaming local notabilities after distinguished statesmen still exists. When I was visiting these islands fifteen years ago I met a crofter known as Gladstone, on account of his financial ability and his persuasive powers of Gaelic oratory, and there were others whose nicknames I have forgotten. I obtained a very interesting confirmation of this story from an aged Kaliak when in the islands. She told me that a family of Campbells, who lived near Loch Inort or Loch Skipport, had rowed the prince and Neil Mackeechain to Benbecula, and that the prince was furiously angry with them. But her explanation of his anger was that the boatmen were Campbells, a name not beloved in the Outer Hebrides, no one had ever thought of the terrifying effect of a tidal island on a stranger. C.F.R.L. Stevenson's Kidnapped, C.H. 14 a tenant who takes stock from the landlord and shares with him in the increase. Clan Renald's residence in Benbecula. A hill named Ruval, 400 feet above sea level, the only high ground on a very flat island. A projecting rock, on the south side of the hill, which gives considerable shelter and affords a wonderful view of the country, is probably the spot where the prince lay waiting for Flora. John Campbell of Memore, b. about 1693, d. 1770, S.U.C. As Duke of Argyll on the death of his cousin, the third Duke, in 1761. He had command of the troops in the west of Scotland in 1745, with headquarters at Dumbarton. He pursued Prince Charles through the islands, hunting for him as far away as St. Kilda. He was on his way back from that island when he nearly captured the prince at Benbecula. Many of the Jacobite prisoners passed through his hands, and, as a rule, he was kind to them, contrasting favorably with such men as Scott and Ferguson. Spelt Loch Uskavag in the Ordnance Survey. I.E. Neil Mackeechain. The home of Sir Alexander of Sleet at this time was Mungstadt House, also spelt Mongstadt, Mugstadt and other variations, in the parish of Kilmure, Trotternish. It was built on the site of an ancient monastic foundation near the shores of a lake named Columkill, since then drained and parceled into crofts. The ancient home of the family was Duntum Castle, about five miles north of Monkstadt, but during the troubles of the revolution it is said to have been burnt by a party landed from a warship. Local legendary lore gives various other versions of the reason for abandoning Duntum. By one account the family was driven from the castle by the ghost of Donald Gorm, a 16th-century ancestor. By another, it was owing to the death of a child of the family, who was killed by a fall from a window of the castle, which is built on the edge of a precipitous rock overhanging the sea. Monkstadt was built in its stead. Alexander MacDonald of Kingsburg, a senior cadet of the Sleet family, was the sixth in descent from James, a younger son of Donald Gromach, sixth in descent from John, Lord of the Isles and the Princess Margaret. Kingsburg was Sir Alexander's factor in 1746. His house was on Loch Snizord, about eight miles south of Monkstadt. The garrison belonged to the MacLeod militia, and the officer in command was Alexander, son of Donald MacLeod of Bamianac. Robert Craigie of Glendoick, Perthshire, b. 1685, Advocate 1710, Lord Advocate 1742-46, Lord President 1754, d. 1760. App 1 Printed in Chiefs of Grant, 2. 144. From Edinburgh, telling of rumors of the pretender's eldest son who had sailed from France. Requesting intelligence for government and expressing his belief that Grant will do all in his power to support government. App, 2. C. of G. 2. 146. Of Grant's zeal for H. M. and the government he never doubted. First intelligence ridiculously exaggerated, and had delayed military advance, 
but now Cope will be soon in your neighborhood which, with the assistance of H.M. Friends it's hoped will restore quiet to the country. Near Aberfeldy, Cope reached it when marching to the highlands from Stirling on August 23rd. He reached Trinifuer the 24th, down the Cardic 25th, Dalwini 26th. App 3. Mr. Grant to Sir John Cope, dated August 25th. Upon the first information I had of the pretender's son landing in the Northwest Highlands I came to this part of the country, and convened all the gentlemen of my name. And gave them directions to prepare as well as they could to keep the peace of the country. I and my friends have had great vengeance denounced against us by those clans, who are in arms, for the appearance we made for the government at the revolution, and in the year 1715. We have been preparing to defend ourselves the best we could. But now all my fears are dissipate, as I am informed you are marching to attack those rebels, when I think of your abilities and experience, no doubt can remain with me, but that the Highlanders will run before you. I wish you from my heart all success. I have sent the bearer a cousin of mine who has served several years in the army, to give you all the information he can, and to assure you of my zeal for the support of His Majesty's service and government, I am with esteem, sir, etc. This date is wrong. Cope reached Ruthven August 27, Dalrignes, Carbridge, August 28, Inverness August 29. See itinerary and authorities there quoted. All this is disingenuous and quite anachronic. The Duke of Perth, it is true, had fled from Drummond Castle on July 24, and taken refuge in Braemar, but he had left long before this, for he was back at Mackinney in Perthshire on August 9. Jack. Lairds of Gask, pages 103, 104. Clooney Macpherson at this time had declared openly for government, had accepted a commission as captain in Lord Loudon's Highland Regiment, and was now actually raising his men for King George. He was seized by Lochiel on August 28, carried prisoner to Perth, and not released until the 9th or September 10, when he undertook to join the prince. He returned to Badenoch, and not until then raised his men for the Stuart cause. The Mackintoshes at this time were arming for King George, under their chief, who was a captain in the Highland Regiment, Black Watch, it was not until considerably later that they deserted their chief to join Prince Charles under Lady Mackintosh. Alexander Brody of Brody, Murrayshire, MP Inverness Burgs, appointed Lion King of Arms 1727, d. 1754. His daughter married John, eldest son of MacLeod of the 45. App. 4. C. of G. 2. 149, a letter of indignant remonstrance. Cope cannot attack Highlanders in their passes or strongholds without Highlanders to flank the regular troops. If the king's Highland friends fail him we are undone, and all of us must be at the mercy of the rebels. The writer is told that Grant's people refuse to join him, Grant, if he joins Cope or marches out of his own country. Let him beware of counsels that will lead to his ruin. Grant should not give himself the airs of having a clan that can support and serve the government if when it comes to the push they tell him they won't go along with him. Grant had written to Cope expressing his readiness to join and assist him, but he would neither join him nor assist him with one man, nor go near him. Although Cope stopped at Avimor and spent the night at Dowrigny's, Carbridge, within ten miles of Grant. Rose of Kilravok, Lord Moray, General Cope and President Forbes are all disappointed with him. Grant's uncle, the Major, Governor of Fort George, Inverness Castle, is very angry. It would have been far better if Grant had given no assurances if he were not sure he could fulfill them. The writer is distressed about what people are saying of Grant at Inverness. How glorious it would have been if he had been the first man in the country to join the King's forces. The President has got two hundred stand of arms for the Laird of Mackintosh, who is to join Cope with two hundred men. Monroe, Mackays, Sutherland, Seaforth and others are raising their men for government. The writer is to meet Cope and President Forbes on Tuesday, September 3rd, what is he to say of or for Grant at that interview? A separate piece of paper contains this writer, I would not have been so strong if it had not been with a design, that you might show it to those of your own people that I am told are not for leaving your own Count Ray. So hope you'll forgive any strong expressions, as my meaning is to serve you. Ludovic Grant's uncle. App. 5. C. of G. 2. 
152. Duke of Gordon claims a right to the superiority over Morange, and Glenn Bucket, the Duke's former commissioner, was threatening the people if they did not join him. App. 6. C. of G. 2. 155. Grant's situation had made it absolutely impossible to wait on Cope when in his neighborhood, tells of Glenbucket's movements, also that very few have joined the pretender's son north of Badenoch. Glenbucket only got 130 men from Strathdown, Strathavon, and Glenlivet. James Ogilvy, eldest son of the 5th Earl of Findlater and 2nd Earl of Seafield, b. 1715, S.U.C. As 6th Earl 1764, d. 1770. He was a brother-in-law of Lord George Murray, being married to his stepsister Lady Mary. He was also brother-in-law to Ludovic Grant, who married, 1735, Deskford's sister, Lady Margaret, a union which two generations later, 1811, brought the earldom of Seafield, but not of Findlater, to the Grant family. App. 7. C. of G. 2. 160. Protests against the granting of one company only, but Lord Deskford has explained and he acquiesces, he names as officers for the independent company, Captain, Grant of Rothia Mercus, Lieutenant, Robert Grant, son of Easter Duthill. Ensign, William Grant, Year, of Della Chapel. App. 8. C. of G. 2. 160, from Culloden. App. 9. C. of G. 2. 162, from Culloden. The Macphersons under Clooney joined the Prince at Edinburgh, nine or ten marches distant, on October 31st. The Macintoshes joined the reserves at Perth, five marches, on October 30th. Accidentally shot at Falkirk the day after the battle. App. 10. Angus MacDonnell, second son to Glengarry, to the Bailey of Urquhart, dated Delchani, September 30th. This serves to give you notice, that I am this far on my way to Glengarry, and being clad with the prince's orders to burn and harass all people that does not immediately join the standard and as I have particular orders to raise your country. I do by these beg the favor of you on receipt of this to have at least 100 men ready in five days after receipt of this to join my standard at Invergarry, and though contrary to my inclinations, in case of not due obedience to this my demand. I shall march to your country with the gentleman here in company, Kepek's brother and Turnadrish, etc. And shall put my orders in execution with all rigor. And as I have the greatest regard for Grant and all his concerns, I beg you'll neither give your country nor me any trouble, I do not choose to give, and your ready compliance with this will much oblige him, who is sincerely, Dar. Sir, your most humble servant. P.S. Let me have your answer p-bearer, which will determine me how to behave. App. 11. Mr. Grant to the gentleman of Urquhart, dated Castle Grant, October 6. Auchmany has communicated to me the subject you have had lately under your deliberation. All the return I will give you, considering what I formerly wrote to my chamberlain, and which he communicate to you is this, that whoever among you don't comply with my directions in this present conjuncture, which is to remain peaceable at home and to be ready to receive my directions as your superior, and as master of my own estate, must resolve to obey me at your own peril. And as I have firmly determined that whosoever shall insult me or disturb any part of my estate shall meet with the returns such an insult shall me right. I am hopeful none of my neighbors will act a part by me, which I could not nor cannot allow myself to think them capable of. I cannot conceive the least title any man can have to command any of my vassals or tenants, but myself, Therefore whoever deserts me to follow any other at this time, I must look upon it as a disobedience to me. Which I will never forgive or forget to them and theirs. I am perfectly persuaded all the tenants will adhere and keep firm to me, if they are not led astray by bad advice, which I hope they will not follow. I am, gentlemen, your friend and will continue so, if not your own fault. App. 12. The Bailey of Urquhart to Mr. Grant, dated Belmackine, October 8. In obedience to your orders I convened all the tenants of this country this day, in order to march them to Strathspey, and there was only sixty or seventy of the tenants, that agreed to go with me. Dell and I came with all the men that joined us the length of Drumby, so far on our way to Strathspey, and Col MacDonald and all the gentlemen of this country came up with us there. 
and one and all of the gentlemen but Shugley and his son swore publicly to the tenants, if they did not return immediately or two nights thereafter, that all their corns would be burnt and destroyed, and all their cattle carried away. And when the tenants were so much threatened by the gentlemen as well as by Mr. MacDonald, they would not follow me one foot further. And upon the tenants returning Mr. MacDonald assured me, that this country would be quite safe from any hurt from him and not only so. But as some of the gentlemen that came north with him, had the same orders as he had to destroy this country, if we did not join them, he sincerely assured me, he would do all he could to prevent these gentlemen from coming. And if he could not prevail upon them to keep back, that he would run me an express in a few days to put me on my guard, and acquaint me of their coming, but one thing I assure you of ere ten days that this country will be ruined. Lord Lovat has not appointed a day for his marching as yet. For I am told that he has the meal to make that he carries along with him for his men's subsistence. There is a report here this day that there is two thousand French landed at Cromarty last Saturday with Prince Charles' brother. You'll please let me have your advice how to behave, for I am in a very bad situation. Please excuse this confused letter, being in haste and ever am, honorable sir, your most faithful HUBL cert. P. Ockmany did not act a right part. App. 13. Mr. Grant to the Chamberlain of Urquhart, dated Castle Grant, October 10. I received yours of the 8th this day about dinner time. I am not at all surprised at the conduct of the gentlemen of Urquhart, for as they seem determined to disobey my repeated orders, they want to prevail with my tenants to do so likeways. However now that they must have heard, that General Ligonier with at least 18,000 of our troops that have come from Flanders and the Dutch, and that there is 12,000 Danes, and the remainder of the British troops daily expected. And that nobody even at Edinburgh pretended to say, that the French can spare any of their troops, I fancy they will soon see their folly, and they must be satisfied in a little time, I will make them repent their conduct. And they will see the numbers they believed would join the rebels, dwindle to a very few, if any at all. Whenever you hear any motions among your neighbors make the best of your way for this place and see to bring these men with you, who were coming last day and as many more as you can, and assure them I will see what losses they sustain repaid. And shall do all in my power afterwards to save them when others must fly the country. Don't let any of the gentlemen know the day you design to march over with the men, other ways they might bring a posse to stop you, which will not be in their power if you be upon your guard. I think you ought to have spies in the neighboring countries. See that you get money from the tenants, who are due, that we may clear when you come over. App. 14. C. of G. 2. 170. From Inverness. Claims Grant as a relation and friend whom he finds, with great satisfaction, acting so distinguished a part. The king has appointed Loudon to command the troops in this country. It gives him the greatest pleasure to know that he has so powerful and faithful a friend to support him in time of need. App. 15. C. of G. 2. 171. From Culloden. Urging Grant to press forward his company. Any expense after his men are brought together shall be made good. Believes that, the thing will blow over without much harm, but Grant should have his eye on as many of his people as he can arm, to be ready for any emergency. Ways and means shall be fallen on to subsist them. App. 16. C. of G. 2. 175. Mr. Grant's heart is full of zeal for the preservation of our religion and liberties, and will exert himself to do everything in his power for H. M. Service, and is perfectly happy that we who are the friends of government have Loudon to advise and direct us. The delay in his company's joining Loudon is caused by all his clan vassals being ready, and he wishes the company to be all volunteers. He foresees that there will be occasion to convene all his men and he wants Rothia Mercus with him, and asks for certain alterations in the commissions to his officers. All the men of his company will have swords and most of them pistols and dirks. Hopes to capture Captain Gordon, who is levying cess on his party as their arms will be useful. He is determined to let none of the clans now in motion enter his county. App. 17. John Grant and Urquhart to Mr. Grant, dated October 21. The Macdonalds and Glen Morristones came into this country Saturday's night late and Sunday's morning. And this day we expected the master of Lovat with two hundred men to join the Macdonalds, 
who were in number six score, in order to spreeth, ravage, the country, if the whole people did not join them. The countrymen were all acquainted to meet this day at Milmtown, but few of them attended. And as the master did not come this day, as he appointed, sent word that he would be here tomorrow morning, so that I am made to understand, that they design to raise all their cattle, and by that method are of opinion. That the men will come present, and condescend to march directly to the army before their effects are carried off, but I made the bearer, who is the only one I could trust in. Advise the people to keep at a distance and allow them to carry off their cattle, as I assured them that you would repay them in what damage they might suffer that way. I cannot acquaint you at this time of the gentleman's disposition, but tomorrow I shall send an express, and give you a full account of our fate. The Lintome's house was attacked, but I procured a party from the colonel to guard it this night. Is all on haste but that I remain as becometh, humble sir your most ob humble servant. I am informed they design to march by Inverladenen. Barrisdale came this day from the north to this country, but did not bring any men alongst with him. App. 18, John Grant and Urquhart to Mr. Grant, dated October 22. The most of the countrymen met this day at Bellymore where Barrisdale came with a commission from his colonel to them, assuring if they did not join him, that he was fully resolved to spreeth the whole country. They all unanimously replied that in any event, they would not disobey their master's orders and his positive commands to them to sit peaceable at home, and swore that while there was a drop of blood in their bodice, they would not allow the Macdonalds to carry off their cattle. In a short time thereafter the master of Lovat accompanied with all the Stratherick gentlemen came to Milntown, and after a long conference with Mr. Macdonald of Barrisdale, he agreed that the Macdonalds in the country might be compelled to join the colonel, as he was not in readiness to march his men this week, but in the event that this did not satisfy Mr. Macdonald, he was to come in person with two hundred men tomorrow, to prevent their carrying off the cattle and secure the rest of the men for his own use, as he believed he had a better title to them than any Macdonald in life. As they could not agree upon the above terms, Barrisdale went with the master to Castle Downey to know my lord's sentiments and act accordingly. As this happens to be the case we are as yet uncertain of our fate, but shall to the outmost of our power, resist the Macdonalds if not assisted by the Frasers is all but that I remain as becometh, honorable sir, your most obet humble served. App. 19. C. of G. 2. 179. From Culloden. A letter to Lord Deskford from the Lord President countersigned by Lord Loudon. In addition to what Grant quotes, they cannot understand the unaccountable folly of his people that they deliberate in entering the company and hope that they may be persuaded to form it forthwith. App. 20. Lord Lewis Gordon to Mr. Grant, dated Street Bridget. November 3rd. I take this opportunity to assure you of the esteem and regard I have for yourself and all your family. And that I shall be always glad to do all in my power to maintain the good correspondence that has so long subsisted between the families of Grant and Gordon. And as you are very sensible of the situation of Scotland at present, I shall take this occasion of delivering you the Prince Regent's compliments, and how much he would be obliged to you for your aid at this important time. And if you don't appear active yourself, that you would not oppose the rising of your clan, which is so capable of serving the king and country. I hope you will be so good, as to consider this seriously, and to excuse this liberty from a friend, who does it with a pure intention of serving his country. I beg my compliments to Lady Margaret and all your family, as also to Lord and Lady Findlater and Lord Deskford, to whom please tell, that what I am to do for the Prince's cause in Bantshire shall be executed in the mildest and easiest manner in my power. Glen Bucket will deliver this to you, and believe me to be, Dr. Sir, with great sincerity your most affectionate friend and servant. This was the ancestral home of the family of John Roy Stewart, the Jacobite soldier poet. App. 21. C. Of G. 2. 184. From Inverness. Grant's company had arrived the previous day, was a very good one, the best clothed Loudon had seen. Was sorry that Lord Lewis Gordon had risen, but the Duke, of Gordon, had given orders to his people not to join him. Few had done so. If Grant were attacked his own power should make Lord Lewis repent. If not strong enough Loudon would do what he could for him. App. 22. C. of G. 2. 
183, from Culloden. App 23. C of G, 2. 186, from Castle Grant. App 24. C of G, 2. 187, from Inverness. Lord Loudon declines to send the company back to Mr. Grant, as he proposes to march through Stratherick to Fort Augustus. Thomas Grant of Acoinony, Keith, afterwards of Arndley, a cadet of Grant of Grant, best known as the early patron of James Ferguson the astronomer. Henderson, Life of Ferguson. Alexander Grant of Tachineal, near Cullen. App 25. Lord Lewis Gordon to Thomas Grant of Auchinaini, dated Huntley Castle, December 6. As Lord Lieutenant of the Counties of Aberdeen and Banff, I am to raise a man for each one hundred pounds of valued rent within the same, and where fractions happen the same is to yield a man. I hope, therefore, you will be so good as to send to Keith Tuesday next such a number of able-bodied men, as will answer to the valuation of your estate well clothed in short clothes, plaid, new shoes, and three pair of hose and accoutred with shoulder belt, gun, pistol and sword. I have appointed a proper officer to attend at Keith the above day for receiving the men. I need not tell a man of your good sense and knowledge the hazard of not complying with the demand. Your prudence will no doubt direct you to avoid hardships of military execution, wherein you'll extremely oblige, sir, your most humble servant. App 26. C. of G. 2. 190, Thomas Grant of Auchinaney to Mr. Grant, December 11, from Arndley. Lord Lewis Gordon has only 300 men, and of these only 100 have joined, mostly herds and higher men from about Strathbridge and unacquainted with the use of arms, many of them are pressed and intend to desert. 100 or 150 of Grant's men would drive them to the devil, and capture Lord Lewis and his Prime Minister Abaki, Gordon of Avoci. Lord Findlater's tenants and the people of Keith are being ruined by Abaki and look to Grant as their only savior. If Lord Loudon would take possession of Old Balvany Castle it would spoil Lord Lewis's recruiting. App 27. Lord Findlater's steward to his lordship, dated December 11. I had a letter from John Saunders in Keith upon Sabbath day night, informing me that there had sixty of Lord Lewis men come to that place upon Saturday's night under command of one white and that he and others in that place much wanted advice what to do. To whom I wrote for answer, that I had a letter from Lord Lewis Gordon for your lordship, which I forwarded by express, was very peremptor, Lord Lewis had given no orders for making the least demand upon your lordship's estate before its return. So I expected that none concerned in him, would offer to do it before that time, yet notwithstanding thereof, I had the enclosed this day from William Taylor, to which I answered that as I sent Lord Lewis' letter to your lordship per express. I could neither give answer nor advice to his letter, but that I expected that none concerned in Lord Lewis would have made any demand of your lop. Estate before I had your answer. As like ways that they would have deferred compounding the matter until that time. David Tullock is just now at Banff with about sixty or eighty men and as I am told demands no fewer levies from that town as two hundred men. Birkenbush was here last night, and told me that as it is not in his power to get your lordship's estate saved in such a way as he would have desired has utterly refused having any concern in uplifting the levies from that bounds. For which I have been very angry at him. But it cannot now help. To appearance Mr. Tullock or Abaki will be soon here, and unless your lordship fall upon some shift for relief to us, we shall suffer extremely. App 28. C. of G. 2. 192, from Castle Grant. App, 29. Earl of Findlater to Mr. Grant, dated December 13, after dispatching the short letter I wrote you this morning, which is enclosed, I received the enclosed from the President. All that I shall say is, that all their proceedings will not secure our safety unless a sufficient right and trusty party is left in Banffshire for Lord Lewis's small parties will stir as soon as they are passed. If there is not force enough to suppress them. You know the state of my health makes it impossible for me to attend Lord Loudon and make things agreeable to him as I would wish. I have writ to Tochenile and John and William Ogilvy's sheriffs deputes to do their duty the best they can in all respects. But I am not without my own fears that fear and trembling for after consequences may make some if not all of them extremely unwilling to act. 
perhaps even they may decline it. You know you have full power in everything that concerns me, to do what you think proper and I have full confidence you will do whatever you think right. But least something more formal should be requisite, with regard to the office of sheriff I hereby give you full power to act as sheriff depute of Banffshire and to employ such substitutes under you as you shall think fit. For which this shall be to you and them a sufficient warrant and commission, I always am most affectionately and entirely yours. P. My son intends to go down by forest to wait of Lord Loudon tomorrow, but as he continues extremely ill off the cold I am uncertain if he will be really able to go. I beg you will send the enclosed to Tochenile by some sturdy clever man because the bearer is feckless and too well known, and may be searched for letters. It contains orders for Tochenile, John and William Ogilvies to attend my Lord Loudon. Keep the President's letter. Your wife opened the enclosed from Robert Grant. App. 30. C. of G. 2. 189. From Culloden. This letter contains a postscript saying that Lord Loudon had prevailed with Lord Lovat to come in with him to town, Inverness, to reside at liberty there till the present confusions are over, to deliver up what arms he has. And to sign all proper orders to his clan to remain quiet. Loudon brings him on with him today, 11th, December, 9 o'clock in the morning. Boat O. Bridge, the ferry on the Spey near the mouth of the Mulban Burn, now superseded by a road and a railway bridge. Sir Harry Innes of Innes, Murrayshire, 5th Bart. S.U.C. 1721, D. 1762. He was a brother in law of Ludovic Grant, married to his sister Anne. Innes's son, James S.U.C. As Duke of Roxbury on the death of the fourth Duke in 1805. App. 31. C. of G. 2. 193. From Elgin. MacLeod will most cheerfully act in conjunction with Grant in everything thought proper. Bog, the local name for the site of Gordon Castle, built on the Bog O. Gite, Windy Bog. The ferry there was known as the Boat O. Bog, it is now superseded by Fauchaber's Bridge. App. 32. Mr. Grant to Mliad dated December 15th, I have just now the pleasure of yours by our friend Sir Harry Innes. I shall as soon as I get my men convened march to Fauchabers and endeavor to get possession of the boats, and shall do all in my power to secure the passage for the men under your command. I am hopeful the rebels won't be able to give much disturbance. App. 33. Lord Lewis Gordon to Mr. Grant, dated 5 December 16th. I was a little surprised this morning to hear that you had marched a body of your men to the low country so far as Mulban. Your reason for such proceedings I can't find out, as you have not got the least disturbance from the prince, or any of his friends, since his royal highness arrival in Scotland. And for my part one have not given you the least disturbance, since my coming to the north. So far from it, that I have given positive orders to the gentlemen employed by me to raise the levies, not to meddle with any of your estate no not so much as to raise a man from a little place called Del Nabo, which holds of the Duke of Gordon. To the men of which last place, I had a natural title. I now desire to know, if you are to take any concern in protecting the estates of any but your own. If that is the case, I must take my measures accordingly, and as the consequence must be fatal you have none to blame but yourself. I am this minute writing to Lord John Drummond that he may march his troops directly to this country to join the men I have already raised. But if you withdraw your men, and give no further disturbance, it may move me to alter my resolutions with respect to you. I wrote you a letter from Strathdown but was not favoured with any return, but must insist on an answer to this in writing or by some gentleman of character. Offer my compliments to Lady Margaret and your young family. I am with much respect, etc. Copy printed declaration of Lord John Drummond, Commander-in-Chief of His Most Christian Majesty's Forces in Scotland. We, Lord John Drummond, Commander-in-Chief of His Most Christian Majesty's Forces in Scotland, do hereby declare, that we are come to this kingdom with written orders to make war against the King of England, Elector of Hanover, and all his adherents, and that the positive orders we have from His Most Christian Majesty are to attack all his enemies in this kingdom, whom he has declared to be those, who will not immediately join or assist as far as will ly in their power. The Prince of Wales, Regent of Scotland his ally, 
and whom he is resolved with the concurrence of the King of Spain to support in the taking possession of Scotland, England and Ireland. If necessary at the expense of all the men and money he is master of, to which three kingdoms the family of Stuart have so just and indisputable a title. And his most Christian majesty's positive orders are, that his enemies should be used in this kingdom in proportion to the harm they do, or intend to his royal highness's cause. Given at Montrose, the second day of December 1745 years. J. Drummond. Copy printed letter from Earl Marshall to Lord John Drummond, dated Paris, November 1st. My lord, as I am now obliged to attend the Duke of York to England, with a body of French troops, I desire that you will be so good as to see if possible, or send word to the people that depend on me or have any regard for me in Aberdeenshire. Or the Merns, that are not with the Prince, that I expect they will immediately rise in arms, and make the best figure they can in this affair, which cannot now fail to succeed, and that they will take from you, my cousin German directions. As to the manner they are to behave on this occasion. I am sorry that just now it is not in my power to head them myself, but as soon as this affair will be over, I intend to go down to my native country and they may depend on my being always ready to do them what service will ly in my power. Marshal. Directed to Lord John Drummond, Brigadier of the King's Army and Colonel of the Royal Scots at Dunkirk. Copy printed letter from Lord John Drummond to William Moyer of Lone May, Esquire, Aberdeen December 11th. Sir, you will be pleased to communicate the contents of this letter to such gentlemen of your country as are well affected to the Prince Regent, and who retain regard for the Earl Marshal. And assure them that what may be necessary for effectuating the ends proposed shall be heartily supplied by me, and I am, sir, your most humble servant. J. Drummond. Addressed to Wilm. Moyer of Lone May, ESQ, Deputy Governor of Aberdeen. App. 34. C. of G. 2. 199. From Cullen. Grant's letter gives him vast joy. Culcairn will be with Grant tomorrow, while MacLeod will go to Banff and thence to Tiff and Old Meldrum. Culcairn to Mr. Grant, dated December 17. I came here this day with Captain William Mackintosh's company and mine, and have written to the Laird of Mliad telling my coming here and resolution of going tomorrow to Cullen etc. and therefore pray acquaint me how affairs are with you. I wrote also to the Laird of Mliad to acquaint me how affairs are with him. I am, Dr. Sir, yours etc. The following note was enclosed. All the information that is known here about the rebels, who fled out of Fauchabers, is that they all marched to Huntley, and about six men as computed abode in Numilm Sunday night and on Monday followed to Huntley. There is no word yet from Lord Loudon. App. 35. Declaration published at Strathbogy by Mr. Grant, dated December 18. Whereas many of His Majesty's subjects have been compelled by force and threats to enlist in the service of the pretender, whilst there was no force sufficient to protect them. If any such shall resort to me, and deliver up their arms, I shall signify their dutiful behavior in this point. To the end that it may be a motive to obtain their pardon from His Majesty's grace and will endeavor to free all of illegal and treasonable levies of men and money. But such as presumes to persist in their treasonable practices and to resist will be treated as traitors. App. 36. C. of G. 2. 194. From Inverness. Loudon's letter after applauding Grant's zeal is very much the same as Lord Deskford's letter which follows. App. 37. Lord Deskford to Mr. Grant, dated December 14. I am now with Lord Loudon and in a conversation with him, I find that he is sorry he has not sufficient authority as yet from the government either to give pay to any clan. Except when an immediate necessity which cannot be answered by the troops upon the establishment requires it, nor has he any arms to dispose of to the friends of the government. Scarcely having sufficient arms here for the independent companies and his own regiment. This being the case and the service in the countries of Banff and Aberdeenshire being sufficiently provided for by the 700 men already sent to that country, it is impossible for him to take your men into pay. And as your arms are certainly not extremely good, and he cannot give you others, I believe he would be as well pleased, that your people should go back to Strathspey. But he does not care to take it upon him to order them back, as the thing was undertaken without his commands. If you carry your people home, 
he wishes you gave Mliad information of it because he must regulate his motions accordingly with the independent companies. He says he won't fail to represent your zeal and that of your people, and wishes for the future nothing may be undertaken but in concert with those who have the direction of the king's affairs in this country. Pray let us hear what you do. Loudon who is much your friend assures me of another thing which is that the first opportunity that offers of employing any people in a way to make them make a figure he will most certainly throw it into your hands. I hear there are more troops to march eastward tomorrow. When Lord Loudon sets out himself is not certain. I am, dear sir, etc. As the governor commands here in Lord Loudon's absence my lord says he will choose to leave the grants here with him, that he may have one company that he may entirely depend upon. App, 38. C, of G, 2. 201, from Huntley. Grant writes he has a letter from Loudon intimating he should not have marched further than Keith, and he will return there next day. Culcairn and Mackintosh want to join MacLeod at Inverary tomorrow night. An enclosure contains the following lines, which naturally were not sent up to government, and are not in the record office. They are taken from the chiefs of Grant. Lord Loudon will not act as cope. Whose ribbon now is called a rope. If Grant is armed to join Leod. The enemy is soon subdued. App, 39. C, of G, 2. 200, from Banff. MacLeod very sorry that Grant is not to join him at Inverary, but he knows best what Loudon has directed. App, 40. C, of G. 2. 202, from Castle Grant. App, 41. C, of G, 2. 205, from Elgin. For a detailed account of the action at Inverary on December 23rd, see Ante, Eat Seek. App, 42. Mr. Grant to the Magistrates of Elgin, dated December 29th. In answer to their letter following. I received your letter of yesterday's date signed by you and the Magistrates of Elgin. Informing me that MacLeod and his men were then marching from your town towards Inverness and that you are now exposed to the same oppression with the other burgs to the east. As you had intelligence that there are five hundred men ready at Strathbogie to come over, who have sworn heavy vengeance against you. How far it may be in my power to give them a check, and to prevent the oppression they threaten you with, I dare not positively say. But I assure you, I have all the inclinations in the world to be of as much service to my friends and neighbors during these troublesome times as I possibly can. Upon the tenth of this month I was informed that the party under Abaki's command was levying the cess and raising men in a most oppressive manner in Banffshire, and that they were to detach a large party to your town. And were threatening to use the same acts of violence against you. As at that time I knew nothing of the relief that was acoming to you from Inverness. I convened upon the twelfth the most of the gentlemen of the country and about five hundred of the men, and marched directly to Mulban with an intention to cover your town and country, and to assist my friends and neighbors in the county of Banff. All this I did without any advice or concert with those entrusted at Inverness, only the very day I marched from this, I wrote and acquainted them of my intention. But as they imagined they had sent force sufficient to clear all betwixt them and Aberdeen, I found it was not expected that I should proceed further than Keith or my own estate of Mulban. However as I was resolved to chase the rebels out of Banffshire, if in my power I proceeded to Strathbog where I remained two nights, and then finding that I was not desired or encouraged to go further, I returned home, leaving a party of sixty men. With officers in Mulban to prevent any small parties of the rebels either from visiting you or oppressing that neighborhood. My party continued there till all the Mleads had passed in their way to Elgin but then the officers there thought it was not proper for so small a body to remain longer, when such numbers of the rebels were so near them. My present opinion is that you may all be easy, unless you hear that a much greater body come from Aberdeen to join that at Strathbogie for these at Strathbogie will never venture to cross Spey, when I am above them and Lord Loudon is so near them. Although the MacLeods have marched to Inverness, I am persuaded Lord Loudon will send another body sufficient to give a check to those at Strathbogie. In the situation I am at present in I am uncertain whether I am to be attacked from Perth or by those at Aberdeen and Strathbogie for my late march. I dare not promise to march with any body of men but in concert and with Lord Loudon's directions. And at the same time I have demanded to be assisted with arms, and encouraged to keep my men in the proper way. 
There is no body can wish the peace and happiness of my friends in the town of Elgin than I do. And I shall always be ready to use my best endeavors towards preserving the tranquility you at present enjoy. I am, etc. The Magistrates of Elgin's Letter to Mr. Grant, dated December 28, 1745. The Laird of Mliad and his men are this moment marching from this place towards Inverness, so that we are left exposed to the like ravage and oppression which other burgs and counties to the east of us labor under. And unless we be immediately favored with your protection, we and many others of the principal inhabitants must remove with our best effects to some place of safety without loss of time. By intelligence we have from the other side of Spey there are five hundred at Strathbogie ready to come over and who have threatened a heavy vengeance upon us, so that we have all the reason in the world to guard against the blow in some shape or other. We therefore beg you may give us a positive and speedy answer. And we are respectfully, humble sir, your most humble servants. App. 43. Sir Harry Innes to Mr. Grant, dated December 28. The desertion among all the companies has been so great that Mliad is resolved to march to Forest, and for aught I know to Inverness. This will lay this town and country open to the insults of the rebels. Therefore the magistrates have writ you and have desired me to do the same, desiring you may march such a body of your men here as will secure the peace of the country and town, but as you are best judge of this. I am, Dr. Sir, etc. P.S. We had yesterday the accounts of the Highland armies being totally routed and dispersed betwixt Manchester and Preston betwixt the 13th and 14th. The prince as he is called flying in great haste with about 100 horse. The Duke of Perth amongst the prisoners. If Mliad marches I must with him or go to you, but I think I shall go to Inverness for I am not liked at present by many. Sir Harry Innes to Mr. Grant, dated December 28th probably from Innes House. I wrote you this forenoon from Elgin, which I suppose would or will be delivered to you by one of the Council of Elgin. As Mliad was then resolved upon marching here, they were determined to apply to you for some relief and support for their town and country in general. I have and must do Mliad justice. He is far from loading you with any share of their late unlucky disaster, and would willingly act in concert with you for the common well, but to his great surprise when he came here. He found that his men who had deserted in place of going to Inverness had mostly passed from Findorn to the Ross side. So he does not know when or where they may meet. This has hindered him from writing to you to desire you to bring your men to Elgin in order to act with his. Although he had desired this from no other authority, or any reasons, but you're doing the best for the common cause, but this unlucky passing of his men at Findorn has prevented his writing as he told the provost of Elgin he was to do. For these reasons I run you this express that you may think how to act. I go to Lord Loudon and the President tomorrow, and will return to Mliad Monday forenoon. My compliments, etc. P. The President writ me that Lord Deskford is gone for London in the Hound and that they sailed the 25th. App. 44. C. of G. 2. 208. From Inverness. App. 45. Mr. Grant to Lord Loudon, dated the 9th Janey 1745-6. Enclosed your lordship has a letter I received this day from John Grant Chamberlain of Urquhart. The subject contained in it gives me the greatest uneasiness. I thought I had taken such measures as to prevent any of the gentlemen or tenants of that country from so much as thinking to favor the rebels far less to join them. I have sent the bearer James Grant my Chamberlain of Strathspey who has several relations in that country to concur with John Grant my Chamberlain of Urquhart in every measure that can prevent these unhappy people from pursuing their intentions of joining the rebels. And I have ordered him to obey any further orders or instructions your lordship shall give him for that purpose, and I am hopeful I'll get the better of that mad villain Currimony who is misleading that poor unhappy people. That I may not weary your lordship, I'll leave to him to tell you all that he knows relating to that country. I have just now received the enclosed from Lord Strecken by Mr. Sime Minister of Longmay, my Lord Strecken did all in his power to save my friend Lieutenant Grant from being taken prisoner, even to the hazard of his own life. I would gladly march to relieve him as my Lord Strecken suggests in his letter, but I take it for granted that that thing is impossible, for I could not march to that country with any body of men but the rebels must have notice of it. And would send my friend to Aberdeen and so forward to Glam's where the rest of the prisoners are. 
I am hopeful the Kinghorn boat on board of which my friend came to Fraserburgh is by this time arrived at Inverness, but least it should not, I send your lordship with the bearer the two last newspapers from Eden. Which came by Lieutenant Grant who luckily delivered them with my letters to Lord Stricken, before he was made prisoner. And I must refer it to the bearer to inform your lorp. Of the manner of Mr. Grant's landing and being taken prisoner. Mr. Syme who brought me Lord Stricken's letter informs that Mr. Grant told that part of the Duke of Cumberland's horse arrived at Edinburgh Wednesday last. That the Duke of Cumberland arrived at Edinburgh on Thursday last with a great body of horse, and the foot were following. I think it my duty to take notice to your lop. That the rebels are exerting themselves in every corner of the north to increase their army. I therefore think it absolutely necessary that all the friends of the government should use their utmost efforts to disconcert and disperse them. I had a meeting yesterday with all the gentlemen of this country, and I can assure your lop. We wait only your orders and directions, and there is nothing in our power, but we will do upon this important occasion for the service of our king and country. I wish it was possible to assist us with some arms, and money to be sure also would be necessary. But give me leave to assure your lordship that the last farthing I or any of my friends have, or what our credite can procure us, shall be employed in supporting of our men upon any expedition your lordship shall direct us to undertake for this glorious cause we are engaged in. I wish to God your lordship and the Lord President would think of some measure of convening the whole body of the king's friends in the north together, and I would gladly hope we would form such a body as would in a great measure disconcert and strike a damp upon the army of the rebels in the south, and effectually put a stop to any further junctions they may expect by North Stirling and at the same time surely we might prevent their being masters of so much of the north coast, and also hinder many of the king's subjects from being oppressed by the exorbitant sums of money the rebels are presently levying from them. Compliments etc. App. 46. Lord Loudon to Mr. Grant dated 16 Janey. 1745 to 6, I have had the honor of two letters from you since I had an opportunity of writing to you. I think your scheme of relieving the low country is a very good one. But in the present situation until I have a return of the letters I have sent for instructions, and a little more certainty of the motions of the rebels. I dare not give them any opportunity of slipping by the short road over the hills into this country and of course into possession of the fort. Whilst I am in the low country, as soon as instructions arrive, I shall be sure to acquaint you, and consult with you the most effectual way of doing real service to our master and our country. I beg my compliments etc. The prince arrived at Blair Castle February 6, and left on the 9th. App. 47. C. of G. 2. 222, from Inverness giving news of the abandonment of the siege of Stirling Castle by the Jacobites and their retreat to the north. The desertion among them has been very great, and it will take time to recollect their people before they can hurt us. App. 48. Intelligence sent to Lord Loudon by Mr. Grant, February 9, 1746. Last Thursday Mr. Grant sent by a minister's son not having had time to write, being busied in his own preparations intelligence of the rebels' motions, and what was said by some of their leaders to be their intention. Saturday morning he wrote Mliad the substance of it with the orders then brought to Badenoch, which as Mliad would forward was unnecessary for Mr. Grant to do. Since the above many confirmations of it have arrived but nothing new all this day. The enclosed is a copy of their resolutions taken at their meeting in Badenoch, where Clooney was present and approved of them. Many of them persons came home before Clooney and many of them expressed resolutions not to be further concerned. But how far they will be steady is uncertain. It is said by pretty good authority, that the Glengarry men after the interment of Angus MacDonald openly and in a body left the army, and many of the Camerons followed their example. It is certain most of Kepek's men were at home some time ago, but people are sent to use their outmost endeavors to bring all the above back, and influence what more they can for which purpose it is said they will remain at least two days at Badenoch. Their prince was said to be at Cluny last night, but the men remaining with him, and coming through the hills to be only in the country this night. A deserter from those coming by the coast, and who only left them in Angus, says Duke Cumberland was entering Stirling, as last of their army was going out, confirms the great desertion since the battle, and asserts it continues daily. 
also that there is no division coming by Braemar. The above deserters and others in letters say that Clan Hatton, Farquharsons, French, Pitsligo, Angus, Mearns and Aberdeenshire people came by the coast for whom billets were ordered last Wednesday at Aberdeen, and that some Donalds, Mackenzies, Frasers, Mleads, Camerons, Stuarts, Mfersons, Athole and Drummond men are coming by the hills. Some clatters say they want to disturb Strathspey, and others that it is their formed plan to march through and disarm it, and join the rest in Murray. The truth is not yet known. There are some rumors from the south that part of the Duke's army are following briskly by the coast, and that upon the rebels leaving Stirling, two regiments were ordered to embark for Inverness. Mr. Grant and all his friends have been alert as desired. Many spies are employed and what is material shall be communicated. The bearer will explain Mr. Grant's numbers and present distribution of them, with the various instructions given for the different occurrences that may happen. In the general it may be depended upon, that Mr. Grant will act zealously with his whole power in every shape that shall be judged best, suitable to the hardy professions he hath all along made. And upon a closer scrutiny finds he could bring forth five or six hundred more good and trusty men if he had arms, than he can in the present condition. If there are arms to be given the bearer will concert their conveyance. Sunday 8 at night. This moment fresh intelligence arrived from Ruthamercus as follows. It confirms most of what is above. They are ignorant in badinage of the present route of the army, and conceal their losses as much as possible, but acknowledged they lost considerably before Stirling, and obliged to leave behind them seven heavy cannon of their own. And part of their ammunition and baggage, with all the cannon and ammunition taken from the king's army. That they have brought north all their prisoners. The duke was advanced as far as Perth. Their prince is to be at Ruthven tomorrow where his field pieces and five, and some say nine battering cannon is arrived. Though they conceal their designs with great secrecy the prisoner officers conjecture their design is against Inverness. All the men of Strathern are gone home and to meet the army in its way to Inverness, which is to go through Strathspey, and the division coming by the coast to march through Murray. They call these in Badenoch seven regiments, made up of the people above mentioned. That many the writer conversed with declared they were sick of the present business, and wish for a sufficient force to protect them at home. One man says he heard their prince declare he would quarter next Tuesday in the house of Ruthamercus. Some means are employed to endeavor to increase the desertion and to create some dissension. If they prove effectual the conclusion will be quicker and easier. App. 49. C. of G. 2. 225, from Castle Grant. A long letter of various items of intelligence. App. 50. C. of G. 2. 224, from Inverness. Though a supply of arms has come it is impossible to send them and men must come for them. He will be glad to consult and cooperate with Grant. He has brought back troops from Forez and needs money, will Grant send him the cess he has collected. App. 51. C. of G. 2. 223, from Culloden. The Aberdeen rebels much discouraged, for the most part separated, and will not easily be brought together again. The Jacobites' intention is to capture Inverness and force all the neighborhood into their service. Glengarry's and Kepek's people and the Camerons are almost all gone home, but leaders are sent to fetch them out. All this will give time to the friends of government. App. 52. C. of G. 2. 232, from Castle Grant. A long letter of details of intelligence of the movements of the Jacobite army. App. 53. Further intelligence, dated February 15. 1746, Saturday 7 o'clock at night. Two persons confirmed that letters from Lord Loudon, etc., were stopped at Ruthven. One of them says the bearer was hanged this morning. Both agree the bridges on the road to Athole are broke down, that the castle of Ruthven was burnt last night, and stables this morning. The prince to be at Inverladenan this night, some of his people in Strathern, the last at Avamore. The Macphersons to march tomorrow all for Inverness. Best judges call them about five thousand. The Campbells were at Blair. The Duke certainly at Perth the twelfth. 
the Hessians certainly landed at Leith. Several expresses for this are stopped. You know better than we do what is doing in Murray. Near Carbridge. App. 54. Lord Loudon to Mr. Grant, dated Inverness, February 15. I have been honored with a letter from you last night, and another this morning, and I have seen yours to the governor, all with the intelligence which you have got for which I am very much obliged to you. And as we have had notice some time I hope if they do come, we shall be able to give them such a reception as they will not like. I expect to be reinforced with 900 or 1,000 men in two days, and every day to grow stronger. I have thought seriously on every method of sending you arms. But do not see as we are threatened with an attack, that I can answer sending such a detachment from hence. A march that must take up four days, as well bring the arms safe to you. Consider the clan Hatton are all come home. The Frasers and the gentlemen of Badenoch are appointed to intercept them, and if we have any business it must be over before they return. As to the number you mention, you know how small the number is, I have to give, and how many demands are made on me, and by people who are none of them near so well provided as you are. If you can send down three hundred men, I shall endeavor to provide them as well as I can that is the outmost I can do. You are very good as you be advanced to send us constantly what accounts you get, but by all I can learn your accounts magnify their numbers greatly. I beg you will make my compliment to all friends. I am with real esteem and sincerity, Dar. Sir, yours etc. This date not quite right. The Varout of Moy took place on the 17th, Loudon evacuated Inverness on the 18th, and the Jacobite army reached the town the same day. The castle, Fort George, garrisoned partly by Grant's company and commanded by his uncle, surrendered to the prince on February 20, Scots Mag, 8. Sir Everard Falconer, Secretary to the Duke of Cumberland, b. 1684. Originally a London mercer and silk merchant, the friend and host of Voltaire in England 1726-29, abandoned commerce for diplomacy, knighted and sent as ambassador to Constantinople 1735. Became secretary to the Duke of Cumberland, and served with him in the Flanders campaign, for his services was made joint postmaster general 1745, accompanied the Duke throughout his campaign in Scotland 1746, d. 1758. The Duke of Cumberland arrived at Aberdeen on February 27 or 28. Not the modern Castle Forbes on the Don, in Keeg Parish, but the old Castle Forbes at Drummanor, in the parish of Achindwar and Kern. Cumberland crossed the Spey on April 12. Fort Augustus surrendered to the Jacobites, March 5. Alexander, the father, had died, a prisoner, before July 29. He died a natural death, but in Glenarchard it was believed that he was burned to death in a barrel of tar. William Mackay, Urquhart and Glenmoriston. Not dated, but must have been written before July 29, i.e. prior to Shugley's death. Sir Dudley Ryder, 1691-1756, was Attorney General 1737-54, prosecuted the Jacobite prisoners of 1746, appointed Lord Chief Justice, 1754, C.R. Baron Ryder of Harraby, 1756, and died the same year. Hon. William Murray, 1705-92, fourth son of David, fifth Viscount Stormont. He was Solicitor General 1742-54, and the active prosecutor of Lord Lovat, Attorney General 1754-56, Lord Chief Justice 1756-88. Created Baron Mansfield 1756, and Earl of Mansfield 1776. His father and eldest brother were denounced as rebels, fined and imprisoned for their conduct in 1715. His brother James, circa 1690-1770, attached himself to the court of the Chevalier d'Esti. George, in 1718 he was plenipotentiary for negotiating the marriage of James. In 1721 he was created, Jacobite, Earl of Dunbar, and he was Secretary of State at the court in Rome, 1727-1747. He was dismissed in the latter year at the desire of Prince Charles, who deemed him responsible for the Duke of York's entering the church, he retired to Avignon where he died sp. in 1770. Murray's sisters entertained Prince Charles in the house of their brother, Lord Stormont, at Perth from the 4th to the April 10, 1745. 
Solicitor to the Treasury. This report is printed, post. Alexander Grosset, a captain in Price's Regiment, 14th, now P, of W, O, West Yorkshire. An engraving, dated January 14, 1747, entitled Rebel Gratitude, depicts the death of Lord Robert Kerr and Captain Grosset at Culloden. About the latter the following legend is engraved on the print, Captain Grosset, engineer and aide-de-camp to the general. The rebel shot Captain Grosset dead with his own pistol which happened accidentally to fall from him as he was on horseback, under pretense of restoring the same to the captain. Grosset had been aide-de-camp to General Handicide. He was serving on General Bland's staff at Culloden, according to family tradition. Sir John Shaw of Greenock, 3rd Bart, he was a cousin of Grosset's. I have failed to find his name in any record of officers connected with the customs or excise at this time. His father, whom he succeeded in 1702, had been one of H.M. Principal taxmen for the customs and excise, a pre-union appointment, and it is possible that the son succeeded to his father's office or to some of its perquisites. Sir John was M.P. for Renfrewshire 1708-10 for Clackmannanshire 1722-27. And again for Renfrewshire 1727-34. He married Margaret, D. of Sir H. E. W. Dalrymple of North Berwick 1700, and died 1752. Letter I. Brigadier General Thomas Falk was the officer left by Cope in command of the cavalry stationed at Stirling and Edinburgh when he went on his march to the Highlands. Falk fled with the cavalry on the approach of the Jacobite army, and joined Cope at Dunbar. He was present, second in command, at Preston Pans. His conduct, along with that of Cope and Colonel Peregrine Lascelles, was investigated by a military court of inquiry, presided over by Field Marshal Wade in 1746. All were acquitted. I have failed to find this narrative, but it matters little, as all that Grosset had to say was probably given in his evidence at the trial of Lord Provost Stuart, an account of which was printed in Edinburgh. 1747. It is accessible in public libraries. C. Ante. This refers to the capture of Charles Spaulding of Whitefield, Strathardle and Athol, a captain in the Athol Brigade. He was sent from Moffat on November 7 by William, Jacobite, Duke of Athol, to Perthshire with dispatches, and carried a large number of private letters, which are preserved in the record office. He was made prisoner near Kilsyth. There is no mention of Grosset's presence in the journals of the day, the credit of the capture being given to Brown, the factor of Campbell of Shawfield. Cron. Athole and Tullibardine, 3. 86, Scots Mag, 7. 540. Spalding was tried for his life at Carlisle the following October and acquitted. The Lord Justice Clerk had retired to Berwick when the Jacobite army occupied Edinburgh. That army left Edinburgh for good on November 1, but the justice clerk and the officers of state did not return until the 13th. Lieutenant Gen. Roger Handicide superseded Lieutenant Gen. Guest as commander-in-chief in Scotland on his arrival in Edinburgh on November 14, and held that office until December 5, when he returned to England. Guest again acted as commander-in-chief until relieved by Lieutenant. General Hawley who arrived in Edinburgh on January 6, 1746. The two infantry regiments that accompanied Handicide were Price's, 14th, and Ligonier's, 48th. They remained at Edinburgh until December, but after the landing at Montrose of Lord John Drummond with the French auxiliaries, November 22, it was felt necessary to guard the passage of the 4th with a stronger force. And the Edinburgh garrison was sent to Stirling. Prices on December 6 and Ligoniers on the 9th, where they were joined by the Glasgow and the Paisley militia. The cavalry were also sent to the neighborhood of Stirling, and Edinburgh was left with no defense but some volunteers and afterwards by an Edinburgh regiment enlisted for three months service, of which Lord Home was commandant. Letters 2. Dash 4. Pages 379 to 382. Letter V. Letter 8. Letter 9. Letter X. The Glasgow Regiment was then 500 strong. It was commanded by the Earl of Home, who was also Colonel of the Edinburgh Regiment. There were about 160 men of the Paisley Regiment, of which the Earl of Glencairn was Colonel. 
Scott's Mag, 8. 30. Grosset's account gives the erroneous impression that the infantry was moved to Edinburgh on account of its desertion by the cavalry. According to the Caledonian Mercury and the Scots Mag. The cavalry and the main body of the regular infantry came in together by forced marches from Stirling on the morning of the 24th, men and horses extremely fatigued. The West Country militia arrived later, by ship from Bowness, the intention originally being to send them on to one of the East Lothian or Berwickshire ports, see Lord Justice Clerk's letter, 17. Post. It was decided, however, not to abandon Edinburgh, so the infantry was kept in the town, but all the dragoons were marched eastward, the text here locates Haddington as their destination. Letters 12-18. Pages 388-391. Letter 13. The Milford, on November 28, captured off Montrose the Louis XV, one of Lord John Drummond's transports. 18 officers and 160 men were made prisoners, and a large quantity of arms and military stores were taken. The prisoners were confined in Edinburgh Castle until December 26, when they were sent to Berwick. Letter 19. Henry C. Hawley, B. C., 1679, D., 1757. Served at Almanza, where he was taken prisoner, Sheriff Muir, where he was wounded. Dedingen and Fontenoy. C. in C. at Falkirk, commanded the cavalry at Culloden. Execrated by the Jacobites, and detested by his own soldiers, who dubbed him for his cruelty the Lord Chief Justice and Hangman. He arrived in Edinburgh on January 6, 1746. In the narrative this sentence begins, Mr. Grosset having received certain intelligence which he communicated to Lord Justice Clark that the rebels. The narrative says, 100. This agrees with Maxwell of Kirkconnell, not above a hundred, but the number was continually increasing. Lieutenant, Colonel of Blakeney's Regiment, 27th, now the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. Letter XX. Letters 21, 22. pp. 392, 393. William Blakeney, an Irishman, born in company. Limerick 1672. Brigadier General 1741, Major General 1744, and appointed Lieutenant, Governor of Stirling Castle in that year. The office was a sinecure in time of peace. When Cope left Edinburgh for his Highland March, Blakeney posted down to Scotland and took command at Stirling Castle on August 27. When summoned to surrender the castle to Prince Charles in January, before and again after the Battle of Falkirk, he replied that he had always been looked upon as a man of honor and the rebels should find he would die so. His successful defense of Stirling was rewarded by promotion to lieutenant, general and the command of Menorca, which he held for ten years. His defense of Menorca in 1756 against an overwhelming French force won the admiration of Europe. For seventy days this old man of eighty-four held out and never went to bed. On capitulation the garrison was allowed to go free. Blakeney received an Irish peerage for his defense of Menorca about the time that Admiral Byng was executed for its abandonment. John Husk, 1692-1761, Colonel of the 23rd, Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Was second in command at Falkirk, and commanded the second line at Culloden. Major General 1743, General 1756. He was second in command to Blakeney at Menorca in 1756. Husk's division on their march consisted of four regiments of infantry of the line, and the Glasgow Regiment, with Ligoniers, late Gardeners, and Hamilton's Dragoons, now 13th and 14th Hussars. This is very misleading. Lord George Murray's scheme was to wait till the government troops came up, and tempt them over the bridge, when half had crossed he intended to turn and cut them off. Lord Elcho had kept the enemy in sight all the time and records that the Jacobites retired, in such order that the dragoons never offered to attack them. Moreover, before the Highlanders had passed the bridge the dragoons, who were in front of the regulars, drew up close by the bridge and very abusive language passed betwixt both sides. Even the picturesque touch of the substituted dinner must go. Lord George particularly mentions both in a private letter to his wife and in his historical letter to Hamilton of Bangar that they had dined at Linlithgow and the journals of the day state that the affair occurred about four o'clock. 
Maxwell of Kirkconnell considers that if the dragoons had been very enterprising they might have cut off Lord George's rear. Elcho, Affairs of Scotland, Jack. M.E.M., Comma, Cron. A.D.H. and Tullib, 3. 141. Kirkconnell's Narrative. This is meant to be an account of the Battle of Falkirk. The Argyllshire Highlanders had joined Husk at Falkirk on January 16, and were present at the battle the following day. Their colonel was John Campbell, younger, of Memoir, 1723-1806. In 1745 he was lieutenant, colonel of the 54th Regiment, but he commanded the Argyle Highlanders, militia, throughout the Scottish campaign, and was present at Falkirk and Culloden. He succeeded his father, C. Ante, as 5th Duke of Argyle, 1770. He is best known to fame as the husband of the beautiful Elizabeth Gunning, widow of the 6th Duke of Hamilton, and as the host of Dr. Johnson and Boswell at Inverary in 1773. At Preston Pans, September 21, 77 officers were taken prisoners. Some of these were allowed entire freedom on parole, but a large portion of them had been interned in Perthshire, they were kindly treated, and had given their parole. In December a considerable number had been removed to Glamis Castle, in Forfarshire, and to Cooper, Leslie, Pitfern, Culross, and St. Andrews in Fife. They were living quietly in these places when about the second week in January their retreats were raided and they were forcibly hurried off by a great number of people in arms and disguised, whom they could not resist. And carried by the same violence to Edinburgh. Scots Mag, 8. 43, 31 officers arrived at Edinburgh on January 19, and Grosset was sent next day to recover those mentioned in the text. The Duke of Cumberland arrived in Edinburgh on January 30th. Not identified. Letter 25. This officer may have been the second major of the third, Scots, guards, the only regimental officer of the name who held the rank of colonel at this time. Letter 28. Not identified. Letter 29. Should be Bly's regiment, the 20th, now the Lancashire Fusiliers. Letter Triple X. Letter 31. William, 8th Earl, S.U.C. 1720, in 1745 he was a captain in the 3rd, Scots, Guards, he served on Cope's staff at Preston Pans. Commanded the Glasgow, Volunteer or Militia, Regiment at Falkirk, was also Colonel of the Edinburgh Regiment. In 1757 he was appointed Governor of Gibraltar, where he died in 1761, being then a Lieutenant General. Letter 33. This is that Thomas Smith who, in 1728, for an act of consummate audacity acquired vast fame, became for a while the darling of the British nation, and in the navy received the nickname of Tom of 10,000. Although only junior lieutenant. Of HMS Gosport, while in temporary command he forced the French corvette Gironda to lower her topsail as a salute to the British flag when passing out of Plymouth Sound. For this exploit he was summarily dismissed the service on the complaint of the French ambassador, but, according to tradition, was reinstated the following day with the rank of post-captain, see Thackeray's roundabout papers, no. 4. On some late great victories. Modern investigation has somewhat qualified the dramatic story of the reinstatement, but not of the initial act. Smith was naval commander-in-chief in Scotland from February 1746 to January 1747 when he became Rear Admiral, in 1757, Admiral of the Blue. He presided at the court-martial which condemned Admiral Bing. He died 1761. To those interested in Jacobite history his memory should ever be cherished as the benignant guardian, if jailer, of Flora MacDonald. When Flora was first made prisoner in Skye in the second week of July, she was taken on board the ship of the merciless Captain Ferguson, Anti, in which she was detained for three weeks. Luckily for her, General Campbell was also on board and treated Flora with great kindness. The general handed her over to Commodore Smith, with whom she remained a prisoner until her arrival in London in the middle of November, a period of three and a half months. Home, in his history, says that, this most worthy gentleman treated Flora not as a stranger, nor a prisoner, but with the affection of a parent. Bishop Forbes tells the same story, he behaved like a father to her, and tendered her many good advices as to her behavior in her ticklish situation. 
Smith permitted Flora to go ashore in Skye to see her mother. When lying in Leith Roads he presented her with a handsome suit of riding clothes and other garments, as well as an outfit for a highland maid who had hurriedly left Skye to accompany the lady in her captivity. Guildhall Relief Fund See Appendix The Eighth Now the King's, Royal Liverpool, Regiment Apparently meaning notify. Imeth. A bilander or bilander is a two-masted ship, rather flat-bottomed, used chiefly in the canals of Holland. Sick in copy, and visibly is probably a mistake for invisibly. Author of Medical Heroes of the 45, Glasgow, 1897. Barclay acted as justice of the peace for Prince Charles, enlisted men, and collected the excise. Maul was a writer in Stonehaven and procurator fiscal of Kincardine. He served as an ensign, probably in Lord Ogilvy's regiment. Dr. Lawson seems to have been the father of John Lawson, Jr., who served in the Jacobite army. Keeper of a public house in Stonehaven. The occasion of this memorial and the circumstances attending its production will be found fully detailed in Chapter 6. Of the Last of the Royal Stuarts, by Herbert M. Vaughan, London, 1906. I am indebted to Miss Nairn, Salisbury, for this translation. These lists make no pretense to completeness. They are extracted from a manuscript Jacobite army list which I have been compiling for many years. In it I have noted down the name of every gentleman properly authenticated that I have come across when studying the history of the period. Clanrenald, Boysdale, Glengarry, and Bishop Hugh MacDonald did not rise in arms, but were all imprisoned for being concerned in the rising. Interesting information on the raising of Fairburn's men is given by the French envoy, writing to the French foreign minister, Lady Mackintosh, he says, a bienete imiti par un autre fort jolie person de son age, nami barb gordon. Femme de Mackenzie de Ferbarn, le plus considerable de vassos et de parents de Milord Seaforth. Celsi en a pas banni son mari, maize, malgar lie, elle a vendu ses diamonds et sa vaisselle pour lever de homes. Elle s'en a ramasse sent secante de plus braves du pious, chou elle a joint a su de melody seaforth, sous la conduite de son beau-frère. This beau-frère may mean Kenneth, her husband's brother, or it may mean Barrisdale who was married to her husband's sister. Young Lentron in the list of persons concerned in the rebellion is termed a schoolboy. I find no mention of this Barbara Gordon in the Mackenzie clan history. James Gordon, son of the Laird of Glastrum, Banffshire. Born 1664, died 1746, consecrated secretly as Bishop of Nicopolis in Partibus, 1706. Vicar Apostolic in Scotland, 1718. Lord John Drummond, Clanrenald, and possibly Lady Clanrenald, nay MacLeod, were Roman Catholics. Frederick of Hesse Castle was the consort of Ulrica, sister and successor of Charles XII. He was crowned King of Sweden 1720, died 1751. His nephew, Frederick, Prince, afterwards Landgrave, of Hesse, married Princess Anne, daughter of George II, 1740, he brought Hessian troops to Scotland in February 1746. Alexander Gordon of Auchintal, Banffshire entered the Russian service 1693, married the daughter of his kinsman, Patrick Gordon of Aklouris, the celebrated general of Peter the Great. Was a colonel at the Battle of Narva, 1700, where he was captured and detained prisoner until Peter's victory at Pultua, 1709. Rose to be a Russian major general. Joined Mars Rising, 1715, and was made lieutenant general, October 1715. Commander-in-Chief, February 1716, of the Jacobite Army on Mars leaving Scotland. Was at Bordeaux, and too ill to join the attempt of 1719. Though living in Banffshire in 1745, he felt too old to go out. Died 1752. He wrote a history of Peter the Great, published after his death, in Aberdeen, 1755. Captain William Hay groom of the bedchamber to the Chevalier. Robert, Gordon, but for the attainder Viscount of Kenya. Eldest son of William, sixth Viscount, who was executed for his share in the fifteen. He was an ardent Jacobite. He died in 1741, aged about thirty, 
and was succeeded by his brother John, who joined Prince Charles at Holyrood, accepted the command of a troop of horse, but deserted the following day. See Murray's Memorials, pages 53, 227. Not identified. Maybe Nisbet of Dalton and Calendar of Craigforth. French Minister of Finance. Walter Stapleton, Lieutenant, Call, of Barracks Regiment, Commandant of the Irish Piquets and Brigadier in the French Army. Wounded at Culloden and died of his wounds. Henry Kerr of Graydon, Teviotdale, heir of an ancient family of Moss Troopers, B. 1702, served in the Spanish Army, 1722-38, when he returned to Scotland. Was aide-de-ca to Lord George Murray and titular aide-de-ca to the Prince the best staff officer the Jacobites possessed. Captured in May in the Braes of Angus, tried for his life, and in vain pleaded his Spanish commission. Sentenced to death but reprieved, released in 1748, died a lieutenant, Call, in the Spanish service 1751. Leishman, a son of Knox, Kerr wrote an account of the operations in the last two months of the campaign, printed in the Lion, I, 355. This statement of Daniel's is opposed to all reliable evidence, and the note in the Drummond Castle MS is correct. The desire of his enemies was to throw the blame of the disaster on Lord George Murray. Even the prince seems to have talked himself into a similar belief, see post. The responsibility lay on Prince Charles himself, as is told in the introduction. Kepek's brother Donald, killed at Culloden. Donald MacDonnell of Turnadrish, or Tindrish, a cousin of Kepek, he was the only Jacobite officer taken prisoner at Falkirk. He was executed at Carlisle in October. Alexander Mackay of Auchmany, who long afterwards married Angusia, d. of Angus MacDonnell, Glengarry's son, referred to on. The House of Gordon of Glen Bucket at Tom and Towel in Strathavon. C. Ante. His Chamberlain or Steward. For the authenticity of this manifesto, C. Ante. Generally, Strathdurn, the Valley of the Findhorn. Clan Chatton, the Macphersons, Macintoshes, and Farcaharsons, probably here meaning the Macphersons. Index. Abercrombie, Francis, of Fetternir. Aberdeen, Rebels in. Presbyterian ministers preach against the rebels. No election of magistrates during the rebellion. Requests aid from Lord Loudon. Rebels demand £215 of levy money from Old Aberdeen. Masters of King's College taxed. Public fast observed. Rebels attempt to cause a mutiny among the Macleods. The rebels march to engage the Macleods. Skirmish at the Fords of Dawn. The rebels collect levy money. The citizens maltreated and plundered by MacGregors. Rebels march through the town in their retreat from Stirling. Arrival of the Duke of Cumberland. Bissett's sermon on the good behavior of the rebels, and Popish and non-jurant meeting houses destroyed. Gordon's hospital garrisoned by the Duke of Cumberland. The Duke leaves the town. Militia raised and governors appointed. Military law paramount. Rioting by the soldiers, and George Gordon, 3rd Earl of, and Aberdeenshire, the Rebellion of 1715. Lord Lewis Gordon issues his burning order, and Abernethy Presbytery testify to the loyalty of Mr. John Grant, Minister of Abernethy. Brother of Mayen. Abertarf. The Presbytery exonerate Rev. John Grant of Urquhart. Aboyne, Earl of. Achires. C. Ogilvy. Akoinani. C. Grant. Thomas. Adams, Mr., cipher name for the King of France. Agnew, Sir Andrew. Aird. Erlie, Anne, Countess of. James, Earl of. John, Earl of, and. Albemarle, William, Earl of. Alizari, South Uist. Alo, Operations of Rebels at. Altamarlock, Battle of between Sinclair of Kais and Campbell of Glenarchy. Aimlot de Chela, M., and Ancrum, William, Lord, Afteru. Marquess of Lothian, his expedition to Kurgaf, and orders the destruction of houses where arms were found, and 
is removed from Aberdeen because of the rioting of the soldiers. Succeeded by Lord Semple, and Anderson, Captain Appen Laird of C. Stewart, Dugald Applecross Arbuthnot, Alexander, of Knox, Commissioner of Customs, and Ardgour Laird of C. MacLean Ardlock, Laird of C. Mackenzie Ardna Merhan Argilshire Highlanders at the Battle of Falkirk Erseg, and Ascent and its proprietors, and Athole, William, Jacobite, Duke of Auchengall C. Crichton Auchluncart, Offluncart Ochmedon C. Baird, William Auchmany C. McKay, Alexander Alden, Battle of Avashi C. Gordon Baggett, John, in command of the Prince's Hussars, and Baird, William, of Ochmedon, and Bailshare Laird of C. MacDonald, Hugh Balhaldy C. McGregor, William Balmerino, Arthur, Lord, and His character as given by Captain Daniel The quarrel with Lord George Murray At the Battle of Falkirk Surrenders after Culloden Balmoral, Laird of C. Farkaharson Balnagowan, Lairds of C. Ross Baltimore Balvany Castle Banffshire and the Rebellion Lord Lewis Gordon issues his burning order, and Bannerman, Sir Alexander, of Elsick, and Barra Barrel's Regiment Barry, Doctor Barrymore, James, 4th Earl of, and Bartlett, writer in Aberdeen, taken prisoner by the rebels Batterow's Regiment. Bain Rechoinich. Belintum, Laird of. Benbecula, and. Ben Nevis. Birkenbush, Laird of. C. Gordon. Bissett, John, Minister in Aberdeen, his sermon on the good behavior of the Jacobite army in Aberdeen, and. Black Watch soldiers shot in the tower for desertion, and. Blair Castle, Siege of, and. Blakeney, William, Lieutenant. Governor of Stirling Castle, and Letter to, from General Hawley. Bland, Humphrey, Major General, enters Aberdeen. At Old Meldrum, and Marches to Huntley. Blelock. C. Gordon, Charles. Bly's Regiment, and Boat O. Bridge, and Bog O. Geit, and Boysdale. C. MacDonald, Alex. Bonner, near Crike. Borodale House, and Bourbon, the, taken by the English. Boyne, Banffshire, and Braco. C. Duff, William. Braemar. Bredalban, John, 1st Earl of, defeats the Sinclairs at Altamarlock. Brett, Colonel, Secretary to the Duchess of Buckingham, and Bright, Mr., cipher name of the Earl of Traquair, Q.V. Brody, Alex. Of Brody, writes to Ludovic Grant, upbraiding him for not joining Cope, and Brown, captain, of Lally's regiment, escapes from Carlisle, and J., cipher name of Murray of Broughton, Q.V. Bruce, Robert, minister of Edinburgh, and Bruce Hill. C. Forbes. Buchan of Akmacoy. Buckingham, Catherine, Duchess of, and Burke, Edmund. Burnett, Mr., cipher name of Prince Charles. C. Stuart. Of Kemi. Burnett, Sir Alex, of Lees. Butler, Mr. Caithness and the Jacobite Rising, and George Sinclair, Earl of, defeated by Campbell of Glenarchy at Altamarlock. Calendar, of Craig Forth. Cameron, Alexander, killed by Grant of Nakando. S. J. Brother of Lochiel, and Dr. Archibald. Donald, of Glenpean. Of Lochiel, and 
his interview with Murray of Broughton in Edinburgh, opposes the conversion of his people to Romanism, sends Prince Charles's declaration to Forbes of Culloden, at the Battle of Falkirk, at Culloden, Cameron, Ludovic, of Torcastle, and Margaret, sister of Lochiel, Cameronian Covenanters, and Camerons, at the Battle of Prestonpans, at the Battle of Falkirk, at Culloden, of Morven, Campbell, lieutenant, of the Edinburgh Regiment, of Inveraugh, attempts to capture the Duke of Perth, Alexander, lieutenant, taken prisoner at Keith by the rebels, Minister of Inverary, Company, Commissioner of Customs, Donald, befriends the Prince in Harris, and Sir Donald, of Ardnamurhan, and Dugald, of Akacrossan, Duncan, Sir Duncan, of Loch Nell, Sir James, of Auchenbreck, and John, of Mamor, Aftal, Duke of Argyle, and Year of Mamor, Colonel of the Argyllshire Highlanders, and Sir John, of Glenarchy, Aftal, Earl of Bredalban, Q.V. Primrose, wife of Lord Lovat. Campbells of Argyle at Culloden. Campo Florido, Spanish ambassador at Paris. Carberry Hill. Carlisle, surrender of. Occupied by the rebels. The siege. Jacobite prisoners, and. Carlisle, Alex, his autobiography. Carnacy. C. Gordon. Karen Water. Carse's Nook. Castle Forbes. Castle Fraser, Muckles, Aberdeenshire. Castle Law, Mr., Collector of Customs at Dunbar. Castle Leod, Strathpeffer. Cecil, William, Jacobite Agent in England, and Chalmers, George, Principal of King's College, Aberdeen. Taken prisoner by the rebels. Cherite, the, taken by the English. Chisholm, Roderick, of Comer. Of Strathglass, and O.G., killed at Culloden. William, son of Strathglass, physician in, and provost of Inverness. Chisholm's join the rebels. Chumley's regiment. Church of Scotland clergy loyal to the government. Threatened by the rebels. Ridiculed by the soldiers. Clate, Kirk Town of. Cleffin, Captain. Clusterton, Laird of. C. Fia, James. Clifton, Skirmish at, and. Cobham's Dragoons. Cochrane, Captain, Prisoner with the Rebels. Doctor, of Rough Foil. Alex, of Barbaclaw. Cockburn, Adam, Hosier, and. Kogak and the MacLeods. Collier's Regiment, and. Commissioners of Customs, Letter to, from Walter Grosset. Letter from, to Grosset. Congleton. Cope, Sir John. His march to the north, and. In Inverness. In Aberdeen, and. Removes the town's arms. At Dunbar. Position of his troops at Preston Pans. Defeated. Succeeded by Holly. Corin, Captain, and. Letter to, from the Lord Justice Clerk. Corn sent from the north of England to the rebels in La Haber. Corridale, South Uist, and, and. Craigie, Robert, of Glendoic, Lord Advocate, Aftel. Lord President, and. Letter from, to Walter Grosset. Crawford, Major. John, Earl of, and. Crike. Crichton of Auchengall, joins Lord Lewis Gordon. Crofts, Lieutenant. Taken prisoner at Falkirk, and. Cromar. Cromarty, George, 1st Earl of, and. George, 3rd Earl. Joins the Rising, and. Claims to be Chief of the Mackenzies. Crosby, Captain. Culcairn, now King Craig. Laird of. C. Monroe, George. Cullen. House plundered by the rebels, and. Culloden, estimate of Jacobite forces. 
the rebels' useless night march, and Lord George Murray in favor of making a stand at Culloden, and Prince Charles persuaded by Lord George Murray to give the place of honor to the Athole men. The Prince adverse to giving battle. Account of the battle. Daniel's account of the battle. House attacked by Fraser's. Culrake. Cumberland, William, Duke of, and. Takes Carlisle, and. In Edinburgh, and. In Stirling. At Perth. In Aberdeen, and. Orders the destruction of nonjurant meeting places. Withdraws his protection from the houses of Park and Dern, on account of the rebels pillaging Cullen House. Leaves Aberdeen, and, and. At Nairn. At Culloden. Disposition of his forces. The battle. Coming, of Kinnanmonth. Coming, year of Piddley. Cuberty. C. Gordon. Kurgaff. Cuthbert, of Castlehill. Major, brother of Castlehill, and Dan, Mr., cipher name of Donald Cameron, of Lochiel, Q.V. Daniel, Captain John, his account of his progress with Prince Charles. Joins the Jacobite army in Lancashire. Endeavors to obtain followers for the prince. Gets the better of a Quaker. Obtains a captain's commission. Joins Elcho's guards. Billeted in Derby. Meets the Duke of Perth. His horse stolen by the Jacobite soldiers. Deserted by his servant. Helps himself to a horse. His intimacy with Balmerino. Rescues two women at the crossing of the Esk. On the good behavior of the army in England. Marches north to Aberdeen. Loses his company in a snowstorm. Revives himself and horse with whiskey. Rejoins the army at Old Meldrum. Receives from the prince a standard taken at Falkirk. His testimony to the influence of Forbes of Culloden. Holds Lord George Murray to be responsible for Culloden. His description of the battle. Leaves the field with Lord John Drummond. His wanderings after Culloden. His description of the naval fight between the English and French. Sails for France. Danish forts in Glenelg. Derby. Deskford, Lord, and, and. Dixon, John, of Hartree. William, Lieutenant. In Wolfe's Regiment. Dingwall, merchant in Aberdeen, taken prisoner by the rebels. Dowgal, George, of the Janet. Donan Church. Drimnan, Laird of. C. Maclean, Charles. Tremelier. Laird of. C. Hay, Alexander. Drummond, Lord George. Captain John, and. Lord John. Lands with troops in Scotland, and, and. One of his transports taken, and. His declaration. Letter to, from Earl Marischal commanding his friends to join Lord John Drummond. The authenticity of the letter. Proposes to hang a few of the clergy of the Church of Scotland. At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Letter from, to Moyer of Lonmay. Lord Lewis, and. William, of Balhaldy. C. McGregor. Duff, of Premnay. William, of Braco, and, and. Dumfries, rebel army in, and. Dunbar, lady, of Dern. James, Jacobite, Earl of. Sir William, of Dern. Of Hempriggs. Dunbars of Caithness, and. Dunbenon. Dundas, Captain, prisoner with the rebels. Robert, of Arniston, Lord President of the Court of Session, and. Dundonald, Thomas Cochrane, Earl of, and. Duntelm Castle. Dern. C. Dunbar, Sir William. Durness Parish. Dutch troops land at Berwick and the Tyne. Eccleston. Edgar, David, of Keithock. James, secretary to the Chevalier d'Esti. George. Letters from, to Murray of Broughton, and. Letters to, from Murray of Broughton, and minus 27, and. Edinburgh, the provost declines to defend the town. 
in possession of the rebels, garrisoned by English troops, and cannon for the city walls, crowded with Jacobite prisoners, and Edinburgh Regiment. Edwards, J., cipher name of the Chevalier. C. Stewart. Iguils, Marquis D. Elcho, David Weems, Lord, and, and. Elgin, magistrates request the Laird of Grant to march to their assistance. Grant's letter explaining why he is unable to come. Ellis, Mr., cipher name of the Chevalier. C. Stewart. Elon. Elphingstone. Colonel. C. Balmerino, Lord. Elsick. C. Bannerman, Sir Alexander. Enzi, Banffshire, and. Errol, James, Earl of. Mary, Countess of, and. Erskine, Anne. C. Erli, Countess of. James, Lord Grange. Thatchfield. C. Thompson. Falconer, Alexander. Falconer, Sir Everard, Secretary to the Duke of Cumberland, and, and. Report by, on the services of Walter Grosset. Falkirk, Battle of. Fall, Mr. Magistrate in Dunbar. Farquharson, of Balmoral, and. Anne, wife of Ineas Mackintosh of Mackintosh. C. Mackintosh. James, of Invercald. Of Minaltry, Dash. Farquharsons. At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Fia, James, of Clusterton, Jacobite leader in Orkney. Fergus, Mr., cipher name of the Duke of Perth, Q.V. Ferguson, John, Captain of the Furnace, and. Ferindinal. Fielding, Henry. Findlater, James Ogilvy, Earl of, and. His house of Cullen plundered by rebels. Letter to, from his chamberlain, on the recruiting demands of Lord Lewis Gordon. Appoints Grant Sheriff Depute of Banffshire. Fisher, Mr. Cipher name of Prince Charles. C. Stuart. Fitzjames, the Comte de, taken prisoner by the English. Fitzjames's regiment, and, and. Fleming's regiment. Fletcher, Andrew, Lord Justice Clerk, and, and. Issues warrant for the apprehension of the Duke of Perth. Letter from, to the Commissioners of Customs. Letter from, to Captain Corrin. Letters from, to Grosset. Letter to, from Grosset. Fleury, André Hercule de, Cardinal, and. His death, and. Futhi, Foot O, D, and. Fachabers. Forbes of Blackford. Of Bruce Hill. Of Act. Taken prisoner by the rebels. Of Inverernon. Of New. Of Skeves. Alexander, Lord Forbes of Pitsligo, and. Sir Arthur. Duncan, of Culloden, and. Attempts to dissuade Lochiel from joining the rebellion, and. His offer of only one company to the grants resented. His explanation satisfactory. Described by Captain Daniel, and. George, of Skeletor, and. James, Lord, and. Robert, Printer, son of Forbes of New. For Martin, and. Fort Augustus. Siege of. Taken by the rebels. Fort George, taken by the rebels. Fort Rose, Kenneth, Lord, and minus five. Fort William, Siege of. Foy. C. Fuya. Foudline Hill. Falk, Thomas, Brigadier General, and. Fraser, brother to Inveralaki. Archibald Campbell, son of Lord Lovat, and. Charles, Fourth Lord. Of Castle Fraser. Of Inveralaki, and. James, of Foyers, and. Simon. C. Lovat, Lord. Master of Lovat, and. Thomas, moderator of Abertarf Presbytery. Of Gorchaleg, entertains Prince Charles, and. William, of Inveralaki. Frasers of Aird. Of Lovat, at the Battle of Falkirk. 
at Culloden. Frederick, King of Sweden. Landgrave of Hesse. Freebairn, Robert, Bishop of Edinburgh, and Fuya, and Garden, of Troop. Gardiner, Colonel. Garriock. Garstang. Garvimore. Guinness. Lairds of. C. MacLeod. Geohagen. C. Gorrigan. Gibson, Herbert Menz, Attorney. Gilchrist, James, Minister at Thurso, and. Glasgow, Major Nicholas. Glasgow, fined by the rebels, and. Regiment, and. At the Battle of Falkirk. Glasterham. C. Gordon. Glenbucket, garrisoned. Estate. Laird of. C. Gordon, John. Glencoe. Laird of. C. MacDonald, Alexander. Glenelg. Glengarry people are papists and notorious thieves. Laird of. C. MacDonald. Glencandy, Laird of. C. Leith. Glenlevat. Glenmoriston. Lairds of. C. Grant. Glen Nevis. Glen Coich, Glenquake. Glen's Heel or Muick, and. Gordon, Major. Of Abelor. Year of Ardoch. Of Ardvac. Of Ahi. Of Birkenbush. Of Carnacy. Of Cuberty. Mrs. Of Cuberty, and. Of Glasterham. Of Hallhead. Of Mill of Kincardine. Year of Logi. Lady, of Park. Alexander, Minister of Kintor. Of Ockintal, and. Lady Anne. Barbara, wife of Mackenzie of Fairburn. Catherine, Duchess of, and. Charles, of Blelock. Christiana, wife of Gordon of Glenbucket. Cosmo, Duke of. Henrietta, Duchess of, and. Isabella, wife of George, Earl of Cromarty. James, Roman Catholic Bishop. John, of Glenbucket, and minus 116, and. Lord Lewis. Joins the rebels, and minus 128. Lord Lieutenant. Of Aberdeenshire. Obtains recruits by threats. Interview with Lord John Drummond. Issues his burning order, and. At the Battle of Inverary, and. Letter from, to the Laird of Grant on recruiting for Prince Charles. His arbitrary conduct and insolence. Letter from, to Grant of a Coinony, making a demand for men with accoutrements. Letter from, to Grant, demanding to know what his intentions are. At the Battle of Falkirk. Mirabel de, and. Patrick, of Aclures. Theodore, moderator. Thomas, professor in King's College, Aberdeen. Sir Thomas, of Ulston, and. Sir William, of Invergordon. Of Park. Castle. Gorgon, or Geohagen, captain, and. Gorchaleg, laird of. C. Fraser, Thomas. Grant, governor of Fort George. Lieutenant, a prisoner with the rebels. Mrs., of Belindalock. Of Daldegan. Of Glenmoriston. Of Nakando. Of Rothiamercus. Alex, of Karimini. Of Shugley. Denies having had any correspondence with the pretender's son. Induces grants of Glenmoriston to surrender. Treacherously made prisoner at Inverness. Admits that some of his children joined the pretender against his advice. Dies a prisoner. His petition to the Duke of Newcastle, and. Of Tachineal, Findlater's Chamberlain. Letter from, to Lord Findlater on the demands on the estate by Lord Lewis Gordon. Allen, of Innerwick. Sir Archibald, of Monimusk, and. George, of Culban, Governor of Inverness Castle. James, of Dell. Of Sheugly. After assisting Grant of Grant in obtaining surrenders he is made prisoner by his orders. Examination of, in London. Denies any participation in the rising. 
his petition to the Duke of Newcastle. To be admitted to bail and tried in Edinburgh. Chamberlain of Strathspey, and, and. Sir James, of Grant. Colonel James Alexander, Master of Ordnance to Prince Charles, and. Jean, wife of Forbes of Skeletor. John, Chamberlain of Urquhart. Threatening letter to, from Angus MacDonald, ordering him to send men to join the rebel standard. Letter to, from Grant of Grant, requiring the gentlemen of Urquhart to remain peaceably at home. Writes to Grant giving an account of his difficult position. Letters from, to Grant, on the threat of the MacDonalds and on the refusal of the Urquhart men to join the rebels. Minister at Urquhart, hardships endured because of his loyalty. His house attacked by MacDonalds. Mobbed for praying for King George. Persecuted by the Laird of Grant. Imprisoned in Inverness. Exonerated by Abertarf Presbytery. Removed to London. Abernethy Presbytery bear witness to his loyalty. Examined in London. Declares that the Laird of Grant had no objection to some of his clan joining the rebels. Refuses offer of chaplaincy to the rebels. His life threatened. Denies having ever aided the rebels. His petition to the Duke of Newcastle. Ludovic, of Grant. Receives intelligence of the rising of the clans. Informs Cope of his efforts against the rebels. Sends men to guide Cope through the passes. Brody of Brody sends him a letter of remonstrance for not assisting Cope, and his conditional offer to help Cope. Sends men to drive Glen Bucket from Straven. Interview with Forbes of Culloden. Accepts the Lord President's offer of a company. Writes to the gentlemen of Urquhart, ordering them to remain peaceably at home. The Chamberlain of Urquhart gives him an account of his difficult position. Letter of instructions to the Chamberlain. Requested by the Lord President to hold his men in readiness. Informs Loudon of his anxiety to do all in his power for the King's service, and Letters to, from his Chamberlain on the Macdonalds threatening to ravage the country in case of men not joining the rebels, and His tenants in Urquhart refuse to join the rebels. Marches with six hundred men for Inverness. Dismisses them on learning that no preparations had been made. Letter to, from Lord Lewis Gordon, asking permission to recruit among his people for Prince Charles. Frustrates Lord Lewis's schemes for raising men. Appointed Sheriff Depute of Banffshire. Sends men to secure the boat O. Bridge. Assists MacLeod at Cullen. Lord Lewis Gordon writes demanding to know what his intentions are. His reply, and marches to Strathbridge and issues his declaration as to men forced to join the rebels, and Loudon and Deskford suggest that as he had no orders for such an expedition, he should return to Strathspey, and garrisons his house of Mulban. Letter to Elgin magistrates explaining why he cannot march to their assistance. Letters to, from Sir Harry Innes, on the need for protecting Elgin. Writes to Lord Loudon expressing his desire to do everything possible for the service of the government. Loudon's reply, and. On learning of the arrival of the rebels at Blair he again calls out his men, and. Watches the movements of the rebels, and renews request for arms. Loudon is unable to comply. Reproached by Murray of Broughton for aiding the rebels. Joins the Duke of Cumberland in Aberdeen. Forms an advance guard to Strathspey. Returns to Castle Grant. His persecution of John Grant, Minister of Urquhart. Said to be playing double. Might have been of great service to the government if so disposed. After Culloden he obtains the surrender of the grants of Glenmoriston and Urquhart. His treachery towards the grants of Sheugly. His possible indiscretions the result of zeal for the weal of the country. Patrick, moderator of Abernethy Presbytery. Robert, adjutant in Loudon's regiment. Son of Easter Duthill. Thomas, of Aquinony, and. Letter to, from Lord Lewis Gordon, demanding able-bodied men for the rebels. William, year of Della Chapel. Grant's surrender at Inverness. Of Glenmoriston, and. At Preston Pans. Grosset, Alexander, captain in Price's regiment, killed at Culloden, and. Walter, of Logie, collector of customs at Alo, 
his narrative of services performed, with an account of money disposed in the service of the government during the rebellion. Letters and orders from his correspondence. Rebels plunder his house in a low, and drive off his cattle. His narrative certified by the Lord Justice Clerk, etc. Letter of instructions to masters of transports. List of transports. Report on his services by Sir Everard Falconer and John Sharp, Solicitor to the Treasury. Letter from, to the Commissioners of Customs. Letter from, to the Lord Justice Clerk. Letter to, from the Commissioners of Customs. Letter to, from Robert Craigie, Advocate General. Letter to, from Lieutenant General Handicide. Letter to, from Captain Knight of the Happy Janet. Letters to, from the Lord Justice Clerk. Letters to, from General Guest. Letters to, from the Earl of Home. Guest, Joshua, Commander-in-Chief in Scotland, and Letter from, to the Commissioners of Customs. Letters from, to Walter Grosset. Letter from, to Captain Knight of the Happy Janet. Halkett, Colonel, a prisoner with the rebels. John, schoolmaster in Preston Pans. Hallhead. C. Gordon. Halliburton, John, and Hamilton, Bailey, in Kinghorn. Duke of. Governor of Carlisle. John, factor to the Duke of Gordon, his insolent conduct in Aberdeen, and Handicide, Lieutenant General Roger, and Letters from, to Walter Grosset. Hanway, Captain, of the Milford, captures the Louis XV. Transport, and Harper, William, of Edinburgh. Harris, Island of Harrison, William, Catholic priest, and Hartree, Peeblesshire, and Hawley, General Henry C., and Succeeds Cope. Defeated at Falkirk. Letter from, to General Blakeney. Hay, Year of Ranas. Alexander, of Dremelier, and John, of Resselrig, W.S., and Thomas, of Huntington, Keeper of the Signet, and William, Brother of Dremelier, and Captain Henry, Mr., and Hessians, and Land at Leith. Higgins Nook, near Alo. Highland soldiers shot in the tower for desertion, and Highlands, their deplorable condition previous to the rising. Home, John, author of Douglas. William, Earl of, and Letters from, to Grosset. Honeywood, General, defeated by the rebels at Clifton, and Horn, of Westhall. Howe, Captain Thomas, of the Baltimore. Howard's Regiment. Humleys, and Hunter, of Polmood, Death of, and Robert, of Burnside, and Huntley Lodge, formerly Sandstown. Husk, John, Major General, and At Culloden. Letter from, to Walter Grosset. Inglis, Sir John, of Cramond, and Innes, Sir Harry, of Innes, and Letter to Grant on the Need for Protecting Elgin. Inveraliki. Lairds of. C. Fraser. Inverernon, Laird of. C. Forbes. Invergary Castle. Inverladenon, and. Inverness pays indemnity to Keppoch. Taken by the rebels, and. Castle. Besieged and taken by the rebels. Inversion Pass. Inverary, skirmish at. Irving, of Drum. James Francis Stewart. C. Stewart. John's Haven, and. Keith. Rebel surprise a party of Campbells at. George. C. Marischal, Earl. James, Field Marshal, and. Robert, Bishop of Caithness and the Isles, and. Kelly's Regiment, and. Kendall. Kenya, John, Viscount. Robert, Viscount. William, Viscount. Kerr, Henry, of Graydon. At the Battle of Culloden. Lord Mark, killed at Culloden. Lord Robert, killed at Culloden. 
Kesok Ferry, and Kilmarnock, Earl of, at the Battle of Culloden. Kilmarnock's Horse. Kincraig. C. Culcairn. Kingerlock. Kingsburg. C. MacDonald, Alexander. Kinloch Moidart, Laird of. C. MacDonald, Donald. Kintail Parish, and. Kintor, John Keith, Earl of, and. Knight, John, Captain of the Happy Janet, Letter from, to Grosset. Letter to, from General Guest. Noidart people, all papists and mostly thieves. Larry, Captain. Lascellus, Colonel Peregrine. Lawrence, Rocked, of the Speedwell. Law, George, Nonjurant Minister, and. Lead Mines of Strontian, and. Legrand, Mr., Collector of the Customs at Leith. Leighton, Leighton, Colonel, and. Leith, of Freefield. Of Glencandy. Levy or Militia Money. Lewis, Island of, acquired by the Mackenzies. Lees. C. Burnett, Sir Alex. Liddell, John, in Haw of Dalders. Ligonier, Francis, Colonel. Sir John, and. Ligonier's Regiment. Lining, Thomas, Minister of Lesmahago. Linlithgow. Lismore. La Haber. Loch Alsh, Battle at, between Mackenzie's and Macdonald's, and. Locherkeg. Lochascave. Loch Boysdale. Loch Broom. Loch Caron. Loch Inort, Loch Inort. Loch Horn or Hell Loch. Lochiel. C. Cameron, Donald. Loch Maddy. Loch Scaport. Loch Uscavag, Lochisque. Lochinord, South Uist. Lockhart, Major, taken prisoner at Falkirk, and Logie, Merchant in Aberdeen. Long Island, and Lonmay. C. Moyer, William. Loudon, John Campbell, Earl of, and and at the rout of Moy, and defeated by Lord Lewis Gordon at Inverary, and Prevails upon Lovat to prevent his clan from rising. Censures the Laird of Grant for acting without orders, and. Letter to, from Grant, expressing his anxiety to do everything possible for the government, minus 300. Loudon's reply, and. Writes to Grant regretting he is unable to supply his men with arms, and. Lovat, Simon Fraser, Lord. And, and. Lumley, Mr. Cipher name of Lord Semple, Q.V. Lumsden, James, Minister of Towy. Lundy House, Fife. Macaulay, Ale, Minister of Harris, and. John, Minister of South Uist, and. Macaulay's of Kintail. Macbain, Alexander, Minister of Inverness, his memorial concerning the Highlands. Gillis, of Dalmagary, Major in Lady Mackintosh's regiment. Killed at Culloden, and McBain's joined the rebels. M.K. C. McKay. Mac Crimmon, Donald Ban, Piper of MacLeod, taken prisoner by the rebels at Inverary, and killed at the rout of Moy. McCulloch, Roderick, of Glastulic, and MacDonald, Mrs., suspected of being the prince in disguise. Of the Isles, Earl of Ross. Of Moidart. Of Morar, and Aeneas, banker in Paris, and accompanies Prince Charles to Scotland. Note on Alexander, of Boysdale, refuses to join the rebels. Taken prisoner, and his house plundered. Of Glencoe, and Year of Glengarry. Of Kepek. Of Kingsburg, and his interview with the prince near Monkstadt House. Sir Alexander, of Sleet, and and Alan, of Morar, and son of Scotus. MacDowell, chaplain with the rebel army, and Angus, of Borodale, and Year of Glengarry, killed at the Battle of Skernachalic. Son of Glengarry. Letter from, to the Bailey of Urquhart, 
threatening to ravage the country if men do not join his standard. Accidentally killed at Falkirk, and of Milltown, of Scotus, and Mackeechain, surgeon in Glengarry's regiment, and Anguja. Archibald, of Barrisdale, d. 1752, and d. 1787, son of Call, of Barrisdale. Catherine, wife of MacLeod of Bernera. Call, of Barrisdale. Sketch of his career, and Call of the Cows, of Kepic, defeats Mintosh at the Battle of Mulroy, and His people papists and thieves. Donald. Son of Clan Rinald, and Brother of Glencoe. Brother of Kepic, and Of Kinloch Moidart, and Hanged in Carlisle. Of Scotus, at Culloden. Of Tindrish, and Roy. Dalgal, of Clan Rinald. Flora. Her first meeting with Prince Charles. Dresses the prince to pass as her maid. Accompanies him to Trotternish. Informs Lady MacDonald of the prince's whereabouts. A prisoner in London. Hugh, of Armadale, and of Bailshare, and Vicar Apostolic of the Highlands. James, brother of Glencoe. Brother of Kinloch Moidart. John, boatman. Doctor. Of Glengarry. Of Goydale. Son of Morar. Son of Scotus. Colonel John Andrew, of Glenaladale. Lady Margaret, of Sleet, and. Mackeechain, Neil, his narrative of the wanderings of Prince Charles in the Hebrides. Ranald, of Clan Ranald. Lady, of Clan Ranald. Ranald, year of Clan Ranald. Brother of Neil Messichain, and of Kinloch Moidart. Brother of Kinloch Moidart. Son of Donald of Scotus. Walpole. Rory. MacDonald's lacking in loyalty to the throne. Defeated by Mackenzie's at Skernakalik, and at the Battle of Prestonpans. Many desertions during the retreat to the north. At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Of Barrisdale, and of Kinloch Moidart. Ndugall, William, merchant in Edinburgh, and MacDowell, Allen. C. MacDonald. Meachin, Alexander, of Domondrak. Or MacDonald, Neil. C. MacDonald. Mackeechan MacDonald of Dryminderak. Mackeechans of Halbeg. Gill, Commander. Gillivre, Malivri, Alexander, of Dun Maglas, and Magillivrace join the rebels. MacGregor, Gregor, of Glengyle. Or Drummond, William, of Balhaldi, and, and, and. MacGregors. At the Battle of Prestonpans. At the Battle of Falkirk. Ill treat and plunder citizens of Aberdeen. Mackinney, Perthshire. Macavore, Finley, Piper, author of The Campbells Are Coming. Mackay, Alexander, of Ockmany, and Mackay, Alexander, son of Lord Ray. George, third Lord Ray, Q.V. Mackays of Strathnavar. Mackenzie, Captain. Of Culcoy. Of Lentron. Of Scatwell, refuses to join the rebels. Alex, of Fairburn, and Mrs., of Fairburn. Colin, Earl of Seaforth, Q.V. Minister of Locks, and of Kildun. Mrs., of Kildun. George, of Balmaki. James, of Capac. John, of Ardlock. Of Kintail. Kenneth, Lord Fort Rose, Q.V. Captain in Barrisdale's Regiment. Roderick, of Coyjack. Sir Roderick, Tutor of Kintail. Mackenzie acquire a cint. And the lands of MacLeod of Lewis. Defeat MacDonald's at Skernakalik, and Join the rebels. Of Applecross and Loch Caron. Of Gerla. Of Loch Broom. Of Seaforth. Mkillikin, John, Minister of Loch Alsh. MacKinnon, 
John, of McKinnon, and Macintosh, Bailey in Inverness. Aeneas, of Macintosh, refuses to join the rebels, and taken prisoner at Dorna. Sent home by the prince. Anne, wife of Macintosh of Macintosh. Raises a regiment for Prince Charles, and her reception of her husband after his liberation. Meets the Duke of Cumberland in London. Lachlan, of Macintosh, defeated by Kepek at Mulroy, and Captain William. Macintosh's, and arm for King George, aft. Join Prince Charles. At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Mlachlan, Rev. John, of Kilchone, and Lachlan, of McLaughlin, killed at Culloden, and Maclauchlands. In Ardnamurhan. At Culloden. Of Morvan. Maclean of Ardgower. Of Cull. Of Dowart. Of Kingerlock. Of Lochbuey. Allen, of Brolas. Charles, of Drimnan, killed at Culloden. Sir Hector, of Duart, and Maclean's in the Forty Five, and at Culloden. Of Morvan. Maclennan's of Glensheel. Macleod, Alexander, advocate and aide de camp to Prince Charles, and lieutenant in the Macleod militia, and of Luskintyre, and of Eulinish, and Donald, of Guineas, of Gualtergil, and, and Hugh, of Guineas, and Janet, wife of Sir James Campbell, of Auchenbreck. John, Lord, son of George, Earl of Cromarty, and father of Donald, of Guineas, of Miravon's side, and, and Margaret. Margaret, wife of Sir Roderick Mackenzie, tutor of Kintail, and Neil, betrayer of Montrose. The last of the MacLeods of Ascent. Norman, of MacLeod, and and Sir Norman, of Bernera. Roderick, the last of the MacLeods of Lewis. Torquil, of Lewis. Conanac. William, of Luskintyre. MacLeods. At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Of Ascent. Of Kogak. Of Lewis, and Macmillan, Alexander, of Dunmore, Keeper of the Signet. Murich, John. McNeil, Anne, wife of MacDonald of Boysdale, and Roderick, of Barra, and MacNichols of Ascent. MacPherson of Cluny. Malcolm, Corporal in the Black Watch, shot for desertion. Samuel, Corporal in the Black Watch, shot for desertion. Macpherson's, and of Cluny, at the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Macrae, Macraw, Captain in Glengarry's Regiment. Alexander, Lieutenant. Macrath or Macraw, Gilchrist. Macrath, James, Captain in Barracks Regiment. Emraw, Murdoch, hanged as a spy. Mraes of Kintail, said to be descended from the Campbells, and minus seventy-seven. Mailboy, Marichal de, and Maitland, of Pitricky. Taken prisoner by the rebels. Malt tax. Mamor. Manchester. The bells having been rung for the rebels. Now ring for the enemy. Manchester Regiment. March, William Douglas, 3rd Earl of, Aftel. Queensbury, Duke of, Q.V. Marischal, George Keith, 10th Earl, and. Letter to, from Murray of Broughton, and. Letter from, commanding his people to join Lord John Drummond. Its authenticity. Masterman, Thomas, of the Ann. Mathesons of Loch Alsh. Maxwell, Doctor. Mr., cipher name of McGregor of Balhaldy, Q.V. William, of Carrucken, escapes from Carlisle, and. Menzies of Pitfoddles. Mercer, Mr. Metcalf, John, roadmaker and musician. Middleton, of Seton. Moidart. Moyer, Charles, brother of Stonywood. James, of Stonywood. 
William, of Lonmay, and Letter to, from Lord John Drummond Minaltry C. Farquharson, James Monkstadt House, and Monroe C. Monroe Moore, Mr., cipher name of Dr. Barry, Q.V. Morar Laird of C. MacDonald, Allen Mordaunt, Brigadier General Morgan, Captain, arrested for rioting in Aberdeen David, Barrister and the Pretender's Counselor, and Morrison, Roderick, Minister of Kintail, on the descent of the Macrays Morris, Mr., cipher name for Charles Smith, Q.V. Morvan Moy, the route of Moy, and, and Muckles C. Castle Fraser Muckle Ferry, near Dorna Muick or Glensheel, and Muravonside Laird of C. MacLeod, John Mulban Mull, Island of Mulroy, Battle of, and Monroe, Daniel, Minister of Tain, his account of the late rebellion from Ross and Sutherland. Dar. Duncan, killed at the Battle of Falkirk, and George, of Culcairn, and, and Sir Harry, of Foulis. Hugh, of Tinanick. Sir Robert, of Foulis. Killed at the Battle of Falkirk, and William, of Achaney. Monroe's and their loyalty to the government, and Murchison's of Loch Alsh. Murray, Lady Anna. Sir David, of Stanhope, and Lord George, and, and At the Battle of Prestonpans. The Quarrel with Balmerino. At the Battle of Falkirk, and His Night Attack on Cumberland's Forces at Nairn. At Culloden, and, and his flight from the battlefield. Attributes much of the disaster of the battle to Hay of Wrestlerig. Sir James, of Stanhope. John, of Broughton, his history of the first rise and progress of the late rebellion, 1742-1744. Letter from, to the Chevalier. Letter from, to Prince Charles. Letters from, to Edgar, and minus 27, and. Letter from, to the Earl. Marischal, and Letters to, from the Chevalier Letters to, from Edgar Lord John Margaret, Dow Of Lord James Murray Sir Patrick, of Octertire, attempts to capture the Duke of Perth Veronica Han, William, Solicitor General, and Nairn Nairn, Lord Narsum, cipher name for John Murray Q.V. New, Laird of. C. Forbes. Newcastle, Duke of. Letter to, from General Price. Petition to, from Grant of Sheugly, James, Year of Sheugly, and John Grant, Minister of Urquhart. Letter to, from the Attorney General recommending that Grant of Sheugly be admitted to bail and tried in Edinburgh. Newton Pow. Nicholson, cipher name for MacLeod of MacLeod. Q.V. Nisbet, of Dalton. Nonjurant clergy in Aberdeen and Banff favor the Jacobites. Their meeting houses destroyed in Aberdeen. North Uist. Nuntown, in Benbecula, and. Ogilvy, Lord. His regiment, and. Of Akires. Janet, Dow. Of the Earl of Findlater and wife of Forbes of Skeletor. John. Lady Margaret. William. Old Aberdeen ordered by the rebels to provide 215 pounds of levy money. Old Meldrum. Oliphant, year of Gask, at the Battle of Falkirk. O'Neill, Captain Felix, and. Orrery, Lord, and. Ori, M., French Minister of Finance. Osborne, John, Principal of Marischal College. O'Sullivan, Colonel John William and at Culloden. Paisley Regiment, and Papists of Aberdeen and Banff support the Jacobites. Park. C. Gordon, Sir William. Patterson, Sir Hugh, of Bannockburn. Peyton, of Grandham. 
Pearson, John, Master of the Pretty Janet. Perth, James, Jacobite, Duke of, and. And. Proposes to take Stirling Castle, and. Rejected by a lady in York. Suspected by the government. Attempts to take him prisoner, and, and. At the Battle of Preston Pans, and. On the way north is attacked at Kendall. Warrant issued for his apprehension. Assists his soldiers in the crossing of the Esk. At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. In Ruthven of Badenoch. Sails for France. Buried at sea. Petrie, James, advocate in Aberdeen. Reads the Pretender's Manifesto at the Cross, and. Joins the rebels under Pitts Ligo. Causes Maitland of Pitricky to be taken by the rebels. Pitcalney, Lairds of. C. Ross. Pitts Ligo. C. Forbes, Alexander. Piddley. C. Cumming. Presbyterian ministers at the Battle of Falkirk, and. Preston. Preston Pans, Battle of, and. Prisoners taken by the rebels interned in Perthshire and Fife, and. Price, John, Governor of Berwick. Letter from, to the Duke of Newcastle. Price's Regiment. Poole Rossi. Pulteney's Regiment, and. Queensbury, Charles Douglas, 3rd Duke of, and. William Douglas, 4th Duke of. Ray, David, non-juring minister in Edinburgh, father of Lord S. Grove. Rattray, Thomas, of Craighall Rattray, B.P. of Dunkel, and, and. Ray, George Mackay, 3rd Lord, and. Reed, Sir Alexander, of Barra. Reed, Patrick, Minister of Clat, and. Rich, Robert, Lieutenant, Colonel of Barrel's Regiment, and. Robertson's of Strowan. Rose, of Kilravok. Rashinus, Benbecula. Ross, the Master of, and. Of Balnagowan. Of Inverchasley. Han, Charles. David, of Balnagowan. George, 13th Lord. Malcolm, year of Pitt County, and. His men having joined the government forces, he joins the rebels. Earldom. Rosses of Rossshire, and. Rout of Moy, and. Roxburgh, John, of the Jean. Ruval Hill, Benbecula, and. Ruthven in Badenoch. Barracks demolished by the Highlanders. Castle burnt. Rutton, Doctor. Writer, Sir Dudley, Attorney General, letter to the Duke of Newcastle, recommending that, no evidence being produced, grant of Sheugly be admitted to bail and tried in Edinburgh, and. St. Ninian's Church blown up. Salton, Alexander Fraser, Lord, and. Sandilands, Sanderson, Mr., in Aberdeen. Sandstown. C. Huntley Lodge. Saunders, John, in Keith. Scalpa. Scott's Brigade, recruiting for service in the Netherlands, and. Scott, Captain Carolina Frederick, a relentless hunter of fugitive Jacobites, and. Seaforth, Countess of. Colin, Earl of. George, Earl of. Kenneth, Earl of. William, 5th Earl of. Seton, a priest, and. Semple, Semple, Hugh, Lord. And. Accusations against him by Cecil and Charles Smith. Semple's Regiment. Seton, of Touch. Shannon's Regiment. Shap. Sharp, John, Solicitor to the Treasury, and. Report by, on the services of Walter Grosset. Shaw, Farquhar, soldier in the Black Watch, shot for desertion. Sir John, and. Sheridan, Thomas, private secretary to James II. Sir Thomas. Sales for France, and. Syme or Syme, John, minister of Lonmay. Simpson, James. Sinclair, George, of Geese. Of Kais, Aft. Earl of Caithness, Q.V. Sinclair's Regiment. Skeletor, Laird of. 
C. Forbes, George. Sky, Island of, The Inhabitants Converted to Protestantism, and Smith, of Meany. Charles, Banker in Boulogne, and, and James, Minister at Crike. Commodore Thomas, and Flora MacDonald a prisoner in his charge. Smuggling on the increase. Summers, Richard, Commissioner of the Customs. Spalding, Charles, of Whitefield, taken prisoner by the rebels, and Spanish ship arrives at Peterhead with supplies for the rebels. Spangadale. Stapleton, Walter, Lieutenant, Colonel. At Culloden. Stewart, Captain, a prisoner with the rebels. Han, Anne, wife of Alexander Hay of Dremelier, and Archibald, Lord Provost of Edinburgh, and Charles, of Ardshiel, and Dugald, of Appen, and Sir James, of Bury, of Good Trees, and John, in La Haber. Roy, and, and At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Lady Mary, wife of Lord Fort Rose. Stuarts of Appen at the Battle of Prestonpans. At the Battle of Falkirk. At Culloden. Stirling, taken by rebels, and. Castle, and. The Siege. Stonywood. Laird of. C. Moyer, James. Stormont, David, Fourth Lord. Strathallan, Lord, at the Battle of Falkirk. Strathallan's Horse. Strathavon. Strathbidgey. Strathdurn, and. Strathdown, now Strathavon, Q.V. Stratherick. Strathglass. Strathlachlan. Laird of. C. McLaughlin, Lachlan. Strathlicky. Strathnairn. Strathnavar. Strathspey. Stricken, Lord. Strontian lead quarry, and. Stuart, Charles Edward, lands in Scotland. In Edinburgh. Defeats Cope at Preston Pans. Marches into England. Returns to Scotland, and. In Glasgow, and. Besieges Stirling. Castle. Defeats Holly at Falkirk. Desertions from the army. At Culloden House. Takes Inverness Town and Castle. Receives reinforcements. Want of discipline in his army. At Drummacy Muir. Forced to fight or starve. The feudal night march, and. Disposition of his forces before the battle. His responsibility for the Battle of Culloden, and. Meets Lord Lovat at Gorchaleg, and. At Borodale, and. Driven by a storm to Benbecula, and. Lands at Scalpa, in Harris. At Kildun, and. Returns to Scalpa. Chased by the Baltimore. At Benbecula, in the care of Clan Renald, and. Conducted by Neil Massechain to Corridale, and. Describes the Battle of Culloden to Neil Massechain. Blames Lord George Murray. Given to drink, and. Claims to have shot a whale. Eight days in Fuya. Visited by Lady Clanrenald. Sails to Lochinort. Learns of the enemy being at Boysdale. Meets Flora MacDonald. In a storm of wind and rain to Rashiness. Tortured by rain and midges. Joined by Lady Clanrenald and Flora MacDonald. Narrow escape from being taken by General Campbell, and. Disguised. His companions. At Watersay. At Trotternish. Meets Kingsburg. Disguised as Betty Burke. Letter to, from Murray of Broughton. Henry, Cardinal. C. York, Duke of. James Francis. Letter from the Chevalier to Murray of Broughton. Letters to, from Murray. Sutherland, William, Earl of, and. Swedish troops for Scotland, and, and. Simpson, Patrick, Minister at Falla, an ensign in Thornton's Company of Volunteers, and Taylor, William. Minister of New Deer, disarms a pillaging hussar, and 
of Fatchfield. Year of Fatchfield. Mr. Supervisor of Excise. Thornton, William, of Thornville, and Tachineal. C. Grant, Alex. Tongue Presbytery. Tory, and Townley, Charles, of Townley Hall. Francis, joins the Prince at Preston. Made Colonel of the Manchester Regiment. Governor of Carlisle. Traquair, Countess of Charles Stuart, Earl of, and, 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 and Trotternish. Tullock, David, in Dunbenon, and Turner, Year of Turner Hall. Urquhart. Chamberlain of C. Grant, John. Colonel. Vaughan, William, joins the Prince at Preston. Vint, Peggy, tavern keeper in Preston Pans, and Wait, Thomas. Walkinshaw, Clementina. Watersay, Isle of Skye. Watson, Mr., cipher name of McGregor of Balhaldy, Q.V. Wedderburn, Alexander, shipmaster. Weir or Veer, captain, a government spy, and Weems, Lady Elizabeth, wife of the Earl of Sutherland. Lady Frances, wife of Stuart of Good Trees, and Whitney, colonel, killed at the Battle of Falkirk. Wigan. Witherspoon, John, minister of Bath. Wolfe, James, at Culloden. Wolfe's regiment. Wynne, Sir Watkin Williams, of Winstay, and York Mayor and Alderman promised ten thousand men on the landing of the Chevalier. Henry Stuart, Duke of Yorkshire Hunters Regiment, and printed by T. N. A. Constable, printers to His Majesty at the Edinburgh University Press. Scottish History Society. The Executive. 1915-1916. President. The Earl of Rosebery, K.G., K.T., L.L.D. Chairman of Council. Donald Crawford, K.C. Council. The Honorable Lord Guthrie. D. A. Fleming, L.L.D. James McElhose, L.L.D. Sir James Balfour Paul, C.V.O., Doctor of Laws, Lion King of Arms. Sheriff Scott Moncrief. A. Francis Stewart, Advocate. C. S. Romains, C. A. Sir G. M. Paul, D. K. S. R. K. Hannay. Professor P. Hume Brown, M. A., Doctor of Laws, Historiographer Royal for Scotland. William K. Dixon, Advocate. J. R. N. MacPhail, K. C. Corresponding Members of the Council. Professor C. H. Firth, Doctor of Laws, Oxford, Rev. W. D. McRae, Greenlands, Bloxham, Banbury, Oxon, Professor C. Sanford Terry, Aberdeen. Honorable Treasurer. J. T. Clark, Creer Villa, 196 Ferry Road, Edinburgh. Honorable Secretary. J. Maitland Thompson, Doctor of Laws, Advocate, 3 Grosvenor Gardens, Edinburgh. Rules. 1. The object of the society is the discovery in printing, under selected editorship, of unpublished documents illustrative of the civil, religious, and social history of Scotland. The society will also undertake, in exceptional cases, to issue translations of printed works of a similar nature, which have not hitherto been accessible in English. 2. The number of members of the society shall be limited to 400. 3. The affairs of the society shall be managed by a council, consisting of a chairman, treasurer, secretary, and twelve elected members, five to make a quorum. Three of the twelve elected members shall retire annually by ballot, but they shall be eligible for re-election. Four, the annual subscription to the society shall be one guinea. The publications of the society shall not be delivered to any member whose subscription is in arrear and no member shall be permitted to receive more than one copy of the society's publications. 5. The society will undertake the issue of its own publications, i.e. without the intervention of a publisher or any other paid agent. 
6. The Society will issue yearly two octavo volumes of about 320 pages each. 7. An annual general meeting of the Society shall be held at the end of October, or at an approximate date to be determined by the Council. 8. Two stated meetings of the Council shall be held each year, one on the last Tuesday of May, the other on the Tuesday preceding the day upon which the annual general meeting shall be held. The Secretary, on the request of three members of the Council, shall call a special meeting of the Council. 9. Editors shall receive 20 copies of each volume they edit for the Society. 10. The owners of manuscripts published by the Society will also be presented with a certain number of copies. 11. The annual balance sheet, rules, and list of members shall be printed. 12. No alteration shall be made in these rules except at a general meeting of the Society. A fortnight's notice of any alteration to be proposed shall be given to the members of the Council. Publications of the Scottish History Society for the year 1886-1887 1. Bishop Pocock's Tours in Scotland, 1747-1760 Edited by D. W. Kemp 2. Diary and Account Book of William Cunningham of Craigens, 1673-1680 Edited by the Rev. James Dodds, D.D. For the year 1887-1888 3. Grimado's Libri Sex, An Heroic Poem on the Campaign of 1689, by James Philip of Almiriclos. Translated and edited by the Rev. A. D. Murdoch. 4. The Register of the Kirk Session of St. Andrews. Part 1, 1559-1582. Edited by D. Hay Fleming. For the year 1888-1889. 5. Diary of the Rev. John Mill. Minister in Shetland, 1740-1803. Edited by Gilbert Gowdy. 6. Narrative of Mr. James Nimmo, a Covenanter, 1654-1709. Edited by W. G. Scott Moncrife. 7. The Register of the Kirk Session of St. Andrews. Part 2. 1583-1600. Edited by D. Hay Fleming. For the year 1889-1890. 8. A list of persons concerned in the rebellion, 1745. With a preface by the Earl of Rosebery. Presented to the Society by the Earl of Rosebery. 9. Glamis Papers, The Book of Record, A Diary Written by Patrick, First Earl of Strathmore, and Other Documents, 1684-89. Edited by A. H. Miller. 10. John Major's History of Greater Britain, 1521. Translated and edited by Archibald Constable. For the year 1890-1891. 11. The Records of the Commissions of the General Assemblies, 1646-47. Edited by the Rev. Professor Mitchell, D.D. And the Rev. James Christie, D.D. 12. Court Book of the Barony of Urie, 1604-1747. Edited by the Rev. D. G. Barron. For the year 1891-1892. 13. Memoirs of Sir John Clerk of Pennycook, Baronet. Extracted by himself from his own journals, 1676-1755. Edited by John M. Gray. 14. Diary of Colonel the Honorable John Erskine of Carnock, 1683-1687. Edited by the Rev. Walter MacLeod. For the year 1892-1893. 15. Miscellany of the Scottish History Society, 1st Volume. The Library of James VI, 1573-83. Edited by G. F. Warner. Documents Illustrating Catholic Policy, 1596-98. T. G. Law. Letters of Sir Thomas Hope. 1627-46. Rev. R. Paul. Civil War Papers, 1643-50. H. F. Moreland Simpson. Lauderdale Correspondence, 1660-77. Wright Rev. John Dowden, D.D., Turnbull's Diary, 1657-1704.
Rev. R. Paul. Masterton Papers, 1660-1719. V. A. and Noel Payton. Account of Expenses in Edinburgh, 1715. A. H. Miller. Rebellion Papers, 1715 and 1745. H. Payton. 16. Account Book of Sir John Foulis of Ravelston, 1671-1707. Edited by the Rev. A. W. Cornelius Holland. For the year 1893-1894. 17. Letters and Papers Illustrating the Relations Between Charles II and Scotland in 1650. Edited by Samuel Rawson Gardiner, DCL, etc. 18. Scotland and the Commonwealth. Letters and Papers Relating to the Military Government of Scotland, August. 1651 December, 1653. Edited by C. H. Firth, M. A. For the year 1894-1895. 19. The Jacobite Attempt of 1719. Letters of James, 2nd Duke of Ormond. Edited by W. K. Dixon. 20, 21. The Lion and Morning, or a Collection of Speeches, Letters, Journals, etc., relative to the affairs of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, by Bishop Forbes. 1746-1775, edited by Henry Payton. Volumes 1 and 2. For the year 1895-1896. 22. The Lion and Morning. Volume 3. 23, Itinerary of Prince Charles Edward, Supplement to the Lion in Mourning. Compiled by W. B. Blakey. 24, Extracts from the Presbytery Records of Inverness and Dingwall from 1638 to 1688. Edited by William Mackay. 25, Records of the Commissions of the General Assemblies, Continued, for the years 1648 and 1649. Edited by the Rev. Professor Mitchell, D.D., and Rev. James Christie, D.D. For the year 1896-1897. 26. Wariston's Diary and Other Papers. Johnston of Wariston's Diary, 1639. Edited by G. M. Paul. The Honours of Scotland, 1651-52. C. R. A. Howden. The Earl of Mars Legacies, 1722. 1726. Honorable S. Erskine. Letters by Mrs. Grant of Lagan. J. R. N. MacPhail. Presented to the Society by Messrs. T. and A. Constable. 27. Memorials of John Murray of Broughton, 1740 1747. Edited by R. Fitzroy Bell. 28. The Comte Bick of David Wedderburn, Merchant of Dundee. 1587 to 1630. Edited by A. H. Miller. For the year 1897 to 1898. 29, 30. The correspondence of de Monterol and the brothers de Belivre, French ambassadors in England and Scotland, 1645 to 1648. Edited, with translation, by J. G. Fotheringham. Two volumes. For the year 1898 to 1899. 31. Scotland and the Protectorate. Letters and papers relating to the military government of Scotland, from January 1654 to June 1659. Edited by C. H. Firth, M. A. 32. Papers illustrating the history of the Scots Brigade in the service of the United Netherlands, 1572 to 1782. Edited by James Ferguson. Volume 1, 1572 to 1697. 33, 34. Macfarlane's Genealogical Collections Concerning Families in Scotland. Manuscripts in the Advocates Library. Two volumes edited by J. T. Clark, Keeper of the Library. Presented to the Society by the Trustees of the late Sir William Fraser, K.C.B. For the year 1899 to 1900. 35. Papers on the Scots Brigade in Holland, 1572 to 1782. Edited by James Ferguson. Volume 2. 
1698 to 1782. 36. Journal of a Foreign Tour in 1665 and 1666, etc., by Sir John Lauder, Lord Fountainhall. Edited by Donald Crawford. 37. Papal Negotiations with Mary Queen of Scots during her reign in Scotland. Chiefly from the Vatican Archives. Edited by the Rev. J. Hungerford Pollen, S.J. For the year 1900-1901. 38. Papers on the Scots Brigade in Holland, 1572-1782. Edited by James Ferguson. Volume 3. 39. The Diary of Andrew Hay of Cranthethan, 1659-60. Edited by A. G. Reed, F. S. Scott. For the year 1901-1902. 40. Negotiations for the Union of England and Scotland in 1651-53. Edited by C. Sanford Terry. 41. The Loyal Dissuasive. Written in 1703 by Sir Aeneas Macpherson. Edited by the Rev. A. D. Murdoch. For the year 1902-1903. 42. The Charchillary of Linders, 1195-1479. Edited by the Right Rev. John Dowden, D.D., Bishop of Edinburgh. 43. A Letter from Mary Queen of Scots to the Duke of Guise, January 1562. Reproduced in facsimile. Edited by the Rev. J. Hungerford Pollen, S.J. Presented to the Society by the Family of the Late Mr. Scott, of Hawkshill. 44. Miscellany of the Scottish History Society, 2nd Volume. The Scottish King's Household, 14th Century. Edited by Mary Bateson. The Scottish Nation in the University of Orleans, 1336-1538. John Kirkpatrick, LL.D. The French Garrison at Dunbar, 1563. Robert S. Rate. De Antiquitate Religionis Apud Scotos, 1594. Henry D. G. Law. Apology for William Maitland of Lethington, 1610. Andrew Lang, Letters of Bishop George Graham. 1602-38. L. G. Graham. A Scottish Journey, 1641. C. H. Firth. Narratives Illustrating the Duke of Hamilton's Expedition to England, 1648. C. H. Firth. Burnett Layton Papers, 1648-168- H. C. Foxcroft. Papers of Robert Erskine, Physician to Peter the Great. 1677 to 1720. Reverend Robert Paul. Will of the Duchess of Albany, 1789. A. Francis Stewart. 45. Letters of John Cockburn of Ormistown to his gardener, 1727 to 1743. Edited by James Colville, D. S. C. For the year 1903 to 1904. 46. Minute Book of the Managers of the New Mills Cloth Manufactory, 1681-1690. Edited by W. R. Scott. 47. Chronicles of the Frasers, being the Wardlaw Manuscript entitled, Polychronican S.C.U. Polycratica Temporum, or, The True Genealogy of the Frasers. By Master James Fraser. Edited by William McKay. 48. Proceedings of the Justiciary Court from 1661 to 1678. Volume 1, 1661 to 1669. Edited by Sheriff Scott Moncrief. For the year 1904 to 1905. 49. Proceedings of the Justiciary Court from 1661 to 1678. Volume 2. 1669 to 1678. Edited by Sheriff Scott Moncrief. 50. Records of the Baron Court of Stitchill, 1655 to 1807. Edited by Clement B. Gunn, M.D., Peebles. 51. McFarland's Geographical Collections. Volume 1, edited by Sir Arthur Mitchell, K.C.B. For the year 1905 to 1906. 52, 53. McFarland's Geographical Collections. Volumes 2. And 3. 
Edited by Sir Arthur Mitchell, KCB. 54. Stat Uta Ecclesiae Scoticani, 1225-1559. Translated and edited by David Patrick, LL.D. For the year 1906-1907. 55. The House Book of Accompts, Octotire, 1737-39. Edited by James Colville, D.SC. October 1907. 56. The Charters of the Abbey of Enchafre. Edited by W. Lindsay, K.C., The Right Reverend Bishop Dowden, D.D., and J. Maitland Thompson, L.L.D. February 1908. 57. A Selection of the Forfeited Estates Papers Preserved in H.M. General Register House and Elsewhere. Edited by A. H. Miller, L.L.D. October 1909. For the year 1907 to 1908. 58. Records of the Commissions of the General Assemblies, continued, for the years 1650 to 52. Edited by the Reverend James Christie, D.D. February 1909. 59. Papers relating to the Scots in Poland. Edited by A. Francis Stewart. November 1915. For the year 1908 to 1909. 60. Sir Thomas Craig's De Uni One Regnorum Britanniae Tractatus. Edited, with an English translation, by C. Sanford Terry. November 1909. 61. Johnston of Wariston's Memento Quambiu Vivas, and Diary from 1632 to 1639. Edited by G. M. Paul, Doctor of Laws, D.K.S. May 1911. Second Series. For the year 1909-1910. 1. The Household Book of Lady Grizzle Bailey, 1692-1733. Edited by R. Scott Moncrief, W.S. October 1911. 2. Origins of the 45 and Other Narratives. Edited by W. B. Blakey, L.L.D. March 1916. 3. Correspondence of James, 4th Earl of Findlater and 1st Earl of Seafield, Lord Chancellor of Scotland. Edited by James Grant, M.A., L.L.B. March 1912. For the year 1910-1911. 4. Rentale Sancti Andre. Being Chamberlain and Granitar accounts of the Archbishopric in the time of Cardinal Batown, 1538-1546. Translated and edited by Robert Kerr Hannay. February 1913. 5. Highland Papers. Volume 1, edited by J. R. N. MacPhail, K. C. May 1914. For the year 1911 to 1912. 6. Selections from the Records of the Regality of Melrose. Volume 1, edited by C. S. Romains, C. A. November 1914. 7. Records of the Earldom of Orkney. Edited by J. S. Clouston. December 1914. For the year 1912 to 1913. 8. Selections from the Records of the Regality of Melrose. Volume 2. Edited by C. S. Romains, C. A. January 1915. 9. Selections from the Letter Books of John Stewart. Bailey of Inverness. Edited by William McKay, L.L.D. April 1915. For the year 1913 to 1914. 10. Rentel Dunkeldens, being the accounts of the Chamberlain of the Bishopric of Dunkel, A.D. 1506 to 1517. Edited by R. K. Hannay. March 1915. 11. Letters of the Earl of Seafield and Others, Illustrative of the History of Scotland During the Reign of Queen Anne. Edited by Professor Hume Brown. November 1915. For the year 1914 to 1915. 12. Highland Papers. Volume 2. Edited by J. R. N. MacPhail, K. C. March 1916. Note. Origins of the 45, issued for 1909 to 1910, is issued also for 1914 to 1915. 
for the year 1915 to 1916. 13. Selections from the Records of the Regality of Melrose. Volume 3. Edited by C. S. Romains, C. A. 14. Johnston of Wariston's Diary. Volume 2. Edited by D. Hay Fleming, L.L. D. In Preparation. Bibliography of Topographical Works Relating to Scotland. Compiled by the late Sir Arthur Mitchell, and edited by C. G. Cash. Records Relating to the Scottish Armies from 1638 to 1650. Edited by Professor C. Sanford Terry. Seafield Correspondence. Volume 2. Edited by Major James Grant. Register of the Consultations of the Ministers of Edinburgh, and some other brethren of the Ministry, since the interruption of the Assembly 1653, with other papers of public concernment. Edited by the Rev. W. Stephen, B.D. Miscellany of the Scottish History Society. Third Volume. Charters and Documents Relating to the Grey Friars and the Cistercian Nunnery of Haddington. Register of Inchcall Monastery. Edited by J. G. Wallace James, M.B. Analytical Catalogue of the Wadrow Collection of Manuscripts in the Advocates Library. Edited by J. T. Clark. A Translation of the Historia Abatum de Kinlos of Ferrerius. Papers Relating to the Rebellions of 1715 and 1745 with other documents from the Municipal Archives of the City of Perth. The Bulcaris Papers. Transcribers Notes. Obvious typographical errors have been silently corrected. Variations in hyphenation and accents have been standardized but all other spelling and punctuation remains unchanged. The Corrigenda and Errata have been corrected in place. <laughs>